Good morning, Sherry. Uh, good morning, Rhonda. Can you hear me okay? I sure can. Have a great meeting. Thank you. This is an announcement from the clerk. We are now live on the internet. Thank you. Can I bring it up? Rhonda, is this better? Yes, ma'am, it certainly is. Perfect. Thanks so much. Thank you, and have a great meeting. Good morning, Supervisor Chavez. Good morning. Have a great meeting. Thank you, Rhonda. Good morning, Reverend Rana. Good morning. Thank you for being here and have a great meeting. Thank you. Glad to be here. Good morning, Rhonda. Good morning, President Wasserman. It turns out you hear me a lot better when I unmute myself. It's happened Welcome. to all of us. Welcome as well. Um, your clerk today is going to be Colin. Wonderful. And you have all five supervisors here. Aren't we just the best? You are all the best. It's going to be a great day, good start. And a great year. And to a great year. We'll be having Supervisor Simidian leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance today. Possibly somebody else, since I'll be introducing the invocator, Mr. President. Certainly, we'll move right on down the line, Supervisor Chavez. Share the opportunities here. Gotta be nine. Where's my phone? There's my phone. It just turned nine thirty, sir. You are good to go. Wonderful. Recording in progress. Good morning, Colin. Please start us off on the roll call. 
All right, Supervisor Lee. Update 2022, present. Oh, present, thank you. Supervisor Chavez. Here. Oh, present, thank you. Supervisor Smidian. Here. Present. Vice President Ellenberg. Present. And President Wasserman. Present as well. Thank you very Everyone. much. We've got a full team going here. We're now going to move to item number two, Pledge of Allegiance. Supervisor Chavez will be leading us in the pledge. Anyone who's able to, please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and, and to the republic for which it stands, and and nation, under God, indivisible, liberty, liberty, liberty and, and justice for all. all. <laughs> All righty, and with that, we'll move on to item three, which is the election of myself as president and Supervisor Vice President Ellenberg as vice president. And no move, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Supervisor Smithian. Second. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll ask for a roll call vote. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Smidian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? And President Wasserman? Aye as well. And okay. thank you all very, very much for your votes and your confidence. Supervisor Ellenberg, I look forward to another year working with you. All right, we now move on, on to item number four, the invocation. And today, Supervisor Smidian will be presenting our invocator. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Uh, President, and I'm, I'm very pleased to welcome our invocator today, uh, the Reverend Claire Dietrich Rana. Reverend Claire is the rector of the Christ Episcopal Church in Los Altos uh, in District 5, and as the head priest there since 2017, um, she really has led her vibrant and growing parish, uh, parish in a, a number of activities <laughs> that are worthy of note. And we appreciate that shout out from the dogs in the back, uh, Mr. Uh, Wasserman, thank you. Uh, Reverend Claire, that's for you. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I should uh, share with colleagues that the church is actively involved in a range of partnerships uh, here locally. They're uh, regular participants in uh, Compassion Week in Los Altos, assist with food drives uh, and volunteering efforts with our community services agency, CSA, uh, many of you are familiar with, and uh, the Mountain View and Los Altos area. It's one of our nonprofits that uh, serves the uh, less fortunate in those two communities. I should also perhaps make mention of the fact that uh, music is a vital part of the worship at the church. Uh, the church hosts a concert series that brings um, both local and international artists uh, to the campus and uh, their ensemble in residence choir hosts uh, social justice themed musical events. So they really have found a way to uh, integrate into the uh, work of the church, uh, the good works, um, uh, every facet of uh, the church. And Reverend Claire uh, also serves as chaplain of the Ventana School, which is a ministry of uh, the parish that serves uh, youngsters in the preschool through fifth grade. Uh, with, um, I would say, a foundation in um, creativity, curiosity, uh, compassion. These are all values that Reverend Claire uh, tries to bring to uh, other aspects of her work at the church and in her life. Uh, as a member of the Los Altos Rotary Club, uh, Reverend Claire enjoys participating in the Rotary's committees that are focused on global outreach. And I would like to just share that uh, before coming to Los Altos, uh, Reverend Claire served uh, in San Francisco. She's a graduate of Duke University, completed her seminary training at Yale, uh, and before pursuing her theological education, she co-wrote and co-produced the award-winning documentary film, Misrepresentation, uh, which explores representations of women in the American media. So Reverend Claire, welcome. Thank you for being with us today, and thank you for all of your good works. What would you like to share with our board and our community today? Well, first, thank you so much for that generous introduction, and thank you for your invitation to join you all, and thank you to all of you um, supervisors and everyone else at the county for your good and faithful service. 
As an Episcopal priest, I'm accustomed to praying in the name of a gracious and loving God, in the strong name of the Trinity, but as the wife of a Muslim immigrant, the stepdaughter of a Jewish academic, the sister-in-law of a Buddhist woman of color, immersed in a network of friends and families of many faiths and no faith at all. I'm also accustomed to sending light and love, to holding those in pain with intention, to simply stating a hope or a word of kindness and calling it sacred. So as I sat down to write this invocation, I was reminded of the great diversity of the people you serve and the great and beautiful and complicated mass of perspectives and hopes and faiths and needs and longings they hold. So instead of praying in the name of God today, I've decided to pray in the name of them. Let's begin with a moment of silence. In the name of the holy, of love and of peace, in the name of the lost, the lonely, the least, in the name of the anxious, uncertain and scared, in the name of the desperate and all those who dared, in the name of the faithful, the angry, the ill, in the name of the hungry, those eating their fill, in the name of the refugee, native and lost, in the name of the doctor, weighing the cost, in the name of those building, creating, inventing, in the name of the cashier, the addict, repenting, in the name of our children and our elders too, in the name of executives, the unsheltered, and you, in the name of this earth, which we steward with care, in the name of the boring and those with some flair, in the name of the citizen resident stranger, in the name of all those who live lives filled with danger, in the name of the educated, the queer and the cold, in the name of the shy ones and those who are bold, in the name of real people, so messy and glorious, in the name of the hilarious, heartbreaking, uproarious, in the name of those hoping and all those despairing, in the name of those who find it hard to keep caring, in the name of the people you understand and respect, in the name of the people to whom you'd object, in the name of the sick, the thriving, the dying, in the name of the grieving, the struggling, the trying, in the name of all those you've been called to serve, may you connect with your values and summon your nerve. May you breathe the sweet air and feel it a gift. May you be rooted and present, no longer adrift. May you do the courageous, if challenging thing, in awe of the opportunity each day brings. May you open your hearts and your minds to the true, to beauty and justice, which make all things new. May the work that is set before you this day connect with your purpose, your passion, your way. May you lead and yet listen, being held in a love that is sacred and timeless, perhaps from above, perhaps from below, perhaps from within, still a power that turns us from strangers to kin. May grace and wisdom be yours in the work of this hour. May your discernment be thoughtful, your decisions empowered. May you remember what is at the heart of your call to see, hear, and turn toward these one and all. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And um, Reverend, I, we rarely say anything after such an invocation, but I have to say that's one of the finest things I've ever heard in my whole life. And although I'm normally a North Carolina fan, I got to say go Blue Devils. Um, thank you very much. And Supervisor Smidian, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. And thank you to Reverend Claire for uh, being with us and sharing her uh, invocation with our board and our public. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. That moves us on to item number five, which is announcing adjournments in memoriam. And we have Supervisor Chavez with such an adjournment. Good morning, colleagues. And um, I also wanted to thank um, Reverend Claire Rana. The work that was done specifically on um, misrepresentation was very profound for a lot of, especially young women in our community. So thank you for that work. Um, today, colleagues, I wanna ask that we adjourn in memory of Bob Sadala. And my suspicion is there are many listening today who remember him. Um, I also wanted to just acknowledge and welcome one of Bob's sons, um, Stephen Sagala is with us and friends and family who are joining today. Mr. Bob Sagala was well respected and recognized as a good soul, a friend and a loyal union brother and activist. For decades, 
he gave his time generously. And one of the hallmarks for Bob was he always showed up. He would play the role of Santa at the annual children's holiday party and retiree luncheon to bring great cheer. He loved to cater meals for workers who were on strike or precinct walkers. He even opened his home for community meetings and built an office just for this purpose. At the boys ranch, Bob advocated for and coached youth sports to encourage positive activities among our young people. As a union steward, Bob led his SEIU members through tough contract negotiations here at the county. He was a wonderful friend and leader. He spent his last days at a care home with the intent to move to Alabama to be near his adult children. He was a symbol of kindness, generosity, perseverance, and he was an inspiration to many. I wanna just emphasize one thing about Bob he gave of his time. I really can't think of a more precious gift than to give people and share with the community your time. And I wanna say a very special thank you to his family who's, who generously shared him with so many of us in the community. Bob passed away peacefully on Tuesday, December 21st, 2021. He is survived by his sons, Brent and Steven Sagala, his daughter, Rachel Rampey, and eight grandchildren and two great-grandchildren. Thank you so much to his family for allowing us to honor him and share Bob's memory with the community today. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. We now move on to item number six, which is accommodations and proclamations. There's been some changes to that, so I'm just gonna give a heads up of what's gonna happen. But I also wanna tell anyone who is waiting to speak under public comment, which will follow accommodations and proclamations, to go ahead and um, register to speak. Supervisor Ellenberg, I see that your hand is raised and then I'll turn to the accommodations and proclamations people. Thanks, uh, just a, a tech issue. I'm interested to know if my mic is now working. Yes, it is. It's good, all right, thank you so much. Thank you. So under item six, accommodations and proclamations, we have three, we have Supervisor Lee, Supervisor Simidian, and um, one from myself. And Colin, is that how you see today's item six as well? Yeah, I have a, a request for deletion for, for 6A and 6C from the clerk's office. Yes. Okay, just wanted yep. to double check. I, yes, we're deleting those two and we added in Supervisor Lee. So we've got Lee, Wasserman and Simidian. Let's just go in that yes. order. Supervisor Lee, go ahead. Thank you, President Wasserman. Really appreciate the opportunity to speak uh, on this commendation item. Um, and this is an item for the commendation for um, former um, council member for Sunnyvale, Mason Fong, for his heartfelt dedication and service to the residents of Santa Clara County and Sunnyvale. Council member Mason Fong has served on the Sunnyvale City Council since 2018 and was the youngest person ever elected to serve as a council member. He championed many areas such as housing affordability, climate action, transportation, equity. He also established the Sunnyvale CARES program, which provided over $3 million in financial relief funds to Sunnyvale small businesses and nonprofits impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. He also led efforts to add the citywide council strategic priority on equity, access, and inclusion, paving the way for city to hire full-time equity access and inclusion manager to craft a citywide energy equity uh, strategy. Councilmember Fong also served as Sunnyvale's representative on the DTA Policy Advisory Committee and advocated for increased access to public transportation for Sunnyvale residents. Last week on Tuesday, January 4th, Councilmember Fong was recognized for his service on the Sunnyvale City Council as he transitions to a new role as the Deputy Director of External Affairs for Northern California for our Governor, Gavin Newsom. Now, therefore, be resolved that the Board of Supervisors of the County of Santa Clara does hereby recognize and commend Councilmember Mason Fong for his heartfelt dedication and service to the residents of Santa Clara County and his unwavering commitment to make Sunnyvale a wonderful place to live. Thank you, Mason, for your great service and congratulations on your new role as the Deputy Director for External Affairs for Northern California for our Governor. Given your extensive background, you will no doubt be huge assets in this capacity for us in Santa Clara County. Councilmember uh, 
Fong, if you are joining us, would you like to say a few words? Sure, I'll, I'll try to keep it short. Thank you so much, Supervisor Lee uh, and Honorable Supervisors. Congratulations uh, to Board President Wasserman, and Vice President uh, Ellenberg, and as well as uh, thank you just for all of your service. It's been a pleasure to work alongside you. And as you may have seen yesterday, the governor released his uh, spending plan for the $45 billion surplus, which includes a lot of money for COVID and homelessness, climate change, uh, jobs, uh, workforce training, crime, et cetera. So you'll be receiving a lot of that information from me uh, moving forward and feel free to ping me if you ever need anything. But I just wanna thank Supervisor Lee once again for uh, placing this item on the agenda. Thank you. Thank you. And remember, send us the money. That's all, thank you. <laughs> Good plug, I like it. All right, we'll move on to um, my accommodation and Colin, I'm looking to see if we have Chris Wilder and Kate with us. Let's look on the search. You do. I can see there. them. They are Wonderful. there. Wonderful. There they are. Okay. It is my privilege to honor our friend Chris Wilder as he retires as the president and executive director of the Valley Medical Center Foundation. Many people wrongly assume that Chris Wilder is a mere mortal. It is an easy mistake to make, but some of us know his secret identity of make it happen man. Chris possesses a supernatural ability to help turn ideas into vision, vision into plans and plans into reality. Since 2003, he led the effort to raise funds for Silicon Valley's largest and only public medical center. He raised more than $90 million for VMC from private and public sources, a Herculean effort rooted in passion and fueled by ability. He was also instrumental in getting more than 2 billion with a B of public funding for healthcare, housing and vital county services. Chris was named Outstanding Professional Fundraiser 2008 by the Association of Fundraising Professionals. Chris's distinguished career also includes work as a consumer activist with the Fund for Public Interest Research. He ran the Varnished Children's Alliance, a national missing children's, excuse me, vanished Children's Alliance, a national missing children's agency. He also served as an executive director of City Year San Jose, Silicon Valley, the nation's premier AmeriCorps program. A passionate musician, Chris served as board member and past chairman of San Jose Jazz and has performed music of many genres in over two dozen nations. In fact, I did a little research and found that Chris has been part of bands known as Arsenal, Sticky, The Tweezers, MDC, Metalingus, Snakes, Bjorn Baby Bjorn, The Marginal Prophets, Anxiety, Idle Hands, The Flavor Biscuits, Altered Roots Quartet, and Legally Blue. For many years, he has voluntarily lent his time and talent to the Healthier Kids Foundation, the Association of Fundraising Professionals, Silicon Valley Chapter, and the Santa Clara County Child Abuse Council. Chris is a graduate of American Leadership Forum, Community Leadership Forum, Community Leadership San Jose, and Stanford's Executive Program in Nonprofit Leadership. If you look at Chris Wilder's LinkedIn profile, you will see his occupation listed as helping Silicon Valley care. Our county is better because Chris Wilder, AKA make it happen man, chose to devote his career to our community's health. On behalf of our 2 million residents, I commend and thank you, Chris, for your superhuman service to Santa Clara County. I wish you a happy retirement and the very best wishes on your next chapter. And while not always in his superhuman costume, I did find a picture I had in my favorites that I wanted to share with everybody. This is one of Chris's um, 
outfits that he wore at various farmers markets and any, any programs that had to do with eating healthy. And there was Chris Wilder. Chris and Kate. Well, Chris and Kate, would you like to make a few words? Would you like to say a few things? Sure. President Wasserman, thank you so much for the kind there introduction and your words. I'd like to thank the current and former members of the County of Santa Clara Board of Supervisors who have never lost sight of the vision of a strong and comprehensive health system available to everyone, regardless of their ability to pay. I'd also like to thank the current and former members of the staff of the BMC Foundation, without whom my success would never have been possible. And of course, the same can be said for the current and former members of the Board of Directors. It would be impossible for me to call out all of the amazing donors and the amazing leaders at the health and hospital system that I've had the privilege of working with over the years. Though I will name a couple. First, I'd like to call out Susie Wilson, a former member of the Board of Supervisors who sadly is no longer with us. I'd also like to call out Sue Murphy, the first Santa Clara Valley Medical Center CEO that I worked under and who was kind enough to give me a chance as executive director of the foundation. Thanks also to the current BMC Foundation Board of Directors for taking great care of me while I worked on my recovery and for selecting Michael Elliott as the next executive director. He is absolutely the best person to take the reins. Also, a shout out to the amazing rehab team at Santa Clara Valley Medical Center, who not only helped save my life, but got me well on the path to recovery. Thanks also to the rehab team at Rehab Without Walls, who helped me continue to make a great, who make great strides as after I was discharged. Finally, I'd like to thank my wife and life partner, Mrs. Wilder, and Amelia Romero, my full-time caregiver, without whom we'd be lost. Today is the first day of the rest of my life, and I'm excited to see what the future holds, and I'm really looking forward to walking, playing golf, and guitar again. Thank you all so much. Thanks so much, you guys. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Kate. Chris, it's great seeing you. Uh, we've got a few other fans that want to speak up here. Vice President Ellenwood. Thank you. Um, Mike, thank you for the beautiful uh, tribute to Chris. Um, I just want to add a couple of, of uh, personal notes, I think, uh, you covered the professional brilliantly. Um, my connections to Chris began before I joined the Board of Supervisors through the Downtown Rotary uh, Club and my work at Leadership San Jose. And the, the piece that is never part of the, the professional resume is the size of one's heart. And Chris's heart your heart, Chris, I'm looking at you. I don't have to talk about you in the third person, um, is so immense that it literally dwarfs the $100 million that he has raised. It dwarfs all of the music he has ever created. It dwarfs every, every person who has come into his life and his home is instantly a friend, is embraced, is joked with, is teased, is listened to, and my life is so much richer uh, for knowing Chris, for having him be part of the world that, that I live in. And I also cannot wait to come hear you play again. I will be at the first show. So thank you. Thank you for everything, Kate. Um, you are a phenomenal uh, partner in, in all of this work, I love that Chris calls you Mrs. Wilder. That cracks me up to no end and shows just his pride in the relationship and the connection. So, so much love and every good wish to you both. Thank you, Vice President. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Um, I too wanna start out by saying to Kate, um, you know, you, you and Chris are just an amazing uh, dynamic duo. And the energy that is between the two of you whenever you're together is so powerful, it's, it's actually palpable. Um, Chris, you know, 
there are so many ways to talk about your accomplishments. And I think that what Susan just said about the person is so, um, it's so important. And the reason is that, you know, you've spent your adult life connecting people to causes and helping people see opportunity to make the world around them better. Of all the time that I've known you, I, I can honestly say, I don't ever think I heard, have heard you say the word no, or it's not a good idea, or it can't be done. And as I think about what it takes to help um, not just build a community, but heal a community, it really is leaders that have that ability to, to, to help everybody see their role at the table. And I, I was thinking back about uh, you this morning, actually, and remembering some meetings we had when we were passing the hospital bond and you know, listening to others around the table say, it's too close, we're not gonna make it, blah, blah, blah. And I, I never heard you say that. All I ever heard you say was, let's try this, let's try that, let's try this. I, I just so appreciated it. And I'll just fast forward. There are a thousand stories I could tell of, of your heroics, but I wanna just say one thing about COVID-19. When COVID-19 initially hit, People were really trying to find out their role in the world. How could they help? And you created with open arms opportunities for people to make donations. When someone said to you, um, can you use this? You said yes. And you found a way to connect everybody to each other. And Chris, I don't know if the BMC Foundation will ever be able to quantify the role it played in, in not just saving lives, but in laying the foundation for us being really ready to have this battle that we're in right now. I am eternally grateful to you um, and for your leadership. You have been an incredible role model to me and to so many people in this community. And I will be with Susan in the front row um, when you're ready to play. I'm looking so forward to it. And Kate, again, I just wanna say that our hearts and thoughts are with both of you on your journey and you are much loved and much admired, both of you, the dynamic Wilder duo. Thanks, Cindy. Thank you, Supervisor Smitty. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Hey, Chris, I just <clears throat> wanted to add a, a slightly different perspective, which is this. Uh, it's the nature of these kinds of conversations and uh, salutations to say thank you in a sort of a past tense way for what you have done, and certainly that's appropriate. But I, I do think it's uh, equally important to call out the sort of future-oriented gift that you have given all of us. Uh, and uh, every time I set foot on the VMC campus, every time I walk through the door at uh, one of the facilities that serves folks in this county in, in our health and hospital system, I I'm going to know and think about the fact that you played an extraordinary role going forward it's not what you have done. It is um, literally a gift that will give for uh, ever and ever and ever. So I hope you will see it in that way as well. Um, uh, your work in that chapter may be done, but certainly your contribution is not done in that way. And like my colleagues, I look forward to uh, finding out what ways you will uh, continue to uh, inspire us and exhort us to do more and to do better, uh, which is one of your great gifts. So thank you for that. But again, thank you going forward. Be well. Thank you, Supervisor Smitty. I think that concludes our comments. I'm sure if I opened it up, there'd be 5,000 more. But uh, Chris, it's just great seeing you and we all wish you the very best and we are all so thankful that you have been in our lives personally and professionally. And thanks for all you've done for so many. Thank you very much, Chris and Kate. I hope 2022 is a, a really good year for both of you. Thank you. Thanks, you guys. With that, we move on to Supervisor Simidian's commendation. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and members. And I think uh, the clerk has a PowerPoint that they're going to pop up here uh, while I am sharing just a couple of thoughts uh, about uh, the opportunity we have today to celebrate with our friends at the Mid-Peninsula Regional Open Space District, or MidPen, as we 
uh, more typically uh, shorthanded, on their 50th anniversary, uh, which is really quite an extraordinary run. Um, uh, I think board members will recall that I have often talked about how much more we can do when we partner with others. And that has certainly been my experience in uh, working with MidPen over the years. They've, of course, always been outstanding uh, partners and stewards of open space, uh, but I've had the opportunity over the years to partner with MidPen on, oh gosh, a number of projects, including the protection of the foothills above uh, Stanford, uh, building regional trail connections, uh, and even very recently to our uh, our partnership protecting the ridge line at, uh, 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 near the Lehigh cement plant and quarry. Um, time, and again, I just have to say, I've been so impressed with, it's not just a passion, but a dedication and care that folks at MidPen um, bring to their work. Uh, I think you have observed colleagues that this is an organization that really does not shy away from rolling up its sleeves and doing the hard work that uh, is really what it takes to protect uh, the natural resources in our region. Um, their open space, I think, showcases the beauty and diversity of our local environment, uh, everything from the redwoods to the baylands, uh, aglands, uh, creeks, watershed, uh, and, you know, thousands of folks enjoy MidPen's preserves and educational programs every year, uh, which I think is just a further testament to uh, their good works. So let me just say uh, congratulations again to everyone at MidPen. Thank you for the past 50 years of work. Uh, regrettably, uh, term limits uh, suggest we won't be here for the 100th after the next 50 years uh, to celebrate with you once again. Uh, but I really did want to take this opportunity after 50 years of extraordinary partnership and good work to just say looking forward to it uh, for years and years and years to come. Again, uh, a gift to our community that is going to be lasting and I would even say forever uh, in its um, benefit and value to us all. So, Mr. President, with your permission, let me turn it over now to Kurt Riffle, who is MidPen's current board president. I think uh, uh, Kurt would like to share a few words as well, but uh, the short version for me is congratulations and thank you and uh, ready for the next 50. Take care. Thank you, President Riffle. Great, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Simidian and members of the board for recognizing our 50th anniversary of the MidPen Open Space District. MidPen was created in 1972 by voters who felt a shared responsibility to safeguard our local natural resources and provide our residents with room to breathe, which became the motto of the campaign back then. Since then, MidPen, as you've seen, has protected more than 65,000 acres and 26 public open space preserves that are free and open to the public 365 days a year. But preserving the land is just the first step. Once protected, the natural resources on the land needs ongoing care. The impending impacts of climate change has only heightened this imperative. MidPen actively cares for these lands, which helps support climate resiliency. And connected ecosystems of healthy plants and soils stores tens of millions of tons of carbon, keeping it out of the atmosphere. The growing green belt of open space and agricultural lands that MidPen is preserving and protecting also provides a cooler and greener place for refuge as temperatures and sea levels rise. Clean air and water, healthy habitats for diverse native plants and animals, ecosystems that are resilient to the effects of our changing climate, and places for people to connect with nature, that's what MidPen provides in perpetuity. In this spirit, we look forward to continuing collaborating with you in our efforts to promote both the health and resilience of our community, as well as our natural and working lands as we grow our green belt and protect its natural resources. So throughout 2022, MidPen invites you to join us in celebrating the accomplishments we as a community have made over the last 50 years in open space and agriculture land preservation, natural resource protection, and public education and enjoyment. We invite you to follow MidPen Open Space on your favorite social media platform or subscribe online at openspace.org. Thanks again for this deeply appreciated recognition and for your ongoing support and partnership. Thank you, Kurt, and thank you, Supervisor Smitty. Thank With you, Mr. That, President. And one last shout out to say thanks to the folks at MidPen, both for being here today, but again, for um, 
extraordinary work through the decades uh, that we know will continue. Thank you, Mr. President. Unmute myself. There we go. Thank you. That concludes item number six. As I mentioned previously, item number seven is public comment. I ask people to register uh, at that time, and people have, which I appreciate. Um, Colin, with that, let's set our timer to one minute. All right, we'll set that timer to one minute. And I'll let you take over. All right, the first speaker is Stacy Benedict. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak, and the timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, good morning. My name is Stacey Benedict, and I am a social worker with a DFCS, and I work in the emergency response unit. Uh, we as ER workers were told we cannot remove children, that we cannot have court-involved services for families, that we need to close referrals or to offer voluntary services, and that those services do not meet the needs of our families. We are told that our clinical decisions do not meet legal thresholds, um, that we need to safety plan with community partners, with family members, and bring in preventative services to support the families. But how is it that a safety plan is a safety plan when less than 50% of families uh, engage in those community-based services? Appropriate preventative services need to be put in place. We need support. Social workers are having to follow up with these community services to make sure that they're engaging in the families, adding more work to our plate. We need additional services, including mental health and wraparound services. ER workers are leaving. Our next speaker is caller ending in 154. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. And caller 154, are you there? Hello. Thank you. Go right ahead. Hi, good morning. My name is Matteo Uriarty, and I'm speaking on behalf of the 140 plus PBS clerks for HHS here at Silver Creek location. Here, COVID is running rampant as it is in many county departments. In my unit of six alone, two to three workers tested positive within days of the next set of two to three workers, rendering my unit ineffective. Despite that, management has been inconsistent with notifications and is denying employees the right to go test, even when symptomatic, unless they use their own paid time. It's a huge concern when management is not in compliance with county protocols. Um, <clears throat> PBS is a department that cannot afford to have shut down due to outbreaks. Manage Management must take immediate change to keep workers safe and financial operations running. We feel strongly that they should reinstate remote work for safety and operational preservation, or it could lead to a complete shutdown in less than two weeks, given the current breakthrough case rate. Here we have a chance to be proactive rather than reactive. Our next speaker is caller ending in 048. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. Timer will start when you begin speaking. And caller 048, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, go right ahead. Great. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Stacey Laris. I'm a 20-year resident of this great county. I would like to request that you please stop having Zoom meetings. There's no reason for you guys to not be in person. We, the people, deserve to see you and speak to you in person. Please also stop the state of emergency immediately. We are two years into two weeks to flatten the curve. An emergency is sudden and unexpected. An emergency does not last for two years. This is all a lie and you all know it. COVID-19 has not been isolated, identified, or purified. I wrote into the California Public Health Department as well as your COS asking for proof. I got responses from both stating there are no records responsive to your request. The one from the BOS was from Jeremy Pilar. You have nothing, you have no proof. You're all clearly in bed with the CCP and you have blood on your hands. You're all going to pay one day, Nuremberg too. You only care about money and status. You do not care about the dear. The next speaker is Kevin Report. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. And Kevin, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Go ahead. I speak to you today as a firefighter for the Santa Clara County Fire Department. Our fire department is currently in a staffing crisis and there are many other departments in the county as well facing this crisis. This new health order vaccine mandate already, already critically low staffing. On average, over the last three weeks, 30% of our positions are filled with firefighters working overtime. We have down staff 
Brad is 29 times in the past three weeks alone. The limited waiver form made available yesterday is a step toward reasonable accommodation, but it still does not effectively address the unique work conditions that apply to our firefighters, nor does it provide long-term solution. Please allow our firefighters and other first responders to continue saving lives and safely serving our communities, regardless of their vaccine status. Our next speaker is Janet Diaz Perez. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning. This is Janet Diaz, president of SEIU. We continue with challenges in negotiating or discussing topics surrounding the impacts related to the pandemic from the start with working conditions, PPE, and through the current mandates, as well as our struggle to obtain timely, accurate information applicable countywide. Since December 2021 to present, there has been over 180% increase in countywide workforce exposures and a clear decrease in management compliance of county report, reporting protocols, including afford, affording workers the allotted paid time to test. The county can continue to lead the way, but we need the board to take a stand with us, make protecting the workforce the priority, find the means to provide supplemental paid sick leave. We do not have time to wait for the state. We are urging you to help. Next speaker is Shirley B. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning. My name is Shirley Bolton. I, and I have been with the Department of Family and Children's Services for about two and a half years as a voluntary family maintenance social worker. I'm in the Spanish speaking unit with six other social workers tasked with preventing Santa Clara County's Latino families from formal entry into the child welfare system. For two years, management has failed to protect and support the workers after speaking up about concerns that affect the families of Santa Clara County. As a result, we have been met with retaliation, scrutiny, and hostility. We've experienced stink arrest, which has affected our physical and mental well-being. Many of us has had, have considered leaving the department altogether. I'm asking that the board intervene by providing mediation and training to be scheduled immediately within the next five days. The workers have waited months to be provided with resources, counsel, and tools to serve the families of this county successfully. Additionally, leadership must be held accountable. Management has been complicit. We cannot continue to put the mental health of workers at Next speaker is Lori Nipoth. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Lori, are you there? I do not have a microphone option for Lori. I will go to the next speaker and see if I can get her in next. The next speaker is Marcella Cuerva. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. Timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning, supervisors. My name is Marcela Cervera, and I've been a social worker with the Department of Family and Children's Services for 17 years. I'm also a steward with SEIU 521. I'm here to talk to you today about the failure of Daniel Little and Wendy Kinnear to address serious issues which were brought to the department's attention since 2019. Our Nuestra Casa unit serves Latino Spanish-speaking families, families that are disenfranchised and overrepresented in our system. Due to the failed leadership of Hong Nguyen and Jennifer Hub, we ask that you remove these two managers from overseeing this unit as they have caused mental health anguish for workers, further putting the children and families of Santa Clara County at risk. Management agreed to provide mediation assistance and specialized behavioral health support due to incidents that occurred at work, which they have failed to provide. Not only have workers not received the support necessary, but we have also been retaliated against, which has caused workers to feel more distressed, further jeopardizing the critical work that we do in keeping children safely at home with their families. We also ask that you ensure that both walks and the department participate in the hiring of new staff. Thank you. The next speaker is Juan. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning. My name is Juan Elias. I've been a social worker with the Department of Family and Children's Services for over five years. Uh, I work in a volunteer unit. I'm here to advocate for mediation for Nuestra Casa unit and training to be scheduled immediately and start within the next five days. 
management has continually failed to protect the unit, uh, the unit's workers and created a divisive environment that harms workers and pits them against each other. Nuestra Casa unit has lost trust in management as they have ample time to provide us the mediation and support that we need. It is shameful that managers once again drop the ball, further fueling turnover in the department. We cannot continue to put the mental health of workers at risk and put, put in harm's way the critical work of Latino families. We are supporting to stay together and provide appropriate services and programs. I would expect the board to hold DOCS management accountable for their actions and lack thereof that, that further harms the workers and the families. The next speaker is Sean Ruyan. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. Time will start when you begin speaking. Uh, Sean, your microphone is not active due to a previous version of Zoom. If you are able to um, update, I can take you by re-raising your hand once again, but I will have to move on to the next person. The next person is Lorena Briones. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Go ahead, Lorena. Hi, my name is Lorena Briones. I'm a social worker and chief steward in the Department of Family and Children's Services and the Emergency Response Department. We are here today to ask you to intervene with the county's failure to support social workers and the needs of our community. Frontline, work, frontline workers in here, including myself, have continued to be exposed to COVID and are contracting COVID. I'm using my own sick time when other agencies throughout the country have provided frontline workers with paid sick leave due to COVID. This is not only unjust, but it's also leading workers to return to work too early and continuing the spread of the virus to our coworkers and our clients. We're also undergoing a shift in practice in ER based on federal funding that has shifted from foster care to community, pre community prevention services. However, Daniel Little, Wendy Kinnear, Damian Wright, and our SSA leadership team has failed to provide us with the necessary resources to keep children safe in their homes and to plan accordingly by reallocating staff and resources, thus leaving some areas where the workers cannot keep up with the demand of their caseloads. I'm going to go back to Sean R. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, my name is Sean Ruyan. I work in the scattered satellite homes as a social worker. The DFCS management team has once again failed social workers and the community we are hired to serve. With the focus on maintaining children's safety in our satellite homes, we have an issue with people from outside our department coming into our unit and filling in for our supervisors. When a supervisor needs a day off, our staff normally fills in the supervisors. Currently, one of the supervisors is out on leave and the manager is not following past practices as she is not allowing our staff to work in place of the absent supervisor. The management is showing favoritism by choosing her friends who work outside of our department to work in absence of the supervisor. The people chosen by the manager are making decisions that can endanger our youth despite our input and protocol. For example, a youth returned to one of our homes and informed us he was high on opioids. When the youth is under the influence, our protocol is to take him to the hospital to be medically cleared. The supervisor at the time just said, go to the bed and go sleep it off. Our next speaker is Jason Dorsey. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning, Jason Dorsey, SEIU 521. Since the start of this pandemic, we've voiced the need for ESA to collaborate with us as we have the boots on the ground and we wish to work together. Upon hearing of the governor's booster mandate, we again requested to meet with ESA to negotiate its impact. We're still awaiting critical information on how the mandate will impact our workers. We thought we would have had this information as of yesterday, but unfortunately it's not the case. Our joint RNPA and SEIU 521 unfair labor practice is still pending a decision from the judge. So we still deal with the lack of collaboration collaboration and cooperation. We need the county ESA to be more responsive and timelier if we're going to address our members' impact. We need your leadership to steer ESA to actually work with us. It starts with the top management of labor relations to lead on this. It cannot just simply be lip service. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ush Kumar Mehta. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. Timer will start when you begin speaking. 
Thank you very much to all the Board of Supervisors for the opportunity to speak and consideration of comments. I wanted to, uh, first of all, I wanted to thank regarding the proclamation that has been provided for the Diwali celebration to uh, to all the Indian community and as well as the citizens within the within the county of Santa Clara as well as within the within the city, uh, respective city's jurisdiction. It is important to recognize that you know how the proclamation publicly allowed the representation of American Indian Heritage Month and as well as allowing publicly them to celebrate the festival as it is recognized. It is not just recognizing the festival, but it is, it is making the official community building relations with the county of Santa Clara as well as when it is being informed to the respective embassies and respective consulate. The county is also getting appreciation from the countries in order to form the sister to sister community relation and as well as the United States International Religious Commission has been informed regarding the same and they have appreciated the Board of Supervisors as well. So thank you very much. The next speaker is unidentified from Santa Clara County. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. And are you there? Yep, I'm there. Go right ahead. All right. Good morning. My name is Brett. I've been a first responder for over 20 years, most of it in this county. All of us as first responders, I lump together with police, fire, and EMS. We've all been on the front lines of this COVID pandemic and epidemic since the beginning, both unvaccinated and vaccinated. We took a vow to serve and protect this community, which we all have held dear. We've shown up to work every day, sometimes to the detriment to our mental, physical, and family's health. We, our agencies have all taken steps with our protective equipment procedures to stop the spread from us to the public and have been very successful. All these agencies have been incredibly short staffed since before this pandemic started. These mandates will push that short staffed issue over a threshold into something that will cause greater harm to ourselves and to our families and to the public that we provide uh, service to. We need to come together and find a way to make this work for everyone. Next speaker is Linda Edwards. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning, everyone, and happy new year. With the start of a new year comes opportunities to make changes and do things better for better health, for a better life. Let's use this opportunity to make better choices where the COVID situation is concerned. Let's stop PCR testing people who are asymptomatic. Let's stop forcing people to isolate who are asymptomatic. Let's stop forcing county employees to get vaccinations and boosters in order to keep their jobs. Let's end the cycle of stressful mandates on workers who have been providing essential work for the last two years. It is time for DSWs to return to their home departments so that everyone can return to providing essential services on a daily basis to county residents. And most importantly of all, it is time to talk about an exit strategy. We are no longer in a pandemic. The virus is now endemic and we have to learn to live with it, just like we do with colds and flu. Let's end the insanity which has held us all hostage for the last two years. Let's start the new year outright. Thank you. Next speaker is Michael Vergona. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, go right ahead. My name is Mike. My name is Michael Vergona. I've been a firefighter for 20 years. The last 11 I've served with the Santa Clara County Fire Department. I want to discuss the most recent health order mandating all in my position to be fully vaccinated and thank everyone involved that has put a temporary hold on firefighters losing their jobs. My concern today is that this is only on hold and these jobs are still at risk. If this health order goes through as written, we will lose many experienced, dedicated people that have bravely served Santa Clara County for years. We're already short staffed and the loss of this personnel will be devastating to our infrastructure and communities we serve. I've served through this entire pandemic, maintaining safe practices, including over 70 extra shifts and now my job is in jeopardy. We have proposals for testing and masking that will provide further support to keep our community safe. We've been on the front lines and we now know vaccination will not stop the spread. We are a resource, we wanna work and along with you, we have the common goal of protecting the public. I hope we can come to a conclusion that supports this goal without the loss of one firefighter's career. The next speaker is Jennifer Briscoe. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. 
Hi, Board of Supervisors. This is Dr. Jennifer Frisco. I represent District 1, Supervisor Wasserman. I'm also an appointed commissioner for the Commission on the Status of Women. Um, as the most tenured commissioner thus far on the Commission on the Status of Women, I just want to bring to the Board of Supervisors the attention of concern that I have um, with the lack of diversity of women of color, brown and black women on our commission. As I've witnessed in the past two, two and a half years or so, um, watching women of color vacate their seats on the commission, um, we are losing again diversity of women, black and brown women, who are who should be representing our diverse um, county. Um, and I am really, really, really concerned, especially that we have another vacancy on the seat. So please, please, please reconsider your appointments on our commission to make sure that they're reflective of our black and brown communities of Santa Clara County. Thank you. Our next speaker is Cody Griggs. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you've been speaking. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Cody Griggs. I'm a firefighter with the Santa Clara County Fire Department. I've been in the fire service for the last 15 years. I'm here to speak out against the recent health order from Sarah Cody that threatens my career and the career of 35 of my coworkers. The order calls for sweeping mandatory vaccines across vaccinations across multiple agencies. To give you some perspective at my department, we've been wearing full per personal protective equipment since the beginning of COVID and are already testing members at the start of each shift. We have had zero instances of our firefighters getting COVID from a patient or spreading COVID to a patient. What we have seen is a large and growing group of vaccinated and boosted firefighters getting COVID on their days off and spreading it to other vaccinated firefighters. Additionally, and more alarmingly, we've seen a number of our firefighters develop serious and life-threatening injuries shortly after getting vaccinated. We've seen multiple coworkers develop cardiac abnormalities, some requiring surgery, loss of thyroid function, and Bell's palsy. One firefighter will now never work on a fire engine again due to her pericarditis, which her doctor determined was caused by the COVID vaccine. Next speaker is B. Beekman. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, thank you. Uh, happy 2022. Thank you for the long list of items on today's agenda uh, from initial ideas from the ACLU and how to label and inventory the majority of surveillance and data collection technology of Santa Clara County government. These civil rights and civil protection guidelines and legal precedents are ideas of accountability, open community democracy, and peace, not war or harm. Among its many services, it can help much to organize current new questions of law enforcement and new surveillance tech all around the Asset Bay Area at this time. And uh, uh, we can all continue to work within uh, well-established uh, good ideas of reimagine racial equity in health and human services. From this, please note that the much heralded body camera accountability simply needs to be more accessible to everyday people who may need it. And to finally to conclude, the Biden administration is currently fighting at the Supreme Court for vaccine mandates to have the option of weekly tests. Uh, please consider uh, February meetings for Omicron to see the, the remainder. The next speaker is Matthew. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. And Matthew, go ahead. Your microphone good is afternoon. open. Uh, good afternoon. Good uh, afternoon. My name is Matt. I work for a local fire department as an engineer and paramedic. Um, I'm here to speak with you today to address my concerns with the vaccine mandate being imposed on county health care workers. First and foremost, not only am I an engineer and paramedic, but I'm also a husband and a father to two young children. I've come to terms that I'm going to miss a third of my children's lives as a firefighter. It's part of the job, though I can honestly stand before you telling you that unfortunately this number is drastically higher as mandatory work is at an all time high in the fire service. My coworkers and I have worked a significant amount of overtime throughout the past two years. This means we are spending less time with our families, missing out on important milestones and precious times we'll never get back. This vaccine mandate is coming at a time when the fire service is already understaffed and it will only exaggerate the situation for the worst. My hope is the council will delay this mandate. Look at the staffing shortages. The next speaker is Jeff B. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. And Jeff, are you there? I'm here. Thank you. All right, go ahead. 
Uh, first, I'd like to say thanks to the Board of Supervisors for the opportunity to speak. I would also like to add that I am a director in the healthcare industry who has lived with the pandemic on a daily basis for almost 23 months. I think one thing we've learned is that broad stroke policies have not worked, and now we are seeing the state move to requiring these same healthcare workers to return to work as long as they are asymptomatic. Our firefighters and first responders are critical to public safety, and I would ask that more consideration to individual circumstances be considered as it relates to retention of these first responders and valuable firefighters. There is no data to support that firefighters are spreading the, the disease. There are safety measures in place, including PPE and testing, and this overreaction is putting services and lives unnecessarily at risk. I urge you to re reconsider these broad stroke decisions. Thank you. The next speaker is Lauren Rapport. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning. My husband is a dedicated firefighter for Santa Clara County. He's committed his career at the department to helping people and has saved lives in this community. He is vaccinated, but just recently had COVID, giving him natural immunity, but that isn't enough as he is now required to also get a booster so that he can keep his job. This is our livelihood as I'm a stay-at-home mom to our two-year-old son and currently pregnant with our second child. Losing this job would drastically change our lives. The firefighters that stand to lose their jobs due to their vaccination status have the opportunity to continue to work hard for the community and to help others, but would be unable to do all of this because of a personal choice. And this is going to have a major effect on the care and the safety of the community. I ask you to allow these men and women the opportunity to continue working and serving regardless of their vaccination status. Thank you. Next speaker is Elliot Franklin. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. And Elliot, are you there? Hi, my name is Elliot Franklin. I've worked for DCF, DFCS in my position since 1996. We have significant safety issues in our facilities. We work in homes with youth that are dependents of the county. The youth we work with are assaultive and these youth attack staff. To make matters worse, management is not providing us the tools to properly deal with these youth as our policies and procedures are outdated and do not allow us to effectively do our jobs. Our new manager, Yasmina, has given us many directives that go against our training and protocols. The manager's directives jeopardize the safety of the youth. For example, on multiple occasions, Yasmina has directed staff to vacate the house and to leave a youth alone in the home if the youth is ha having behavior issues. Recently, a youth was left alone in the house and locked staff out the house. The youth's safety was great, greatly compromised as the youth could have easily started a fire, gotten a hold of medications and chemicals. Our manager needs to be addressed about these issues to ensure the safety of the youth in our care. Next speaker is Scott Largent. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. All right. Good morning, everyone. Scott Largen, Happy New Year. I'm making a uh, a rant today out here for the. We had a call come through. Um, I'm building a ramp. Um, there's two porta johns that are basically about 200 feet from heading, and they're very hard to uh, to get to. There's currently a two by four section that goes about 20 feet. You kind of got to balance and navigate that thing, and it's really difficult when you see somebody trying to four wheel through in a wheelchair. That's very very sad. Now the pregnant woman, when she has to kind of walk on one foot with a post. Um, that's vicious to see also. The city finally put some of those porta johns out there on heading, but when you have to go through, um, you know, like tough mutter to get 200 feet, uh, that's just not an option. Um, the other option a lot of people use is uh, plastic bags. That works good too. The next speaker is Barry Arada. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you for your time. <clears throat> I'm Barry Arata. I'm a lifelong resident of Santa Clara County. I'm also a 15 plus year veteran with the San Jose Fire Department. Um, I speak to you respectfully here, um, specifically on top of the mandate that has been pushed forward toward vaccination 
um, and now we have a mandate for boosters. City of San Jose, as you're all aware, has been accepting exemptions for your firefighters and frontline workers to continue to work. That is now gonna be removed from us. <clears throat> and my dedication to my career and the life that I am living, my family, to serve the public here in Santa Clara County and specifically the city of San Jose is gonna be ripped out from underneath me. I ask all of you to create a committee to look at the efficacy of the vaccines, the boosters, the safety of natural herd immunity and open that topic. As you've heard nationwide, there are doctors speaking out based on immunity and treatment and we need to do that here in Santa Clara County. So please the supervisors ask Sarah Cody to open that up, thank you. And this is the clerk just uh, wanted to point out to members of the public, it appears we have multiple rest requests to speak from the same person and I'm unable to allow you to speak twice on an item. So if, if that's the case, um, I'm sorry about that. And if it is a different person, please rename and I will call out a different person's name if it is indeed a, a different person that's requesting to speak. I'm sorry for the delay. Our next speaker is Joe. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. And Joe, are you there? Going once, going twice for Joe. Nope. I'll try to Joe one more time later. Um, the next speaker, oh, Joe. Joe, are you there? I see you've turned on your microphone. Yes. Go right ahead. Yes. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. I've been a firefighter in the county for 10 years and I'm speaking regarding the recent county health order. As our county board of supervisors and board of directors for the Central Park Protection District, I am asking you for your help and action to revise or amend the order to ensure that we can provide continued exceptional service and care to our community. The public safety agencies within our county are in a staffing crisis. This order will exacerbate this problem and will cause more harm to the community than help. I ask the board intervene further beyond the recent waiver and at the least to be consistent with adjacent agencies outside of our community and the CDC and state recommendations. Thank you. All right, our next speaker is Lori Nepa. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Lori. Lori, are you there? I do not have an active microphone for Lori. I don't, I'm unable to um, okay, call. have her speak. That was the last request to speak. So that concludes um, public comment. Thank you very much. With that, we move on to item number eight, which is approval of the consent calendar. Colin, if you'll please read through it for us. All right, we have a request from Supervisor Lee to present item number 63D during item number six. Item number 63D is to adopt the commendation for Mason Fong for his heartfelt dedication and service to the residents of Santa Clara County and his unwavering commitment to making his community one of compassion, safety, and pride. We have a request from the clerk of the board to delete item numbers 6A and 6C. The commendations will still be adopted under item number 63. Item number 6A is to present the commendation for Doug Goss, outgoing president of the Santa Clara County Association of Realtors. Item number 6C is to present the commendation for Judge Catherine Lucero for 21 years of service with the Santa Clara Superior Court. We have a request from President Wasserman to consider item number 13 prior to item number 11. Item number 13 is to consider recommend recommendations relating to at-home COVID-19 testing. Item number 11 is to receive report from public health officer and administration relating to the current status of COVID-19. We have requests from Vice President Ellenberg to add item numbers 22 and 23 to the consent calendar. Item number 22 is to consider recommendations from the Finance Agency Clerk Recorder's Office relating to the Restrictive Covenant Program. Item number 23 is the adoption of Salary Ordinance number NS-5.22.53 relating to the compensation of employees adding two Clerk Recorder Office Specialist 3 or Clerk Recorder Office Specialist 2 positions in the County Clerk Recorder's Office. We have requests from administration to hold item numbers 26 and 27 to January 25th, 2022. Item number 26 is to receive a report relating to improving management and operations, appropriately sizing the jail population and alternatives to jail. Item number 27 is to consider recommendations relating to the framework for justice involved clients. We have a request from Supervisor Chavez to hold item numbers 37 and 38 to January 25th, 2022. Item number 37 is to approve job, class, job specifications and amend classification plan to add classifications of cardiac sonographer one 
cardiac sonographer two, cardiac sonographer three, per diem cardiac sonographer two, and per diem cardiac sonographer three. Item number 38 is the adoption of salary ordinance number NS-5.22.62 relating to the compensation of employees deleting various alternately staffed positions in ultrasonographer and diagnostic imaging technologist classification series and adding 10 cardiac sonographer three or cardiac sonographer two or cardiac sonographer one positions in Santa Clara Valley Medical Center and amending the salary schedule to add the classifications of cardiac sonographer one, cardiac sonographer two, cardiac sonographer three, per diem cardiac sonographer two and per diem cardiac sonographer three and adding footnote number 254 authorizing a differential for cardiac sonographer two and cardiac cardiac sonographer three to receive on-call pay. We also have a, a correction to item number 47. The item should read as follows. Item number 47, approve delegation of authority to the county executive or designee to negotiate, execute, amend, or terminate donation agreement with Pacific Locomotive Association Incorporation relating to donation of county-owned railroad assets for a contract term that starts no earlier than January 11, 2022 and ends no later than December 31st, 2024, following approval by County Council as the form of legality and approval by the Office of the County Executive. Delegation of authority shall expire on December 31st, 2024. And that concludes the report. Thank you, Colin. Well done job as always. I just can't imagine how many other people wish they were able to do what you just did. All I right. can't imagine that many people, sorry. <laughs> I, I don't know. All right, do we have any supervisors with any additions, subtractions, comments? If not, I'll look for it. Colin, and I don't see any uh, public speakers either on consent. There are so no look, requests to speak. So I'll uh, look for a motion to approve. Supervisor Simidian. Before uh, we do that, uh, Mr. Chair and colleagues, I would like to indicate that I uh, will be abstaining, again, uh, casting an abstention, uh, if that's the right term, on items 51, 51, and 79, 79. I would like to ask that we hear item 22, rather than put it on consent. It is one of the two items on restrictive covenants. Uh, not because I have any issues there, but simply because I think it's worth taking a few minutes to have that conversation uh, rather than uh, hear it on consent. <clears throat> and then on item number 17, this is an item, colleagues, uh, if you take a look at your agenda in the packet again, uh, involving a um, uh, an issue with the Harvey Rose organization and our uh, teen beds, psychiatric facility project. Uh, I think, uh, Mr. Chairman, this one can go on consent if colleagues are amenable, but with clarity that uh, consistent with the report that we do in fact direct uh, the Harvey Rose folks to contract with the subcontractor referenced in that report, and that we do in fact direct the administration and the Rose organization to add the additional 100 hours that are referenced there. Thank you very much with those uh, changes, I will be uh, ready to vote, but I see another hand or two has now popped up, so I'll hold off before offering a motion, sir. Thank you. Supervisor Smith, just for clarification, before I move on to the other supervisors, you wanted to hear 22, not put it on consent, but you were okay with 23 going on consent? Yes, 23 is just a, uh, I don't, I shouldn't say just, 23 is an implementing measure. Yes. Uh, and once we've taken care of 22, um, uh, which I expect we will, 23 is fine to be on uh, consent. We're going to need those positions thank regardless. Thank you. I'll take that. Vice President Ellenberg. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Supervisor, I always, uh, Samiti, and always appreciate being able to consolidate uh, the meetings, but um, if, if you don't mind, I would like to hear item 17 or at least have the opportunity um, to answer some, to ask some questions. We don't, I don't need to get a report. I support the, I support the action. Just want to flesh it out a little bit. Okay, so we will flesh out 17 a little bit. Not that's, put it on consent. That's all I have. Thank you so much. Thank you. Supervisor Lee, I thought your hand was up and it's down now, so you're okay. Supervisor Chavez, you're okay as well. Supervisor Smitty, your hand is still raised. Are you making a motion to approve all that you've heard and said? Happy to uh, move the consent calendar as amended with the clarification that item 17 will now stay on our regular agenda per the request of Supervisor Ellenberg. Yep. And again, Mr. Chair, 
Um, I'm uh, uh, asking that we do hear item 22 on restrictive covenants, and I personally am casting an abstention uh, or registering an abstention on items 51 and 79. Thank you. Sounds like second that. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. No further discussion. Excuse me. Colin, we have one speaker. Would you we please do allow have a, a late request to speak? Would you like me to call the speaker now? Yes, go ahead and, and do that. And they, they may have two minutes. All right. The final speaker is B. Beekman. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, hi, Blair Beekman here. Thank you very much, Supervisor Wasserman, for uh, noticing my hand raised. Uh, I think uh, maybe uh, an idea in 2022, um, yourselves tend to be a bit quick and over-efficient uh, when, you know, there wasn't public comment uh, for the consent calendar originally. You quickly went through it without giving uh, much of a nod to you know, a waiting period. You know, people, it takes a, people a bit of time to you know, raise their hand for consent calendar things and, and to gather their thoughts. Uh, you guys just blow through things, flow through things really quickly. Um, and I often cannot get public comment in because you, because you work so quickly. So thank you for noticing this time. And I think it's something you need to work on in 2022 to notice the hand raising and not be quite so efficient in, in, in going through a, asking if there's public comment and when there's not you quickly move through it with that all said thank you um i'm assuming i'm not positive you can correct me if i'm wrong that item 25 about all the surveillance technology that's been put on to consent no uh it, it will be a regular agenda item okay thank you well I, I just wanted to quickly offer that uh you know uh with with all the omicron worries uh for the next couple of weeks i hope that february can be a time that we can uh have a, a public meeting review process of, of uh, Omicron issues overall, and we can see how to lessen and, and possibly better understand Omicron for the remainder of uh, the winter of 2021 and 22, and hopefully see uh, its lessening effects. It's a good practice as we do now. Good luck in the choices you have to make at this time. Uh, it's difficult uh, for all of us. Uh, I'm, I'm for, uh, uh, boosters and then also uh, weekly tests. Good luck in, in being for, forgiving to people in this process and thank you for your time. Thank you. That, the curve, that concludes our request to speak. Thank you. And the curve will be flattened in February. Uh, Mr. Williams. Yes, um, there, we need to provide a oral summary of item number 79 in accordance with the government code. Um, we usually have language for the clerk, but I can just provide a quick summary, which is that item 79 is final adoption of an ordinance that increases the base salary for the assessor, the district attorney, and the sheriff by 0.5562%. Thank you very much for adding that in. All right, we have a motion. We have a second. We've heard from the public. We've had discussion. Roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yeah. Supervisor Seminian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. I belatedly was uh, noting Supervisor Seminian's uh, abstentions, and I would like to abstain on those same items, but I have my yes vote for the rest. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you Thank very you. much. That moves us on to items 9 and 10, which are going to be heard together and were not to be heard before 10.30, and that was 18 minutes ago. So we are right on schedule. Let me turn to item number nine. Consuelo, I'm looking for your face or your name. If not, Mr. Draper, who do we have here? There's Dave. Do I have Consuelo or uh, Jeff? Yes. Uh there's Sorry, there she is. Yeah, she will. Yep. Who's ever making the report, please start. Thank you, President Wasserman. Happy New Year um, to you and the rest of the board. Uh, we're starting off with some technical issues already, um, but happy to be here. Uh, we don't have a formal presentation. We've asked that the presentation be attached as a supplemental memo, uh, but did want to share just a few points with you um, before you consider the item. 
Um, this originated with a board referral some time ago and through a partnership with the Facilities and Fleet Department, the Office of Supportive Housing, County Council, City of Palo Alto, and our development partner have been actively working over the four years to get this project where it is today. Um, for your consideration is approval of a 110 unit affordable workforce educator housing development in the city of Palo Alto at 231 Grant Avenue. There are two items. One is related to the CEQA document and the second is related to a more project description, financing updates uh, and actual approval of the project. Um, and before you take the vote for consideration, I did just wanna take a moment on behalf of Jeff, Jeff Draper and myself to thank our, our staff teams um, David Berry, Emily Chen, um, and Kathy Bradley with FAF, and on the OSH side, Natalie Monk and uh, Eloisa Murillo Garcia, uh, and of course are supported by County Council, um, Lizanne Reynolds and Karen Willis. Um, it takes a lot of people to get us to this place and just wanted to take the time to recognize everybody's hard work. Happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. We have public speakers. Colin, if you can allow our speakers each to speak for uh, one minute on this item. Sure. Our next speaker is Christina Lopez. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. And Christina, uh, I'm asking you to unmute. And if you accept that request, your microphone will be on and then you'll be able to speak. I'll give you a, a second there. Uh, it doesn't, oh, there we go. Go right ahead. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Christina Lopez, and I'm not sure why we're only given one minute to speak, but I'm about to be, I'm about to lose my job because of this high risk setting. And, and Christina, Colin, please stop, please stop the timer. And Christina, you are correct with the number of people. You have two minutes to speak. So Colin, if you'll please make the timer at one minute and 44 seconds. One moment while we get that going. The timer is now ready. Thank you. Hi, my name is Christina Lopez. I'm being affected by the Santa Clara County orders because I'm in the high risk setting. So I'm no longer able to breathe at my job. And I would like to ask anybody that's affected by these mandates to please contact unifyscc.com. You can also reach me on my cell phone at 408-469-1450. Thank you. Thank you. And Colin, before we go on to any other speakers, this item is in relation to 231, um, the environmental impact and the project that's that's being done. Any other comments regarding anything else are not appropriate from the speakers. Just a heads up for the speakers. Thank you. This is items number nine and 10. And the next speaker is Amy Sung. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. And Amy, I've uh, asked to unmute. If you accept the request, you will, your microphone will turn on and then you'll be able to speak. Thank you. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Amy Sung. I'm the president of Palo Alto Forward, a local housing advocacy organization. We have submitted a letter to urge the board a yes vote on the Educated Workforce Housing Project at 231 Grand Avenue in Palo Alto. But today I'm here to share a personal story as a mom. My son, Paul, is a, a proud product of PAUSD's special ed program. After college, he landed a job with the PAUSD as a classroom aide, a classroom aide for special ed kids. What a perfect role model he would be, I thought. We live in Palo Alto. At the time, we lived in the College Terrace neighborhood, which is just a block away from the school that he teaches and as Escondido Elementary. He walks to school. He's always the first one in the classroom. He talks about his kids nonstop. You can see that he loves his job. So Paul, Mr. Paul, what are you doing here? A kid that one day spotted him in the neighborhood and called out with excitement. Oh, I live here, he said. 
you live here. The kid had his eyes wide open in disbelief. But our teachers should be our neighbors. It is good for the students, it's good for the teachers, and it is good for the community. Stability is the key. Now, in the midst of the COVID, this is with the school challenges are left and right, we told teachers that we love them and they are our heroes. There's no better way to thank our teachers than getting this project up the ground and started without any further delay. So I'm here to urge you a yes vote to get this project started and get it started today. Thank you so much for hearing me. Thank you. And Colin, before you go on to the next speaker, I'm going to give everybody listening um, notice. We will be breaking for lunch at exactly noon today, whether or not we are in the middle of something, at the beginning or the end of something. So I'm giving everybody a heads up. We will be breaking for lunch in uh, at noon today. Thank you. Please continue, Colin. The next speaker is Gail Price. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Go ahead, Gail. Thank you. I am Gail Price. I am speaking as a former Palo Alto School Board and City Council member, parent, and resident. I strongly support this housing project, which demonstrates the partnership among various school districts, the county, and the city. Thank you to Joe Simidian for sponsoring and promoting this concept from the beginning. We are grateful. I've commented on this project and the need for housing ever since the beginning of the review of this project, and I have spoken about this topic for 20 years. The project and site design are exemplary. Convenient housing will benefit staff and reduce long commutes. We as you value and support education. We recruit staff well, but have a problem retaining them because many staff members and others for that matter, cannot afford to live in or near our community. Housing shortages have been discussed for decades. Now is your chance to be proactive. Please adopt the resolution certifying, certifying the Workforce Housing Project, EIR, and all related actions. Thank you very much for your time and attention. It's nice to see everyone. Thank you. Next speaker is Jessica Roth. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Oh, I think she just, Jessica, I, I just lost you. If you could log back in and sign, I'll bring you back up to the top of the list. Until then, uh, the next speaker is Jennifer DeBrianza. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi. Go ahead. Hear? Yes, go right ahead. Great. Hi, my name is Jennifer DeBrianza. I serve on the Palo Alto School Board. I'm calling in strong support of this project. Thank you to Supervisor Simidian for spearheading it for all these years and for everyone who has supported it all this way. Um, this is a project that is so needed in so many communities um, in the county and has been for a long time. So many of our teachers, our staff and our, our teachers and our classified staff um, have very long commutes and they're, they're unable to just serve our district in the way that they would like in a way that benefits our students to be around in the evenings or on weekends for all of the great stuff that students do. Um, it's often said that the idea of this type of housing is great, but the location is bad. This location couldn't be more perfect. I live right near California Avenue, and I'm so grateful to be close to the train, to stores and restaurants, right near major roads to get to highways. Um, it's really a perfect spot, and I'm really excited that it's come this far. I'm so grateful for your work on this project um, and can't wait um, for it to be built and filled with educators from around the county. Um, not only am I grateful for the housing it will provide, but also I think it's really going to serve as a guide for a lot of us to see um, what future housing can look like and how much of a need is out there based on how many applications we get and whatnot. So I think it really is a great first step in going down this road um, in a lot of different ways that, that are, um, will benefit our community. Thank you so much. I'm going to go back to Jessica Roth and see if I can get the microphone working for you this time. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Sorry about that. I hope you can hear me now. Yes, um, go ahead. Let me 
Jessica Roth. I am a fourth generation small business owner on California Avenue, which is just a few blocks away from this amazing project. My family has been serving the surrounding neighborhoods for more than 80 years. I am vice president of the California Avenue Merchant Board. This December, I raised more than $14,000 to help decorate our street. I think it's fair to say myself, along with our business, is an asset to our street and our city. Why is this relevant, you may ask? Well, I am also a below market rate ownership recipient through the Palo Alto Below Market Rate Program. I was on a list for 15 years, which in itself is a little ridiculous, but I can say 100% if it were not for that program, this city would have lost me and my business years ago. Teachers are notoriously underpaid. If given a bit of help or an opportunity to live like the families they teach, everyone will win. The students will see their daytime heroes at their local, local farmer's market or the backyard brew getting coffee. Have you ever seen a little kid run into their teacher out in the world? It's pure joy and happiness. If they have fair rent, they can go out to dinner at the local Cuban restaurant and maybe run into some of their lo local colleagues, stop by their local shop to pick up the gift for that TA that goes above and beyond. This is all supporting the local economy while supporting all the amazing people that support our youth. I don't think there could be a better project uh, if I made it up myself. I am extremely excited about the opportunity of giving teachers an opportunity to live a fair and normal lifestyle. Thank you so much. I really hope you consider passing this today. The next speaker is Simon Pennington. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Thank you very much. Hello, Board of Supervisors. Uh, my name is Simon Pennington. I'm a longtime Palo Alto resident and an employee of Foothill College. I live in the Barron Park neighborhood and strongly support the 231 Grant Avenue proposal. I feel it will bring much needed below market housing uh, to keep educational professionals in the area and provide for a diverse and dynamic local population. There will be economic benefit to the California Avenue shops and restaurants that have been adversely affected by COVID and also the growth of online retail. It will provide environmental benefit to the area because of the proximity to mass transit, both trains and buses, and due to the fact that there will be several hundred fewer cars on freeways every day because people don't have to drive in from from Gilroy and Tracy and even further afield. It also makes education jobs for both staff and faculty more attractive. A state wages cannot compete with Google and the possibility of affordable rent is a big plus when hiring. I can say from our perspective at Foothill, we often lose potential hires between the interview and offering that, that hire a position because they go out into the community, they look at the rent and housing prices and realize they can't afford to live here. We're losing talented people. I worked at three colleges, worked five nights a week in a restaurant and bought, remodeled and sold houses myself in the 1990s to be able to afford the house I'm fortunate to live in now. I just don't think that would be possible now, even if somebody was willing to work that much. Because again, you need about 300,000 a year to live in Palo Alto. And again, we don't pay that well in education. So I really encourage the supervisors to support this project. And thank you so much for your time. Next speaker is Onizi Kaizi. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you so much for giving me the time to speak here. I'm speaking um, on behalf of Palo Alto Forward, which is a nonprofit organization focused on innovating and expanding housing choices and transportation mobility. Um, we support the adoption of agenda items 9 and 10. In 2020, we surveyed 68 pay USD teachers to hear about their housing concerns. Every single participant indicated that the high cost of housing was a problem. Many gave examples of colleagues and family members who have moved out of the region because of housing prices and availability. The high cost of land and construction in Palta have made it cost prohibitive for affordable housing developers, which is why this project to build needed affordable homes and underutilized public land is so important. On behalf of our members, we look forward to this positive step in addressing housing for teachers and developing a model of collaboration. On a personal note, I'm a private educator who has struggled with housing insecurity myself, so I really understand these issues firsthand. We take pride in telling our students to dream big and rightly so. 
you know, I had the privilege to work with really talented, exceptional youth. I would love to see our teachers and our educators see the same support from our community. This project will be a crucial step in supporting the people who make those dreams possible. Thank you so much. The next speaker is Kay Schirmersrun. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, my name is Kate Skirmerhorn, and I am the president of the Los Altos Teachers Association. I am here today to speak up in favor of the 231 Grant Avenue housing project. LATA believes in the importance of providing affordable local housing for teachers. When there isn't affordable housing near schools, teachers face the choice of financial pressure to live closer to their school community or long commutes traveling between home and work. Our district has teachers in both scenarios, paying uncomfortably high rents, or commuting from Hollister, Mount Morgan Hill, Santa Cruz, and other long distances, especially when factoring in Bay Area traffic. These extra hours spent traveling are hours that teachers are not using for their lesson planning, grading, or spending time with their own families or taking care of their own needs. At times, these difficult choices lead to teachers leaving our school and moving to more accessible areas. Being able to live closer to their school communities would greatly improve these teachers' qualities of life and improve overall education for their students. Furthermore, it would bring teachers more fully into their local communities. With a common neighborhood often comes common interests and shared experiences. Not only does this project support our teachers, but it also provides opportunities to strengthen our communities. Thank you for the opportunity to speak up in favor of the 231 Grant Ave housing project. The next speaker is Nancy. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, thank you for calling on me. My name is Nancy Shepard, and I'd like to introduce myself. I've been PTA Council President for Palo Alto Unified School District for the PTA in town. I've been a mayor of the city of Palo Alto when I served on city council. And today I stand here as a mother of a daughter who works as a teacher in Palo Alto Unified School District, both at the Gunn and the Pali campus. My daughter-in-law also is an aide up at Nixon. Uh, it is acutely, oh, I am acutely aware of the concerns regarding the integration between the teachers and our community, which grows more separated every year particularly because most do not have an opportunity to live close. Um, even though my daughter lives in a neighboring community of Bellhaven, she still commutes 45 minutes during normal conditions when commutes are very active and heavy in order to get to school. Um, there is also the lost element of Palo Alto when I moved here in 1984, when the community was integrated much more completely between first responders, teachers, aides in the classroom, and now we are more separated with our polar, um, uh, with the inability for those that teach in our schools and respond and our first responders to be able to live here in Palo Alto. We've lost some of the element of integration, both as a community with, the, with this missing piece of our community. And so I'm so grateful for this particular project and ask that the county, that the supervisors do approve this project um, and certify the FEIR. Thank you, bye now. Next speaker is Elizabeth Ratner. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Ratner. I'm speaking as uh, advocacy chair for the Palo Alto League of Women Voters. Uh, in support of the Grant Educator Housing Project. The League of Women Voters believes uh, in pol policies which, which provide housing, decent housing for all Americans, and also in policies which will reduce uh, emissions for, from uh, transportation and commuting to improve our climate. Um, we wholeheartedly support this project. Uh, very few teachers can afford to live here, forcing them to commute uh, hours to work to get their, to their job is very bad, not only for the teachers and the educators, but also for our community. Educators should be a part of the community they work in. This project will give them that opportunity. The League believes use of county land is a great idea, a great uh, 
method for reducing the cost of building affordable housing. Please continue looking for county land to build more uh, affordable housing projects like this. We thank the supervisors very much for their support and um, we would like you to vote to approve this project. Thank you. The next speaker is Paul Soto. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. And Paul, are you there? Paul, I have your microphone on, but I'm not hearing you yet. Are you there? I will come back to you after the next speaker. I'm not able to get any audio from the microphone. One moment, please. The next speaker is Patrick Ahrens. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning, uh, Board of Supervisors. My name is Patrick Ahrens. I'm the president of the Foothill De Anza College Board of Trustees. Um, it's good to see you all. I would like to speak in strong support of the Grand Avenue proposal. I want to thank Supervisor Joseph Midian, Sarah Schaefen, the <coughs> Office of Housing, Consuelo Hernandez, and all of your colleagues and all the so many supporters that got this project this far. In August of 2018, the Foothill De Anza Board of trustees voted to identify $600,000 in funding to be used for this project. And the Foothill De Anza uh, District has a longstanding reputation of delivering outstanding education that is built on the quality of our faculty and classified professionals and ensuring that they can afford to live locally is so paramount to the concerns of our district. Uh, this is one of the reasons why we've included uh, support for housing partnerships in the $898 million bond measure that the district voters approved in March of 2020. Uh, we really see projects like 231 Grant Avenue that's um, undertaken with forward-thinking partners like all of you as the key to ensuring that we can continue to have really well-qualified employees serving all of our students. So thank you all in advance for leading the way. Thank you. All right. Our final speaker is Paul Soto. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Paul, are you there? Paul, are you there? <laughs> I'm unable to get a response from Paul. Uh, other than that, I have no other requests to speak. All right, Colin. Thank you very much for that. I'm going to turn to Supervisor Smidian. It's his district supervisor. We've combined nine and 10, and there's six actions total uh, between the two. And my understanding is you can put them all together if you wish. And then Thank we'll you. Go, then we'll go to Supervisor Lee and then Chavez. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Let me uh, do this if I may. First, move uh, approval of the recommended action on item nine, which is specifically the uh, certification of the EIR. Uh, I'm advised and reminded by staff and county council that <laughs> that's the appropriate action to take prior to acting on the project proper. So if I could move approval on that uh, and then um, make a few comments before offering a motion on item number 10, I think that's probably the best way to proceed. All right, so we have a motion. Do I have I'll a second. second? I'll second. Supervisor Lee, you've second. You've also got your hand raised. Please make your comments. Yes, first of all, I would say thank you um, for this uh, really amazing uh, proposal. As we all know, affordable housing for teachers is the most challenging problem for our schools to hire and keep good teachers in our schools. Many of the good teachers are leaving because of the long commute and extremely high cost to live in Silicon Valley. Cost of housing in Silicon Valley is very high, but for specifically Palo Alto, it's frankly ridiculous, especially for our teachers. Thank you very much to Supervisor Smidian for leading on this important project. And this really should serve as a model for school districts and cities in our county to find more ways to find land and opportunities to build more housing for our teachers. My one uh, comment of uh, this project is that I would suggest in the future that we should even be more aggressive with high density. Instead of four stories, what if we could look at five or even six stories because land's our biggest problem. And I do believe that uh, uh, I, I know there's an ER on the study, but I don't believe the differences of the impact on the environment would be so much greater. But if anything, it's practically greener uh, for the extra stories on there. So that's all I have. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. I don't have questions relative to the EIR. I have questions relative to item 10. So sure. you can decide how to proceed. Thank you. I'll come back to you on 10. Thank you. So we have a motion and a second. Uh, Colin, roll call vote, please, on item nine. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes, as well. Thank you. Supervisor Simidian, we're going back to you on 10 for your motion and then comments by Supervisor Chavez. Supervisor Lee, you also wish to speak on 10. I see your hand raised. Uh, no, I think I could go ahead and uh, lower that. Thank you. You got it. Thank you, Supervisor Thank you. Smith. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman and colleagues. Uh, I think uh, supporters did a, a really marvelous job of laying out the rationale for the project. So I, I'm going to limit myself uh, a little bit uh, at this point. Uh, I'm so pleased that Consuelo Hernandez uh, included a list of thank yous because I was wondering how I could possibly uh, say thank you to all the folks who got us to this point without uh, missing someone. So thank you to her for uh, taking that duty on. A couple of observations, colleagues, and, and the first is, I, I think I should acknowledge, maybe disclose is even the right word, uh, a personal uh, connection here. Um, the site at 231 Grant Avenue is about three blocks from the home I first lived in in Palo Alto when my father was a teacher at Palo Alto High School supporting our household on a single school teacher's salary. He was able to make the rent and walk to school a few blocks away at Palo Alto High School. Yes. He was able as well to save enough money to purchase a home subsequently in Palo Alto, which is the reason we moved away from that site. And it touched me to hear one of our commenters uh, this morning talk about the excitement uh, when a kid bumps into their teacher in the community uh, and can turn and say, mom, dad, this is Mr. So-and-so, this is Ms. So-and-so, my teacher. Uh, and it uh, recalled many such moments for me personally, frankly. And more importantly though, it, it reminded all of us, I hope yet again, of how important those connections are that when teachers can live and work in the same community, they understand that community and the challenges these kids face in a, in a way that I think is very difficult for folks who spend uh, the bulk of their day in their lives uh, in remote communities uh, by virtue of economic necessity. Uh, it reminded me as well of the time that one of our speakers talked about before school, after school, occasionally on weekends when uh, teachers and, and other staff can be um, available to help a kid uh, who needs a little more time to be part of activities on the school campus. Uh, those are things that simply uh, aren't, uh, aren't possible for many folks who, again, by virtue of economic necessity, are obliged to be uh, in other places. And it, it also, uh, it, you know, it, it, it's, it may seem obvious, but I think um, you know, we're asking a lot of folks in uh, uh, these roles to give it their best when they arrive on the scene after an hour and a half commute and have to head home with an hour and a half commute uh, as well in the afternoon. That's just, it's not only not time spent on or with kids, you know, uh, it's, it's uh, time that is uh, draining, debilitating, and uh, takes a lot out of you as folks who are in that situation uh, can remind us. And uh, it is, and I wanna make a segue here to my, my second point, Mr. Chairman, which is it, it is, I think, an essential tool, and I hope it will be an expanded tool throughout our county to attract and retain top quality staff. Mm -hmm. uh, and while I have shorthanded this from the beginning as teacher housing, as you've heard today, it's housing for not just teachers, but for education staff, including our classified staff who are struggling even uh, more mightily with some of the economic necessities. And that, that ties in with our mission to help um, the neediest among us as well, because while I wanna say thank you to the county and to my 
colleagues on the board for getting us to this point and being ready, I hope, in a moment to approve this project. I want to say thank you again for the effort we made five years ago with the unanimous support of our board to save the Buena Vista Mobile Home Park, a very different group of folks uh, who were uh, making uh, low income, very low income, extremely low income ELI uh, incomes. And one of the reasons that we fought so hard to keep that community intact here in uh, Palo Alto was because of the 400 plus folks at that uh, location, 100 plus of them were kids who were going to Palo Alto schools sooner or later, and they were getting a great education. And that was gonna be their ticket. That was gonna be their key to a next step and a future that was really bright, promising. But that's only the case if they have a great school to go to and a great school district. And that's only the case if we have great teachers and staff. And so, yeah, this may be a project uh, for teachers and educators and staff members, but in my view, the project is for those kids uh, down the street. Uh, and uh, I see a, a real connection between uh, this project and that project and those kids that uh, we were uh, able to help um, just a few years ago. And uh, finally, I do wanna say, uh, I was pleased to hear someone make the uh, environmental uh, uh, argument because it hasn't got much discussion, but you know, we talk about uh, greenhouse gases and climate change and what are we gonna do? Well, the most direct thing we can do is reduce the number of vehicle miles traveled. And the most direct way we can do that is if people are either gonna work from home or if they're gonna be in close proximity to their jobs. And so as uh, one of the speakers noted, if, uh, and I'll be a little more colloquial, if folks don't have to drive from halfway to here in Helen back uh, in order to get to work every day, then uh, that's greenhouse gas avoidance uh, that um, I think is um, potentially of significant impact if we could make it the norm rather than the exception. With all of that, I will move approval of item number nine yet again and ask for a second. I hope we get a unanimous vote of support. I'm happy to either let staff answer questions or answer any uh, that um, are appropriate for me, Mr. Chair. And again, thanks to all. Thank you. Second. We have a second by Supervisor Lee. I had, think we're headed towards a consensus vote, but uh, we'll know in a little while. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you so much. And um, I do just wanna acknowledge all of the amazing work that's gone to bringing this project forward. And I'm very ho hopeful that we're gonna learn a lot <laughs> from the collaboration and the model um, that we can uh, share with other parts of the community. My questions are just a little more basic about the structure of the agreement um, just to help me understand will just to help me understand kind of the basics of it um, one is um, Consuelo given that the county owns the land I'm interested in understanding why we would have a 55-year covenant on affordability thank you for the question supervisor Chavez it's our standard um, ground lease provision one of the requirements is a deed restriction on the use um, and the length of time is typically 55 years up to 99 years. So often what we see is um, an extension request that comes later, um, but we ask, we frame it so that in five years or whenever there's a change, the board has the authority to extend or the, th the board has more input rather than delegating that solely to staff. And will the, the um, these will be rental projects. I mean, the housing is rental. So um, will the project then be conveyed to the county at that future point? Or at what point, um, at what point does the county become the owner of the, the project? So we have supervisor um, to answer your question, say that at the end of the 55 year covenants, um, if there's, um, a need to either change the owner. We have the right to take possession of the property, um, although it's not standard for us to do that. Typically, our objective is to extend that affordability as, as far as possible. That's right, uh, colleagues. The reason I'm asking the question is um, for those of you who have had this experience, I and I think we've even done this on this board, where because of the covenants, we're then asked as a county or a public entity to invest in the continued affordability of the project. And so this, the reason that I've been so insistent on the county maintaining ownership of properties and 
um, having a rights of first refusal in, in um, the lease, leases is in order to protect whatever future government or future investments are um, required. And that way the, the public entity is in the, the deciding seat in the future. Um, which we haven't always been, at least my experience has been uh, in other roles I've played. Um, then the other question I have is that the staff report references that 77 per, or of the units on, um, I apologize, let me just get the paper, on um, packet page 52, and this is a uh, page, I think it's uh, page four of seven, that 77 residential units of the project will be available to teachers and staff um, of the Palo Alto Unified School District, Mountain View, Wisman School District, Los Altos School District, Mountain View, Los Altos High School District, Foothill De Anza Community College District. And then 32 of the pro of these um, will be for um, Ravenswood and um, Menlo Park School District, Los Los, Los, uh, or Los Alamitos School District, Menlo Atherton School District, Tide Academy, East Palo Alto Academy, and Sequoia District Adult School. And I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about the, um, the how that was, um, how, how the distribution was calculated and yeah, that would be helpful. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Um, the second part of the property, the 32 units that you mentioned that are in the staff report, that is part of our negotiations with the Facebook grant that we received last year. Um, if you recall, there was a $25 million Facebook allocation in support of the project um, that has a number of conditions that we're required to meet. Um, some of those include these provisions on the 32 units. Um, the other is in connection with some of the school districts that spoke in support. And I, my apologies, in, in my introduction, I forgot to thank our partnership with the school dis districts, which is very critical. Um, and the balance of the units are for those partnerships that we have with the multiple school districts uh, noted in the staff report. Consuelo, to be clear, um, Facebook conditioned the their contribution based on the and I know the school, I, and I don't know all the school districts, but based on the school districts that are primarily in San Mateo County, if I'm looking at this breakdown, is that what you're sharing with us? Yes, one part supervisor. Um, they also have an existing development um, that's not in our county border um, that's related to this project. Could you say a little, just a little bit more about that project? Sure, although I do see Supervisor Simidian um, may want to chime in before me. Supervisor. I don't want to cut off the flow, but Supervisor Chavez, if it's okay, I can, I think, shed a little light on this, uh, if it would be helpful. Whatever, whoever has the answer, I'm good. Um, when Facebook approached us with the offer of a $25 million grant, and it is a grant, not a loan, so it was a somewhat unusual venture, um, they uh, said that uh, as part of that grant, however, they would like to ensure that um, South San Mateo County, where their uh, operation is located, was the beneficiary of 32 units. And I'll ask Ms. Hernandez to correct me if I'm wrong, but my recollection is it goes like this. Essentially, it is for the Ravenswood Elementary School District, which incorporates portions of East Palo Alto and East Menlo Park. East Palo Alto, of course, is an incorporated community unto itself in San Mateo County. East Menlo Park is part of the incorporated community of Menlo Park in South San Mateo County. The district straddles the boundary of those two communities. And uh, as Ms. Hernandez indicated, Facebook had already been providing some assistance to the district in terms of teacher housing and saw this project as a way to ensure that that uh, assistance continued. I liked it for uh, two or three reasons. One of which is um, it, it fits the model in my view of um, put the housing close to where the teachers and the need are. So 
in, in our case, this part of the county is close to an artificial political boundary, the county line, but those districts um, are, you know, in some cases closer than uh, some of the ones in Santa Clara County who were part of this project, um, meaning the Ravenswood district in South uh, San Mateo County. The long list that you see there, there is perhaps a little confusing, and I worried about this as I read the staff report, only because Ravenswood, if I recall correctly, Ms. Hernandez, is essentially entitled to first offer on all of those units. If they don't take up all of those units, there is then a hierarchy of um, opportunity, if you will, so that uh, the um, Menlo Atherton High School, which is part of the Sequoia Union High School District, uh, located in Menlo Park would also be eligible. And then you see reference as well to um, the Menlo Park Elementary School District and the Las Lamitas Elementary School District. But Ms. Hernandez, if I remember correctly, these are only if all of the units that are set aside, the 32, um, are not taken up by Ravenswood. Am I remembering that correctly? Through yes, the chair. Yes, Supervisor, and it's helpful for um, just property management to have options if there are none from the first category. I I don't uh, I don't anticipate that there's going to be a shortage of interest, but to Ms. Hernandez's comment just now, uh, the question that people ask is, well, what if? What about? Uh, what if there are some extra units? Then what's the hierarchy? I also like the fact uh, that while it made sense from a sort of a sub-regional standpoint. Um, it provided us with the opportunity to make sure that the benefits of this project also served um, uh, students of great diversity. And as you probably know, East Palo Alto and East Menlo Park are very diverse communities uh, and also have significant lower income uh, populations. So I, I saw that as being consistent with the goals and the mission uh, of the property. I apologize if that's more than you ever wanted to know on no, this. Actually, session. that, that, that answers you. my question. But what I'm curious about is what is the other project that you referenced, Consuelo? And uh, I don't, Joe, maybe you know the answer to that. The, the project was essentially a, uh, a lease for a number of years, a lease subsidy in existing housing in San Mateo County. And Ms. Hernandez may have the details. It wasn't a construction of a project, as I understand it. It wasn't a new project. It was, hi, um, we'd like to help support uh, more affordable rents in the area for uh, teachers and staff in the Ravenswood district. And uh, Facebook made the decision to, in effect, subsidize the rents in existing units for a period of years. They then uh, trying to figure out, all right, if they wanted to make a grant, could they simultaneously honor that commitment for more than a limited period of years? And the answer was yes, if they helped create some new housing, which is in part what I think drew their interest to this particular project. You uh, have no reason to recall, but when we first started, we didn't really know what the site across the street would accommodate. The initial site estimates were 60 to 120 units, which is a pretty big range. Uh, and then as uh, the uh, development team was chosen by OSH in a, a request for proposals process, um, ultimately the, our development partners, Mercy and Abode nonprofits said, ah, we think we can get 110, let's give that a try. That gave us both the opportunity to say yes to the 25 million and to say yes to adding uh, South San Mateo County as partners in the endeavor. And then, um, thank you very much. That's very helpful. I, I would say that, um, you know, from my perspective, in terms of the the um, the partnerships that we have with um, our fellow counties and the like, I, I think being able to address the needs in Ravenswood should be a high priority for both Santa Clara and uh, San Mateo counties. Um, but I am concerned about the way it's reflected in the staff report. And I think that what I would recommend is an off agenda updated um, process by which those, um, you know, the, 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 uh, the housing would be prioritized. I think that's just really important. Um, the other thing that I, I just wanna make sure that I understand is um, 
uh, Supervisors Committee, and you just raised a really, a really interesting point about, um, you know, making sure, and I, I think that's right, that our boundaries are, are in fact artificial. We use them for lots of different reasons, and we have lots of partnerships with San Mateo County and other counties. Um, the, the one thing that I would really want to better understand is, did we have a conversation with San Mateo County also? And are they, um, did we engage them in, in this partnership more formally? I mean, I mean, formally the county? Not to my knowledge, uh, but I can't speak to every conversation that either uh, Office of Supportive Housing or our development partners did. I do know at one point we talked with, uh, because I was part of the conversation with the Menlo Park Elementary School District um, who uh, was interested and I talked with folks on the city council in Menlo Park because of their interest. And I have had conversations with um, folks in South San Mateo County about our Stanford affordable housing funds because as you will remember Supervisor Chavez because you and I were uh, right there in those conversations around Stanford issues. Um, we had a number of jurisdictions who said, oh, wait a minute, you mean we've been eligible for that money, but we just have never known to ask, and now they know, and so now they're expressing interest. So those conversations are taking place, but not on this project per se. The Ravenswood connection, which <clears throat> is, is really, I think, Ravenswood, and then what happens if Ravenswood doesn't take it all up? Uh, the Ravenswood conversation was specifically a function of the $25 million grant from Facebook to the project. And no, to my knowledge, the county of San Mateo wasn't part of those conversations. Ms. Hernandez may or may not know of any other conversations that I just am not aware of. Thank you. I can chime in that uh, we check in regularly with our counterparts at the county housing department um, to specifically because we share in the distribution of tax credits at the geographic distribution. So we coordinate our applications, um, but we did not specifically talk to them about this project in the way of a partnership. Thank you. The main reason I'm asking is that um, I think supervisors committee and the experience we had with Stanford has really um, uh, opened my eyes to the opportunity to partner with San Mateo County on a lot of different initiatives, and that includes even the work we're doing with them on Caltrain and, you know, the, the and so I, I think just what I would recommend is that when we are on borders like this, that we should make it a, a protocol that we speak to the county formally. There's another reason for that, which is we don't know what land, um, the county may actually have that is along that border that we also may want to look at longer term. I, I think about that a lot as it relates to, you know, the, the counties that are contiguous to us um, on the south as well. So anyway, that, that's what prompted that question. Thank you. And I, I am going to ask again for an off agenda, just really describing the Ravenswood priority and then what the process will be uh, long term. Um, the last thing I wanted to ask staff, um, Consuelo, I wanted to get your thoughts on this, not, not to put you on the spot, and Dr. Smith may want to dive in, so Jeff, I'll just warn you. You know, one of the things that I really appreciate about the way this agreement is structured is that I really like that Facebook's resources are a grant and um, that our resources are a loan. Like, I think that's the right balance. And... Um, and I like the idea very much of, of, of a loan. And I always appreciate that when a supervisor submitted and often when he brings big projects like this, he looks at how to balance um, lots of different resources, lots of different partnerships to make sure that we're being as judicious as we can be with public dollars. The question that I wanted to ask staff to consider is this. There are, there are a few projects that we've been looking at loans as a, as a part of the, the program. And as we look at measure A winding down, which, which it is, one of the things that we're gonna need to think about is how as a county we create a, or maintain a fund that allows us to, um, to create loan opportunities long into the future. And one of the, one of the um, opportunities we had, and I'll just share this with my colleagues because when we, some of my, 
uh, particularly um, Supervisors Ellenberg and Lee, when we were having these very early, early discussions about Measure A, one question was how would we reinvest the pots of money so that even once the ballot initiative went away, we'd have some resources left for you guys in the future to be able to um, continue to invest. And one of them was through the, the first time home buyer program, like what would that program allow us to continue to support future home buyers? Um, but the other was taking a look at any resources that came from Measure A that were in the form of repayments, whether or not we could sequester those into a loan fund so that we would have some fund into the future. And as you're looking at this loan fund, um, I don't know if Consuelo, if you all have already thought about or have come to some conclusions, I know you've thought about it, come to some conclusions about what kind of resources we might be able to sequester for you all into the future. Um, and if this could be considered as part of that, or if at some future time you're coming back to the board with an assessment around um, loan funds and how we could frankly gather them for future uh, boards to invest. Okay, I'll, I'll jump in on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, the loan that uh, you're approving today uh, is actually from the general fund, so it's not related to the Measure A funding, and the reason we wanted to do that or recommend that <clears throat> is because um, we did want to preserve the remaining Measure A funding. But as to your question related to trying to reinvest Measure A funds, yes, uh, that's always at the top of our list is how can we capture more money to be able to use for affordable housing. In this situation, um, we feel that the um, revenue that will be generated by the project will be able to pay back the general fund. And if funding uh, priorities change in the future, we can always substitute out other funding sources. But for now, it's uh, recommended that we use the general fund because we can anticipate it being paid back. Right, and I appreciate that it was the general fund and not Measure A, so I just want to acknowledge that and say thank you. And what what um, what I'll give consideration to is longer term, um, how we start to um, think a little bit more about revenue revenues that are going to be flexible for our continued investment in housing. I think we all understand that not only is it good for the environment and good for families, and we want people to commute less. Uh, but I think we also understand that as a core body of work, whether it's physical health or mental health or any of those other things that people don't, you know, that if we're not addressing housing, it's very difficult to address all of these other issues. So um, with that, I, I do just want to say thank you to the staff. I'm very excited about the direction. And I, I would also just say to the schools that are listening and to other government entities, you know, when we initially, um, I brought a referral to the board to talk about, to ask for uh, partnerships with our college districts and schools in particular, but in particular community colleges, to ask um, for us to be able to partner with them on public land availability that they have also. So at some point, everybody keeps coming to the county for, for land, but we really have to look region-wide for everybody who has that, that precious commodity as, um, Supervisor Lee pointed out earlier in the discussion, and <laughs> we're going to be looking for land from others as well. But I'm enthusiastically uh, supporting this, again, with an off-agenda request that we uh, detail the um, process by which uh, Ravenswood will have access to that particular um, resource. And I will come back to my colleagues with the a strategy around the, a long-term loan fund. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Thank you. Supervisor Smitty, and your hand is raised. Thank you. I have just a couple of questions for staff, and with your indulgence, Mr. Chair, I'd like to go back uh, even to some of the EIR issues if uh, County Council is still on the line with us. They are. Okay. And, um, uh, Mr. Chairman, we sometimes uh, uh, joke uh, between the two of us that uh, we should take yes for an answer, and, of course, I want to do that today, but I am... Um, uh, I am uh, a little bit concerned about the fact that I've got some last minute comment from neighbors of the project who are um, more than a little irate. I am used to having, um, you know, folks who are unhappy on any project, but we've been at this for four years. I just want to make sure 
County Council uh, tells us that in terms of the timing, that the timing was legally sufficient in terms of how long the uh, published EIR was out. James? Lizanne Reynolds is available yeah. to speak on that issue. Um, she ha has her hand raised. As yeah, can we, the um, can ask the Lizanne, attendees. If Lizanne can be elevated to a panelist. I think she's the best person to speak on this. Super. Hi, uh, yes, the we did get uh, some late comments this morning um, complaining that the final EIR was not made available um, in sufficient time. I believe that uh, facilities and fleet posted the final EIR to the website last week and emailed all the interested parties on Thursday. Uh, so there's no legal requirement that we provide the final EIR within a certain time before final action is taken. The only requirement applies to responding to comments from public agencies within 10 days prior to final action, and that was done. Um, FAF reached out to each of the public agencies that provided comments and um, provided the responses to those comments at least 10 days before today. So we're on legally solid ground. Okay, and Ms., uh, through the chair, Ms. Reynolds, the draft EIR, which is the document that is really designed to generate comment, came out when again, just for the record? Um, late September, uh, and I believe that, yeah, yeah, I'm sure that all of the folks who are concerned that the final EIR wasn't provided in a timely fashion, they submitted extensive comments on that draft and uh, like over, over 100 comments. And all of those comments were responded to adequately in the final EIR. Yeah, and of course, there's always this question through the chair of, uh, you know, when when are we done commenting on the comments? I, I get that. I uh, I do just want to say I take quite seriously the obligation to provide not just the legally required opportunity, but the practically required uh, necessity and opportunity for comments. Um, I know it may seem uh, after the fact to some of the folks who have expressed concern, but uh, I just want to say publicly, uh, I am happy to meet with them uh, uh, after the fact here. Uh, I think we have um, try to make sure that people from the development team who are responsible for the development itself um, were available. Uh, and I believe they've done that, but if there are outstanding concerns, uh, I wanna make sure that I continue to hear from the people in this area that I, I represent. And uh, so I wanted to make the commitment uh, publicly here uh, and indicate that uh, I will take those meetings and wanna hear from them. Uh, and the last thing I will say is, uh, as we uh, march uh, on here, I hope to a unanimous vote, if I would stop talking, Mr. Chairman, is um, that I do think that it was noteworthy in the environmental assessment that noise and vibration are unavoidable impacts during the construction process. And I am sensitive to that concern on the part of project neighbors would be under any set of circumstances, but since my own North County office is across the street from the site, uh, I have been uh, acutely aware of the same inconvenience they have been uh, suffering over the last couple of years with the city of Palo Alto's parking garage project, now the city of Palo Alto's public safety project, and the project at the corner of El Camino Real and Oregon Expressway which backs up traffic uh, for uh, you know, a number of blocks. I was pleased to see the developers uh, incorporate uh, consideration of those kinds of concerns in uh, their efforts and to have them called out uh, in, the, um, uh, in the EIR. And I'll just ask Ms. Hernandez to make sure that uh, the development team and her office uh, do everything they can to mitigate to the greatest extent possible what's happening during that time. Uh, and with that, I will say thank you again for all that's gone into this uh, four years now uh, after the initial proposal, and I respectfully ask for an aye vote. Thank you. We have your motion, Supervisor Lee, I believe was the second. Uh, I'm just gonna say over the last 50 years, I've had a dozen family members be teachers, and housing for teachers is awesome. And with that, Colin, please call a roll call vote. Just for clarity, this was item number 10, correct? 
This is item number 10. We handled nine before, and the motion with all the uh, additional conversation is to approve the five items A through E. Thank you very much. Supervisor Lee. Lee, aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes, as well. Thank you. Members, we are going to adjourn in 10 minutes. We are going to come back at 1245, but I'm going to use those 10 minutes right now, jumping to item number 14, adopting a resolution to support a Bayer Regional Strategy. Supervisor Lee, is that something you can accomplish in the next uh, 10 minutes? Let's try to do it. Okay. All right. Yep. So did you did you wish to make the motion? Yes, I would like to make the motion. I have a brief comment. Thank you. Motion is made. Do we have a second? Supervisor Smithian, your hand is raised. Just to uh, ask Mr. Chairman, if before we take action on this item, if I could get you to say item 10 was uh, approved. We heard the vote, but not a declaration that it was approved. Item 10 was approved unanimously. Thank you. And I'm happy to second the motion currently before us. Thank you. And Supervisor Lee, we've got uh, one public comment. Colin, if you'll let that person in. And then sure. we will. Yep. Let's see. Next speaker is B. Beekman. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. And the timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Uh, thanks so much for this item uh, here today. Uh, sea level rise around the Bay is an important issue. I've been speaking in the past year about, you know, the ideas of a possible large earthquake happening, uh, sea level rise, and the ideas of wildfires. Those three things are just a, uh, a lot of worry for ourselves and how we can better prepare natural disaster practices, I think, can interestingly be a part of the future of, uh, you know, the ideas of reimagine and health and human services ideas, uh, you know, to address to address our, our issues of our time. I'm very sorry that I, I've spoken so much about uh, chances of a possible earthquake in 2023. I've done it, uh, you know, to, to be prepared, so to be clear, and so you guys can have kind of have a framework to make choices around. I'm going to try to not so much say these sort of things in 2022, I think. I'm gonna more focus on uh, what could be positive in 2023. I think there's a real chance we get our act together as a community and want to work on reimagine and health and human services together as a whole community process by 2023. That's the conundrum of life, you know. It, it can either be we're headed towards our doom or we're headed towards our very best. And so I learn how to balance that better in this coming year, hopefully, but to actually, you know, continue to warn and, and things like that can be important to be clear with ourselves. It is from that, thank you that you're talking about uh, sea level rise issues that are so important and, and a part of a combination of natural disaster preparedness, things we have to work on uh, that can be of a lot of help in Santa Clara County and for the Bay Area in the next few years. Thanks for your efforts on this item. Thank you. Supervisor Lee, you made a motion. It was seconded by Supervisor Smidian. Um, I'm certainly going to approve this, but you had comments you wanted to make. I, I still had a couple of speakers in the queue. Ah, we had two more add on. Okay, let's go ahead with those. Okay, the next speaker is Paul Soto. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I apologize. I, I... I'm a very, very poor man. I have the cheapest, cheapest of technologies that I could possibly have, but I still try to make do. Um, so with respect to, uh, I wanna talk about equity with respect to this uh, item, is that it was highlighted during the COVID um, era that we're still in, but initially when it hit, we saw very clearly that white people in, Good Samaritan Hospital that have connections to people will feel privileged that in a time of disaster that white affluence will feel like their lives are actually more important than others. 
Now, this is not conjecture. This is not something I'm making up. This is something that I'm just bringing to this particular meeting. That's all I'm doing. And so when we're not proactive in centering that concretely in policy, the fact that we understand that and we comprehend that, let's say the worst thing that could possibly happen happens within, with respect to this uh, item. Then what happens is we're going to see just how unimportant people's lives that aren't important now, but, you know, polite company, we can't say that. So, but we'll demonstrate it concretely and let the people know that their lives are just simply just not that important. They're expendable. They're Mexicans. They're, 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 uh, uh, what do you, what, what somebody call a uh, low income? people, they're uh, uh, very low income people, and they're extremely low income people. Think about it. It's called hate speech. And that's what that is. It's hate speech. Um, we'll do one more speaker and then that'll be it on the public speaking. Sure. The next speaker is Urvish Kumar Mehta. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you very much again to Board of Supervisors for uh, bringing uh, this very vital topic as a part of a climate action uh, uh, plan change. Also, I see that you know various counties, they are pledging for the climate action uh, plan change. Also, it is equally important that what are the grappling with the climate, cha climate change is happening in the real time? What, what is really required to be considered in the California coastal communities is a regulatory marsh and the marshes, which are which are not static, when only about 10% of the original marsh area remains in the San Francisco Bay area, then the sustainability and the resilience, that is something is required to be changed as a part of a upland area that would become more rare. Hence, it is important that those spaces, which is those spaces specifically, which is becoming a wetlands in the future will require to be preserved. And in order to preserve what's required to be done is that, that those particular spaces with the wetlands are required to be protected with the, speci with the specifically uh, specified areas that is to be developed as a part of a part of a, mark, part of a elevated peninsula adjacent wetland, which allows them more land to be available for the cities to build. We are living in a we are living in a in a we are living in a country where we see a different example. If we see the example of city of Venice, they have a they have a strategic lineup where the entire city and the canal and the water which is passing through the canal where entire city's water is being managed by the hydraulic system. So we really have to consider this uplands you know to be managed even with the hydraulic water management system as well. And Venice is the best example of that. Thank you. That concludes our request to speak. Thank you. Supervisor Lee, you had some closing comments? Yes, thank you, uh, President Lossman. Um, as some of you know, climate change is an issue that I've taken very seriously. And as a former Green Mayor of Sunnyvale, I hope to continue that work at the county level. As a board's representative to the San Francisco Bay Conservation and Development Commission, BCDC, I'm keenly aware of the challenges based on region's waterways, including the rising sea levels. To help protect the region from sea level rise, BCDC and a number of partners convened Bay ADAPT, a regional initiative to fight this issue. Bay ADAPT has produced a 45 page joint platform that has a roadmap of how Bay Area will adapt to a rising bay. The joint platform outlines nine priority actions and 21 paths for our region to engage in to do our part to mitigate the impacts of rising sea levels. The platform has been endorsed by 14 groups and organizations, including the Bay Area Council, Silicon Valley Leadership Group, the State Coastal Conservancy, and the Green Belt Alliance, with another 14 jurisdictions and groups planning to endorse. This resolution today will add Santa Clara County's voice to this important issue to take steps to combat sea level rise locally. I hope that you'll join me in supporting this resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Colin, please call the vote. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you.
Thank you. That passes unanimously. Board members, we are going to adjourn now. We are going to come back and hear item number 12 first, and then 13 with 11. And that's what we're going to do. Any other comments, questions? Nope. Okay. I will see you all at 1245. Thank you very much. Recording stopped. Colin, could I do a quick mic check again? I can hear you. Thank you. Thank you.
Hi, Colin. Welcome back. Thank you. And I believe you had stated item 12 would be the item that we came back to when we, when we uh, yes, sir. roll call. Thank you very much. Yeah. Vice President Ellenberg, as far as number 12 goes, would you prefer that it be heard after 11 and 13 COVID items? No, this is fine. Okay. Thank you. You bet. Bingo, 1245. I see one, two, three. Recording four, in progress. Good deal. Colin, would you please take roll call again just to affirm presence of a quorum? Yes, Supervisor Lee. Lee present. Supervisor Chavez. Here. Supervisor Smidian. Smidian here. Vice President Ellenberg. I'm here. And President Wasserman. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you very much. Supervisor Ellenberg, why don't you take and Supervisor Lee, why don't you take the lead on this? All right. Um, what I'd like to do is offer just a, a brief overview of the item, then turn over to any any public comment there might be uh, before offering just a few additional remarks. I am really pleased today to introduce, introduce this referral in partnership with Supervisor Lee, which would direct three actions. Uh, first, to declare mental health and substance abuse a public health crisis in Santa Clara County. Second, to identify actions the county will take to address these urgent needs with a focus on system-wide planning and engagement with partners across the community that all have a role to play in solving these long-term challenges. Three, focus specifically on workforce shortages that hinder our ability to scale up needed services for residents. Uh, in drafting this referral, actually, I was inspired by the 2020 referral from Supervisors Cortesi and Chavez to declare racism a public health crisis, and by the way that our county has worked throughout the COVID-19 pandemic to mobilize the whole county organization and the broader community to action. Uh, today's referral aims to outline challenges and possible solutions looking at the totality of our system of care across age spans, uh, levels of activity, uh, levels of acuity, types of insurance coverage, and settings of care. So I'll pause here for public comment uh, and then share some further thoughts and make a motion, which I hope will be seconded by uh, my colleague, Supervisor Lee. Colin, President Wasserman, your microphone is off. Thank you very much. So the public knows where we stand before they start speaking. Super Vice President Ellenberg, are you comfortable making a motion, Supervisor Lee seconding it? Uh, sure, I can do that now. I okay. Have approval of the referral. Great. Thank you. And Supervisor Lee, you seconded your referral. Thank you very much. And we'll now turn to the public, Colin, and let's go with the two minutes. Sure. The next speaker is Alan Kamara. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Go ahead, Alan. Hi, good afternoon, uh, Board of Supervisor. This is Alan Kamara from RMPA. Um, Happy New Year to you all. Um, I want to take this opportunity to thank Supervisor Alan Berg and Supervisor Odoli for making mental health and substance abuse a public health crisis in the county. As a nurse myself, I've had the privilege working with some of these, um, some I will call my neighbors and citizens of this county. We have what we call a revolving door. Um, when we have community members come to us for help 
in a metaphoric way, we have a way to tell them that there's nothing we can do to help you. Because we place them on a 5150 hole, we send them to a psych, acute psych facility, we discharge them back in the community, they go right back, and the next day, they sick, they get more substance, uh, whatever substance they're on, and they come right back to us, asking for help, crying for help. This has been a very silent public health crisis in this community. Thank you, Supervisor Orderly. Thank you, Supervisor Ellenberg. Um, this will help protect our citizens instead of sending them to jail, instead of letting them be homeless. Hopefully, there will be an opportunity for them to get the help they need. Um, so thank you for that. On behalf of all the community members and our nurses, we want to thank you for doing this. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Sandra Asher. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good afternoon. My name is Sandra Asher. I'm a voter in District 1 and a board member at Parents Helping Parents and Community Solutions. As a disabled person and mother of a son with autism and significant mental health challenges, I strongly support the referral by Supervisors Ellenberg and Lee. Just this past weekend, I had three separate individuals contact me requesting resources for psychiatric emergencies and crises. Our system of care is fragmented, underfunded, unaffordable, and understaffed. For those with private insurance, most psychiatrists and therapists don't accept health insurance, making care unaffordable. For those who can't afford care, it can take months on a waiting list to get an appointment with a provider. Likewise, our CBOs providing mental health and substance use disorder services have had significant staffing shortages and retention issues. Our jails have become the de facto holding places for community members struggling with their mental health and substance use disorders. It's going to take a team approach across all our systems of care to rectify this public health crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is B. Beekman. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, uh, this is Blair Beekman. Uh, thank you for this item. Uh, I've been living here for several years now, and a few years ago, it was difficult to uh, talk about this subject and make it uh, uh, open. Uh, I think I think a lot of this is is around the issues of meth use and what do we do about uh, meth use at this time? How do we address the mental health issues of meth use? And it was difficult to talk about. We are talking about it better at this time. Uh, thank you. And but at the same time, I, I it's, it's with the hope. I hope we don't go overboard in the other direction about uh, how to address meth issues and mental health issues at this time. Uh, it is a real balance, and I hope that uh, we move forward cautiously and, and just learn our good practices, that people don't necessarily have to be locked up. I don't think that's necessarily the cure. It's the, the cure is uh, conversation and treatment and uh, healing and understanding. And uh, it's, it's learning to make connections with ourselves again. We're trying to do that with these ideas. Thank you for that. Let's make sure that it's not punitive. It needs to be, people need to be allowed their space. <laughs> it's an important concept and uh, good luck how we can uh, navigate and figure that out this time. And thank you for uh, good luck to yourselves in the work we all can do as a community on this issue in the next few years. Thanks. Thank you. Next speaker is Paul Soto. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horse Group. Once again, uh, uh, Supervisor Ellenberg, uh, leading with the moral issue with respect to instituting policy. I want to thank you for that. I was at the uh, I was at the meeting yesterday with the behavioral health and all the people preparing the report that they were going to okay here. So I participated in that conversation. I participated in all of these conversations. I've spoken directly with Judge Manning. I've spoken directly with Judge Silva. Okay. The, the, the issue is this, this sadistic, cruel, mean-spirited solution 
that Scott Neese is creating this little army downtown and he wants to create a, a policy to where, oh, uh, oh, you're homeless and you're addicted, you gotta go. You gotta go, you, 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 and you. And he wants to use the police department to do it. That means he wants more proximity between the San Jose Police Department and this population. That is a recipe for disaster. People are gonna get killed as a result of that. Okay, and it's not gonna be the cops. It's gonna be the citizens, the most vulnerable citizens. Look, we have to think about this. The most vulnerable citizen that's out there on the street doing whatever he's got to do just to survive each day, maybe to shower, maybe to eat, using some dope so he can cope with what's going on around him. Okay, we're looking at that and we're saying, hmm, lock him up. <laughs> There's something mentally wrong with that. We need to question that. We need to, who's going to protect us from them? Who's going to protect us from these people? These policies are a start. But I, I must say this. It is inconsistent with what this board agreed to with respect to Laura's law. Okay, when you okayed Laura's law, that put that in motion because it was planned. They want to get these people locked up. They don't want them to recover. They don't care if they recover because they know even if they did recover, poverty is going to get them out of here because they won't be able to exist in the city. The next speaker is Elijah Deliz. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hello now, uh, Elijah Delis. I'm a member of the Youth Impact Partnership at Bill Wilson. I just uh, wanted to comment that uh, I'm somebody who has suffered from all of these things, including homelessness. I've seen Judge Manley myself. Uh, I've suffered from mental health issues in the past and the co-occurring disorder, of course, of substance abuse with that. And uh, I'm really stoked. I'm, I'm very stoked and I'm very grateful to Supervisor Ellenberg and Mr. Lee over there. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for that. You know, I, I only hope that awareness spreads enough to for people to receive the proper help, uh, especially youth, because I think that uh, it's a whole separate challenge to be able to target youth as an audience. And uh, well, growing up, I didn't have much guidance, so I didn't know better. I didn't know how to address mental health issues. I received actually a lot of gui guidance uh, from Bill Wilson themselves and Cindy Chavez herself. Um, and I'm just, I'm just grateful. Thank you. The next speaker is a caller ending in numbers 377. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. And caller, can you, and can caller, you hear us? Hi. Can you hear us? Go ahead. Can you hear me? Go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Yes. Um, I, uh, hold on. I'm, I just have to pull this up. But, okay. I am, I, first, I'm calling on behalf of NAMI Santa Clara. My name is Karen DeLumi, and I just hear point of information. If I want to speak as an individual, do I do star nine again? Because I'm speaking for NAMI right now. Go ahead and speak. Go ahead and speak. Okay. Uh, so this is the letter um, from NAMI. I am currently one of the board members. I've been asked to read this. Dear Board of Supervisors, we commend Supervisors Ellenberg and Lee for highlighting and recognizing behavioral health as a public health crisis in Santa Clara County. We thank them for a thorough, thoughtful report. We request their colleagues join them in approving this referral and having county administration produce a resolution to promote this effort. We concur with the author, authoring supervisors that a significant workforce shortage exists and must be addressed, page three of the report. Similarly, a comprehensive, not piecemeal effort is needed and, and a coherent, coherent, but also coordinated action is a must. That's on page four. We concur that input is needed from a wide range of behavioral health organizations and interested parties including Santa Clara County Office of Education, and that this proposal would be across the age span. We agree that the existing funding is used for direct services to maximize their effectiveness. We applaud having measurements, outcome, oversight, and evaluation requirements, page five, they are a must. Again, we encourage you to approve this referral and address the urgent need for comprehensive, thoughtful behavioral health services. Thank you for your support. Sincerely, NAMI Santa Clara, County Board of
The next speaker is Uday Kapoor. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Okay, you can hear me. Actually, yeah. I'm speaking for myself, even though I'm uh, also represent NAMI, but this is my personal comments. Uh, first of all, I commend Supervisors Ellenberg and Lee for taking this initiative, for adopting the resolution, declaring mental health as a public health crisis uh, by the ambitious goal of February 2022. And they will have my full support, of course, towards any and all actions being proposed. I think the reasons and context for the recommendations are well-framed and I agree with the assertions, but in my opinion, the underpinning of a robust mental health system an affordable, appropriate housing program for the spectrum of mentally ill community is not sufficiently addressed. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I believe there is excellent attention to crisis intervention and an underlying assumption that the clients can be transitioned to a lower level of care. This should work for many, but unfortunately not for all. Again and again, it has been shown that the revolving door model is extremely expensive and the optimum solution to the build supporting housing for a sustained continuum of care along with the appropriate level of care. So in the referral, there is scant mention of crisis in the RCFs and the serious loss of facilities. There is no mention of the causes like the cost of facilities and reimbursements, lack of incentives for the providers. There's also an absence of the system to track the number of beds, and the level of care provided, as we know too well. This is a serious lack, you know, in my opinion. So this is just my opinion, and I think I, there is a lot of good stuff here, and I really support it and appreciate it. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Jose M. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hello? Yeah, go ahead. Hi, thank you. This is my first time here. I am um, the founder and CEO of Compassion, of Compassion Act, which it's a mental health um, app for peer-to-peer -peer augmented reality mental health care. And I don't know what else to say other than like, I really want to work with people that are relevant to my interests here. I met the Miss, Mr. Daniel uh, Kao. Uh, last yesterday, when I was picking up my medication from the mental health care facility at Emborg, and I thought that was um, I thought that well, what I found you guys doing outside was pretty cool. Um, I've never been involved with government, and um, I think that the bottom up approach is something that people overlook. Um, I hear here that there is a lot of like, well, like what people are asking for. It seems rather like the um, not necessarily scripted, just like top down. And I think that bottom up could be more efficient or not more efficient, just um, what do you call it? Uh, supplementally efficient. Like we need to we need to look at things from from both sides and address it. This is a difficult issue. OK, um, I'd like to give the rest of my time back now. Thank you. Thank Our you. next speaker is Dick Ojakian. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, I'm Vic Ojiakian, and having heard two of my other NAMI board colleagues speak already, I won't reiterate what they said, but you probably get the understanding that our board has talked about this proposal. And as Karen said earlier, we commend Supervisor Zellenberg and Lee for bringing it forward. Um, some of the people are bringing up other suggestions. My hope is this, that when you get, that all of you will pass this unanimously, and when the staff begins to work on it, that you involve NAMI along with other groups, obviously, because we have a number of people who um, have, have ideas and input that I think would be useful. So um, again, I commend the two supervisors for bringing this forward. Um, I hope that the rest of you will support it, and then let's get to doing what we really need to do, and that is have a comprehensive mental health approach in Santa Clara County. Thank you. Thank you. And Colin, let's limit it, limit the remaining speakers to those that are registered as of now. Thank you. We have uh, two speakers. Uh, first will be Liz Lawler. 
I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for this time. I want to show you my appreciation for this referral. Um, mental health is incredibly important, especially for our adolescents. And I sincerely hope that the uh, Board of Supervisors would seriously consider expanding the adolescent psych ward capacity in our county. We only have one ward and that's in Fremont. Um, we certainly need to do that as well as more importantly, even than that is to provide support services for the parents of those teens. Because often parents have no idea what to do with their teenagers when they come home from these services. And so there are some really good outfits out there that provide that link. And that would be very, very helpful for our adolescents. One of them is called Vive, and it's based out of Boulder, Colorado. I sincerely, sincerely suggest that you take a look at that. And again, I appreciate your efforts in declaring a mental health emergency. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mary Lou Snowden. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, hello, and thank you for letting me have an opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, I, again, am a, a member of NAMI and so pleased that the um, Board of Supervisors have taken this action to help a very um, forgotten population, not forgotten anymore because they're front, left, and center. But we need to address this with real um, solutions. And I've written to the board and hope that you got my email. But I think what we need is a model of a therapeutic housing setting where clients can get services, live in a home-like setting, have an opportunity to be supported, loved, and to get the services that they need. I know your, uh, the behavioral health is extremely understaffed. Uh, that has to be addressed, and not just by hiring personnel, but hiring talented, capable, trained individuals who care about this population. So thank you again for this opportunity. And I'm really looking forward uh, to anything you can accomplish on behalf of these people. And I do think um, Vic made a point, please involve family members, clients, and those who are aware of the needs of this population. Thank you very much. That concludes the public comment period. Thank you. And thank you, Colin. Back to Vice President Ellenberg for some concluding comments. Yeah, thanks so much. After uh, three years on this board, and, and in particular in my roles on Public Safety and Justice Committee and previously on the Health and Hospital Committee, I really learned a lot about our behavioral health system and realized along the way that it is much, much more complicated than most people realize. In, in truth, I know enough uh, now to understand how incredibly complicated it is. And I've been both reassured and alarmed by comments from experienced mental health providers who've shared that no one really sees the whole picture of our behavioral health system. To say that our system is complicated is, is really an understatement of epic proportion. We're working around artificial boundaries in the system of care, including those that are based on the age of the person, the type of insurance they have, whether the need is considered moderate versus acute or severe, the funding source, uh, that the county employs to pay for the program, whether the person's in or out of custody, and more and more uh, divisions, all of which contribute to gaps in care, frustrations for family and caregivers, and ultimately untreated illness in our community. I am certain that, um, that my colleagues will all agree that the, that the current fractured system of care is unacceptable. I don't think it's controversial to say that this is an area of strong agreement as well amongst consumers, families, providers, and the public at large. Every member of this board has expressed strong support for improving our behavioral health system, including increasing allocations of funds and addition of new programs. Uh, each of my colleagues has introduced and championed new strategies and programs, all of which have benefit. I've called for the expansion of school-based behavioral health services and integration of care into pediatric settings as just two strategies for expanding access. And while I believe these are important steps, this program-by-program -program approach really isn't suited to deal with systemic issues such as workforce shortages that cut across programs, nor are they suited to deal with the reality that people are dynamic and their needs 
across a continuum of care will change many times over their lifetimes. So in order for us to make real change at the scale necessary to address the needs of people in our community, we need to step back, look at the big picture, and really have a, a frank discussion about the gaps, the policy, and the resource barriers we face, and determine what it will take to meet the demand. The, the ways in which our county mobilized during COVID convinces me that it is absolutely possible for our administration and workforce in partnership with community stakeholders to accomplish big things and lead across our state and nation on the outcomes that we achieve. We can apply these same strengths from COVID to address the mental health and substance use crisis in our community. And just um, to reiterate and lift up again, in our COVID response, the county played a leadership role, but worked in close partnership with cities, schools, and a wide network of local organizations. We mobilized the whole of county government response with activation across dozens and dozens of departments to share the load, contribute expertise, and respond quickly. We set high-level targets for what we needed to achieve, such as scaling up testing and vaccination capacity. We publicly communicated our progress, and we bought, borrowed, or built whatever it took to meet those targets. As we learned of new challenges, such as the broad need for childcare as schools closed, or the near impossibility of isolating in overcrowded housing, we iterated, responded, and stood up whatever was needed to meet the moment. And as COVID-19 is an emergency with the potential, or had been an emergency with the potential to overwhelm our healthcare system, mental illness and substance abuse as related maladies have already overwhelmed our local treatment and social support systems. When people are left on the streets, disconnected from care, or when they wind up in jail as the only place to receive services, it's clear that we have failed to put in place the facilities, the workforce, and the programs that would make up a functional and successful system. I know for sure that our county is not alone in these challenges. In fact, our behavioral health system performs better than many across the state, but clearly we can't be satisfied with the status quo. We can't fail to act by pointing out the very real barriers imposed by state policies lack of resources or parity issues. What I'm hoping for today is that we draw a line in the sand. We call on our partners across government, schools, the private sector, and community organizations to join with us and chart a path for a new response to care for the mental well-being of all of our residents. So again, I will uh, I'll say again is that I'm making a motion to approve this re referral and turn it over to Supervisor Lee for any additional comments you may have. Well, thank you. Um, so very, uh, first, I'd like to say a thank you, a special thank you and sincere gratitude to my colleague, uh, Supervisor Ellenberg, for your continued leadership to support our families. And today, I'm highlighting the urgent crisis we face in behavioral health both from the clients, but also the lack of the pipeline of training of providers. Having served as a board member for nonprofit ACP for mental health for over a decade, I've learned how critical services are for people living with mental health and substance abuse issues and how under-resourced the system is. I personally grew up in a household that dealt with mental health issues and alcoholic abuse. As a veteran, I too often saw the toll of mental health struggles left untreated especially those who served in a war zone with PTSD, with post-traumatic stress disorder, and the number of attempted suicides of our service members daily are now commonplace. This past year, I myself have experienced a tragic loss, a young cousin of mine that died from substance overdose, resulting from depression and mental health issues. And this past, just past couple of weeks during the holiday break, I was helping a colleague with drug addiction issues, relapses, and homelessness. These issues are not unique. It's everywhere around us and we are facing them every day. Sadly, COVID has only exacerbated these problems and the need for these services have never been greater and more urgent. In this third year of the pandemic, many of our friends and neighbors and many youths are in crisis on the verge. This urgency is very real. With this referral, we're putting an emphasis on two separate but related crises, 
for mental health and substance abuse in our county, as well as a shortage of mental health professionals and workers impacting the availability of care. Substance abuse, including the use of methamphetamine and fentanyl, have been a crisis in our community even before COVID and will only get worse unless we act more aggressively. Fentanyl is this drug that is far more dangerous than people realize, and oftentimes we are seeing overdose cases that result in death in as little as one or two usage. This referral isn't simply a verbal declaration. This referral calls for action and action now. It will push for more timely delivery of funds and resources, including MHSA funding and other resources for mental health and substance abuse services. Our referral strongly underscores the urgency of this moment and our need to act. It is worth noting, however, that as we move with urgency on this declaration, we recognize those on the front lines. As the pandemic wears on, so does this toll on our workforce, highlighting another crisis our community is facing, a critical shortage in the behavioral health workforce. This declaration helps set the foundation needed to increase staffing and get our workers the full resources they need to best care, care for our community. And I'd like to take a moment to recognize those partners, the housing advocates that are helping to get stable and sustainable housing for our neighbors without, and the mental health and substance use providers for all the work that they do to help our neighbors struggling with the serious mental illness. This referral is aimed to be comprehensive, and I certainly would like to also highlight some additional topics um, in this request of the administration. To also look at ways to find home-like environment, least restrictive placement, and some type of independent living opportunities and housing investment to provide more options. I'm committed to ensuring that we seek every opportunity available to help our county residents. Thank you very much. Mike, you're muted. Thank you very much, Vice President. You are on the ball. Supervisor Chavez, do you have a comment about this referral? Yes, thank you. Very briefly, first, um, thank you, uh, Supervisor Allenberg and Supervisor Lee. I think um, leaning in in the way you are is very, very thoughtful and very productive. Um, I, I have a question actually for Dr. Smith. And what I was interested in is better understanding the timeline for the study session that we're as a board going to embark on relative to um, behavioral health services, as I think it would be very informative to what the staff brings back relative to the resolution. Dr. Smith? Yes, our uh, plan for the uh, workshop had been to do it at the board meeting, um, the first board meeting in February. Um, we're currently discussing with the uh, chair's office about whether or not they want to have a separate uh, day of a special meeting to have an actual workshop. So we'll have to coordinate that with this referral. Um, they are both related to each other, but obviously uh, different parts of the same question. So. Uh, um, I take direction from the board right now about how you'd like us to proceed. I think uh, doing it all in one meeting is probably way too much. Um, we should probably do the workshop to give the history of what's gone on first and then uh, respond to this referral afterwards uh, because it's really important to understand all the problems that have been created by years of you know, bad decisions at the state level um, in order to understand how to change the current system. The transmittal before you has got a great history with lots of references. Um, so the board has plenty to work on individually, but I would suspect that it'll be better to have the two meetings separated in some time period so that it can all be discussed in detail. You know, um, I would just say this to my colleagues. I, I don't think that the board as a whole has discussed any topic more than behavioral health, whether it's drug or alcohol abuse or mental health services in all of our committees, um, perhaps with the exception of 
you know, maybe at the exception of our land use committee um, since I've been here. And I, for one, um, would really re request of my colleagues that we take the time to take us do a separate meeting to just dig really deep on this so everybody is starting with the same level setting foundation to uh, be able to um, to weigh in and give perspective. I also think that it would be helpful in terms of having community input uh, as well so that it doesn't disrupt a, a board meeting but really allows us the opportunity to dig in on this uh, on this topic. So that, that's just one board member. Um, the second um, issue that I want to raise uh, for my colleagues is that I do think that with the implementation of Cal AIM, I, I think there's a lot happening all at the same time. So both being able to level set and then look at what emerging opportunities are there are for us to be able to address those issues. And then the last issue I just want to make sure we don't decouple from the discussion is that um, in addition to my really high interest in waiting lines and what's available and not available, um, I also think that we wanna make sure that our, our folks that are providing support relative to housing are very involved in that workshop because I, I don't think these issues can be really dealing, especially with the population of human beings that we're most responsible for. So that would be my, my recommendation both to the chair and to the um, CEO. And I'm very um, happy to support this motion. I, I do want to reaffirm that I think there would be value in the resolution coming back after the board has a chance to dive in um, to this. And Supervisor Allenberg, I, I of course would be interested in your thinking on on that from a timing perspective. The other reason um, I that I, I think that's important is I do think um, the implications for Cal AIM could be very significant to the approach or not. I'm not sure, but the workshop would tell us that. Thank you, colleagues. And I'll be supporting the resolution. If may I respond, President Wasserman? Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, Supervisor yeah. Chavez, thank you uh, very much. I I absolutely agree that the, um, the workshop needs to be first. I want to echo your interest in having it be a standalone uh, meeting and conversation. Uh, this referral directs um, information to come back to us in, in a resolution in April. So the, the timing works, but you know exactly to your, your point that we'll have a meeting about this and a meeting about that and bring in these people and housing. We have to figure out how to do this um, collectively. I, I think that we need to learn about each piece where we're not entirely familiar. And absolutely, CalAIM is going to give us some great opportunities for um, reimbursement, uh, particularly for people who are in custody, to be able to get access to services um, uh, following their, uh, their release, the opportunity for, for some of that to begin while they're still in custody. There's so much here that, that this probably is going to be a series of workshops or meetings um, over the year as the experts really get their hands all around this. And, and of course, and I, I know you'll echo this too, I'm looking for measurable impact. Do we have more slots? Do we have more beds? Do we have the right kinds of facilities? Are we doing what we need to do to increase workforce? So yes to all of that. Thank you. I think we have a lot to learn. That's for sure. Supervisor Sumidian. Uh, thank you. Mr. Chairman, and I would just say, um, forgive me, I'm managing my tech here a little bit. Um, I would just say, uh, as it happens, we are scheduled to uh, take up the behavioral health audit at our March Health and Hospital Committee meeting, which I think aligns nicely, uh, Supervisor Allenberg and Lee, with your April date. So if you, uh, wouldn't mind incorporating a reference to a uh, referral to uh, that meeting. I think that would be the appropriate time. And, and if you wouldn't mind, we'll just talk about it anyway. But there, but there you go. I, I think it, I do think it fits in nicely with the schedule that you've already outlined. And that's just a happy coincidence. Very nice. Vice President Ellenberg. Sounds good. Thumbs up. All right. Now I see some hands still up. I'm hoping they were left up inadvertently. Supervisor Smidian? No? 
Supervisor Chavez, you're down. Supervisor Lee, your hand is still raised. Uh, yes, actually, I received some comment from um, the public that thought that this item won't be heard until 1 p.m. and we start at 1245. So I would, uh, for this reason, ask that we reopen the public hearing in case there's a couple of people who joined in after one and wasn't able to speak, if that's okay, uh, Pre Mr. President. Yes, let's hear for two more and then we need to move on to COVID where we have half a dozen doctors waiting for a time certain. So Colin, we have two speakers. Will you please allow them in as Supervisor Lee requested? Yes. Uh, the next speaker is Larry Klein. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Supervisor Lee, uh, for allowing me and, and, and of course, uh, Chair Wasserman. I just want to commend Supervisor Ellenberg and Lee on, on the recommendation for declaring this mental health crisis. Definitely, you know, especially under COVID, mental health has been uh, a critical issue within our communities, you know, and it's especially important for our adolescents. We had a crisis here in Sunnyvale just last week with a 13 year old that luckily things turned out well, but it just reflects the isolation that so many of our members of our communities have been feeling, especially over the last two years. And, and as uh, Supervisor Chavez said, this is this has been an ongoing issue especially beyond the time under COVID, but, but I think COVID itself has only highlighted that those issues as far as mental health. So, so I just wanna thank all the supervisors and basically seeing the, the writing on the wall as far as uh, this motion is concerned, but, uh, but I, I thank them for undertaking this and I, I look forward for continuing this discussion uh, in the next few months and, and supporting those um, services that are so critical to our community. So thank you very much for, for allowing me to speak. Our final speaker is Jose M. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. And Colin, did Jose M. already speak? Um, let me take No, I did here. speak, yes. Oh, he already did, yes. Then uh, I just had questions, that's all. Uh, go ahead, I'll, I'll yield my time if I'm- um, Thank you, you're only, reject. Jose, you're only allowed to, to speak once and you did have that. You already did that, so we need to move on from there. Um, uh, Colin, any other speakers, or is that it? We have one final speaker, Gloria Loeza. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, yes, good afternoon. Thank you so much, um, Supervisor Lee and Supervisor Watson, for letting me speak. Um, good morning, or good afternoon. My name is Gloria Loeza. I am a program coordinator for Healthier Kids Foundation. Um, and I just wanted to make apparent that Healthier Kids Foundation has been conducting emotional wellness checks among fifth graders in Santa Clara County. As of the 1,200 students we have screened this school year, over 50% have been identified to have met, uh, to have unmet emotional and mental health needs. And of those 50%, 2% have been emergent cases. So I think this is really crucial to bring up. Um, and I just really quickly wanted to discuss one of the uh, experiences that we encountered was with a mother who she we were following up with her on a wellness check that she and she already knew that her daughter needed support she shared with us that her fifth grade daughter was having suicidal thoughts and ideation and she had nowhere to turn and did not know who to talk to um, healthier kids foundation made a simple phone call about the screening results to the parent and this was the parent's starting point uh, in being able to provide support for her child if it was not for a simple screening and this phone call, who knows when this child would have received support. The truth is admitting that you need support is hard and scary. We need to make services as accessible as possible for those who are brave enough to ask for help. And for those who are struggling in the silence due to the stigma, we need to set a tone that ensures everyone knows that mental health is a huge component of health itself. Um, thank you again um, for letting me speak on behalf of Healthier Kids Foundation. And that concludes the public comment period. And President Wasserman, your microphone is off. Thank you. I try and mute it in between them hammering and sawing behind me. Supervisor Lee, your, your hand is still up. Yes, and then thank you for reminding that. And that's all I have. Thank you. Super. Colin, please call for the vote. Supervisor Lee. Absolutely, urgently, yes. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Smidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. 
Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. We now move on to items 13 and 11. Um, we're going to hear public comment for both of those together. Do we have Dr. Cody and company on? Yes, we're we're here. Dr. Cody is here. Okay, fine. Dr. Cody, would you like to make your presentation now? I'm going to hear from public speakers once for items 11 and 13 combined. Mr. Uh, Chairman, could we hear from public speakers first, if that's possible? Yes, we can do that. Colin, you'll be navigating that again. Okie dokie. And let's see how many public speakers as the number goes up and up and up. And would you like me to, to start that for two minutes? No, we're going to start that for one minute. Okie dokie. Uh, we got about a dozen people here right now. Um, the first speaker is Tina Walia. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, County Supervisors. My name is Tina Walia. I am the mayor of the city of Saratoga. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to express my personal support for Supervisor Simitian's recommendation to provide in-home COVID-19 tests to Santa Clara County residents. As noted in Supervisor Simitian's memo, availability of testing has become extremely limited as our county has observed a surge in COVID-19 cases. Providing additional free in-home tests to residents will help address demand and provide our community with the tool to slow the spread of COVID-19. The county has demonstrated exceptional leadership in the response to the pandemic, and I appreciate your continued efforts to shepherd us through this crisis. Thank you very much for your efforts. Thank you, Madam Mayor. The next speaker is Paul Soto. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, good afternoon, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Uh, Dr. Cody, your uh, your performance was exceptional in terms of making sure that everything was on lockdown. You took a lot of heat for that, you know, and you was able to withstand it. However, we are seeing the same kind of surge and the same kind of potential for death. You also uh, had stated that racism was a public health crisis as well. And we also saw that there was a racial component to COVID. So what I would like to see from your office, since you were the one that stated that racism is a public health crisis, I want to see some memos that is consistent with that statement attached to these COVID responses. Please, may I, as a, as a, as a sixth generation Sajonero from Sasipuedes, who has experienced this generational impact of racism, please, may I? Or, or are you just going to ignore that issue and just allow the Mexicans to just die at exponential rates because they're too poor to be able to protect themselves because they're going to work and expose themselves? The next speaker is Christy Connors. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Yes, hello. It's a new day, uh, same, same topic. But today I'm going to talk about El Camino Hospital and that they've recently had announced that 57% of their hospitalized COVID patients are fully vaccinated. Um, basically two thirds of their COVID patients in the hospital are fully vaccinated. This suggests that the vaccines hardly work at all since this is slightly less than the vaccination rate in this area. One patient is on a ventilator, which is consistent with the evidence that Omicron is way less contagious or more contagious, but less severe. And this suggests that all panic and lockdowns are insane. And by the way, the um, El Camino Hospital goes on to say that Santa Clara County's public health, your new order, Dr. Cody, is about to cripple the ability for them to provide patient care um, by mandating the booster for all healthcare workers by the 24th. They're already in short supply of healthcare workers, and they're going to stand to lose significantly more. I suggest that you rethink that policy immediately. Thank you. Next speaker is Liz Lawler. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you very much. This, again, this is Liz Lawler, Montesarino Council member. 
I wanted to thank Supervisor Simidian for bringing forth the referral regarding home testing, and I support Action B for three reasons. One, this puts personal health back in the hands of residents, reducing the stress and anxiety of trying to get tested. Two, it fills the gap until we can get to where we ultimately need to be regarding COVID, having testing kits readily available and on demand, which ultimately leads to better health outcomes. And finally, number three, time is of the essence. We have the kits now. Let's get them out to the public. We shouldn't wait for the federal government to come through on delivery. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Gabriel. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, uh, Gabriel Hernandez with the CICE Puede Collective. Um, a number of our organizations, um, you know, do the home kits and pass those out. We're working with the uh, Decolores uh, Guerreras um, in organizing and doing that type of outreach. So definitely supporting uh, the proposal to get home kits out as, as best we can in all the different ways. Vegolution passes them out along with the food boxes. It's almost Mayfair through the FRCs. Um, so you know, get them to us and we'll get them out um, uh, like we've been doing for the past two years. It's unfortunate it's been taking this long, but we're, we'll be right there with you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Next speaker is Larry Klein. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good afternoon. This is Larry Klein, mayor for the city of Sunnydale. I, I just want to thank Chair Wasserman and the supervisors for this opportunity to speak. Getting additional COVID testing is critical to our communities, especially right now. You know, I visited Lakewood Elementary yesterday, and they are closely managing the testing of their students and staff each day as they see high case rates, and we are seeing that throughout the state, throughout the county. Uh, yesterday, they were doling out their limited number of home testing kits to their students in preparation for the long uh, MLK weekend. Omicron has hit our county really hard, and finding uh, testing availability has not been easy for residents. So I just want to thank you for your partnership between the county and all of our cities. It's really made a difference. Thanks to the county for the pop-up locations around the county. I got my appointment last Thursday and, and here in Sunnyvale. I urge you to take this appropriate action to multiply and accelerate the distribution of at-home COVID-19 tests um, to our county residents. Thank you, Mayor. Next speaker is Linda Edwards. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good afternoon, everyone. Two years ago, you asked us to flatten the curve to save our health care system, and you did at great sacrifice and expense to all. But now the decisions that are controlling our lives are not based on science or data. The Omicron variant is so mild that it is like a head cold. And yet you want to continue as before with mandates, masking, testing everyone, and shutting down businesses to isolate staff who don't even have symptoms. At what point are we going to get back to business as normal? At what point are we going to say enough is enough? What is your exit strategy? We would all like to hear what it is because what you are doing now is not working and only prolonging the pain and suffering that your mandates and lockdowns have had on our county. It is time to treat COVID like the, uh, the endemic health situation that it is. Just like the seasonal flu, we have to learn to live with it. Please stop forcing people to choose between their jobs and forced vaccination. Stop the insanity. Thank you. The next speaker is Jeff Roberts. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hello, this is Jeff Roberts um, addressing both the county supervisors and also the uh, Sarah Cody and the county executive. You guys have committed fraud. You continue to commit fraud. You continue to harass Calvary Church. Uh, this is a planned pandemic. Uh, you, if you look at the real Anthony Fauci book by RFK Jr., uh, you'll see in chapter 12, this was planned. Uh, the ch that chapter is called Germ Games. Also want to encourage you to go to CanadianCovidCareAlliance.org and also to openvares.com, openvares.com to see how people are being injured, to see the fraud that's being committed in order to injure and kill. Do not comply with masks. Do not comply with testing. Do not comply with these injections. Thank you. 
The next speaker is Ubish Kumar Mehta. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you very much to uh, all the Board of Supervisors again for the opportunity to speak. I wanted to uh, appraise one thing at this particular point is the way uh, the COVID-19 situation has been handled by the Santa Clara County's official and as well as uh, Dr. Fauci's instruction and the District 18 uh, and the District 17 and as well as all the Board of Supervisors guidance throughout the situation and the pandemic. It is equally important that the decision that has been taken by the Santa Clara County recently in order to agree that keeping the school open and class full time in the era of, of COVID-19, though we have to be mindful of the Omicron uh, variant as well. Also, it is equally important to, uh, uh, to note that, uh, that Santa Clara County is also helping through COVID-19 relief program, MBCRG, to help the small businesses as well. So there are quite a there are initiatives you know that's being helping out the county. Next speaker is Colin Connors. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hello, good afternoon, Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors. We are embarking on a new glorious year with all of you still telling the same lies you told last year. Let's start with the vaccine mandates. If you get the jab, you'll not get COVID. That is a lie. If you get COVID, you cannot spread it. That is a lie. Now let's go to lockdowns. First, it was two weeks to flatten the curve. That is a lie. 100 days of masking. That too is a lie. Get the jab and your life goes back to normal. You can go back to your job. That too is a lie. Now, for 2022, the only difference is the people you voted for now see all your lies laid out bare in the bright light of day. Now, in 22, you are going to have to answer to your friends, neighbors, constituents, why you have been lying for the last two years. Good luck. The next speaker is Linda Bookman. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good afternoon, council members. I'm Linda Bookman, a resident and environmental health and safety coordinator for small business um, locally that uh, just in the last week has 25% of their workforce out due to COVID. Um, and it's been tough at this time to determine what to advise the employees when they're symptomatic and can't access take home tests or get timely appointments for PCR tests. Uh, I am calling in support of this recommended action from Supervisor Simidian to make COVID-19 uh, tests available to residents um, so it would make this job easier. Um, I'd also like to take the opportunity actually to thank Dr. Cody and her staff for the work that they continue to do to guide us through this pandemic. That's all. Thanks. The next speaker is David Sussman. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good afternoon. Uh, I work in a small business. I was out on the sidewalk working curbside in the heat of the summer in 2020, while Target and Costco and Walmart were wide open for indoor shopping. I was making deliveries late into the night for customers who desperately needed goods. You have to understand what a complete failure the county's vaccine policies have been for us as a small business. Our vaccinated staff has missed more days out sick <clears throat> in the last two months than we've ever faced ever with our staff in many years of business. Meanwhile, our unvaccinated staff has missed a grand total of one day. Um, again, the county's vaccine policy has been a complete failure. Last year, hardly anyone at this time was vaccinated. Hardly anyone was sick. This year, many, many people are vaccinated and many, many people are sick. Uh, this is a practical matter. You cannot run a small business. You cannot help everyday people face their ex pay their expenses when the county conti continues to push vaccines that simply do not work. The next speaker is Glenn Kohler. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. And Glenn, go ahead. I'm asking the supervisors to recognize the recent lawsuit, the Freedom of Information Act lawsuit against the FDA. 
that produce documents from Pfizer Corporation, which show that in the first 90 days, 31% of people who received the vaccine shots from Pfizer suffered serious adverse events, including disability, very serious, uh, untreatable things, and deaths. 27% of pregnant women have suffered similar results, including stillbirths and miscarriages. These vaccines are extraordinarily dangerous, far more dangerous than the disease they purport to treat. And you would think that Santa Clara Public Health Department would be well aware of this and would be modifying the recommendations in this light. One would also think that all of you here, the supervisors, would know this already. And if you don't, you better look it up and you should modify your policies in this slide as well. The next speaker is Gene Schmidt. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, my friend's high schooler was sick and missed five days of school. Each day he fell further and further behind. When asked why, his answer was so simple and obvious. Mom, I'm missing all the lessons. So instead of learning a lesson in an hour from his teacher, he instead had to spend hours and hours for multiple subjects trying to teach himself the lessons he'd miss and only then attempting to do the homework. We can stop a time, uh, not enough time to make up the homework. They have two more, 10 more hours on the weekend of new homework. The, the negative learning loss quickly compounds as well as the rising stress, dropping grades. Also a problem for teachers. They now have students coming back at different educational levels, negatively impacting the classroom pace. There is a solution that could go a long way, which some students, teachers are already doing, which is recording the lecture and giving it just to their ill kids or the ones in quarantine. It'll mitigate the learning loss and the moral hazard of ill kids coming to school. Could you please formalize this with all the teachers? Thank you so much. The next speaker is Bobby. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. And Bobby, uh, if you can accept the request to unmute, then you will be able to open the mic and speak. All right, can you hear me? Go right ahead, thank you. Hi, I'm Bobby Newkirk, emergency room nurse for the last seven years. Sending COVID, COVID positive workers to work and continuing to blame the unvaccinated people for an increase of the virus spread is wild. <laughs> like being told it's hard for someone to get fired from this county when trying to find justice after being sexually harassed and retaliated against. However, how can it be that hard if I've been placed on unpaid leave without accommodation? I just received a bill for $996 for only two weeks of insurance since my PTO ran out. I have no income. How do you all expect me to pay for a $2,000 bill for insurance in one month from a healthy individual with no surgeries and taking no medications? The US has recalled medications and medical devices for less adverse reactions. We all need to recall these vaccines, more, adv more advocacy for not only ourselves, but from the county council, it's highly warranted. To continue to keep our community safe, we need nurses and politics because it's clear that there is a misunderstanding when it comes to managing COVID. And that concludes the public comment period. Thank you very much once again. I'm not muted this time. Good. Thank you very much once again, Colin. Um, with that, I'm going to turn to Dr. Cody for um, her presentation with her peers and her uh, slideshow. Good afternoon, uh, President Wasserman and members of the board. I'm joined by Dr. Ahmad Kamal, and we'll provide the presentation uh, today. So if I could have the first slide, we will begin as we always do uh, with our local um, epidemic curve. We'll just take one moment while that's coming up, the, the back one slide. So mm -hmm. as, as as you all know, we are currently seeing a dramatic and really breathtaking explosion of cases. This is a pattern that we're seeing here in our county, as well as across the region, the state, the nation, and indeed uh, the globe. As of today, our seven day moving average uh, number of cases exceeds 4,000 new cases per day. And we know that these reported cases represent only a portion of our actual cases because now many people are using at-home antigen tests and of course those results um, aren't reportable and so not reflected in these numbers. So I think this just gives us a sense of the 
pace of things and the direction of things, um, but, but it's not exact. So the models, when might, when might we expect these cases to peak is a question uh, that we often have. And the honest answer is we, we don't quite know. Although some state models show we may peak tw sometime towards the end of this month or perhaps early next. Um, and of course, remember that hospitalization peak will follow um, the peak in cases. So um, in summary, just to keep in mind before we go any further with this presentation, we do know that we are facing some very, very difficult weeks ahead. The next slide, um, we have uh, what I think is going to be what we will be following perhaps more the cases, um, with, which is our wastewater surveillance data. Um, these data have remained stable during the course of the pandemic. And so even as our case data may become uh, less reflective of what's going on, um, these data uh, will remain reflective of what's going on. And just what I want to note here is that in all four of the sewer sheds that we uh, track, the, um, the concentrations of SARS-CoV-2 have been increasing sharply um, in the last two weeks across all four sewer sheds. And in most cases, in three of the four sewer sheds, the current concentration um, have surpassed um, levels that we saw during last winter's surge. The next slide shows um, our deaths. Since the pandemic began almost two years ago, uh, 1,951 people have died of COVID. And you can see on the right hand side of this curve where we are now, it still looks pretty flat. We have a steady somewhere between five and 10 uh, deaths recorded each week. Um, but of course, um, uh, we don't know yet about how this current surge will eventually um, translate. And recall that at the peak of last winter surge, we had almost 160 deaths in one week in early January. So I'll now turn and walk you through vaccines um, because I want to, especially in prevention, in, in combination with other prevention layers, um, we hope that vaccines will translate to fewer preventable deaths in our community. Um, and I also, just as I go along, I want to make the point that hospitalization and deaths really aren't the only outcomes um, that we should be worried about, but they are the ones that we have a lot of uh, data uh, to share with you today. I have two slides that shows uh, case rates by vaccination status. This is the first one that really gives you the macro view. And of course, you'll notice that that purple line are the case rates um, among uh, people who remain unvaccinated in our community. And then the other lines towards the bottom are with um, various stages of vaccination. And so this is take home method. Uh, Take home lesson number one, which is that yes, vaccination does reduce your chance of becoming infected. And since you're less likely to become infected, you're less likely to spread infection if you're vaccinated. I think this is a very, very, very important point that I really can't underscore enough. Um, in our community where so many people are vaccinated and boosted. Of course, most people you see with a breakthrough infection will be vaccinated and boosted. That does not mean that the vaccine is not working, far from it. I think this shows how well vaccination helps to um, reduce your chance of becoming a case. Um, so the next slide, uh, zooms in on that lower right corner from the last slide um, and gives you a more a close up look on what's going on with case rates among the different vaccinated groups. So the vaccinated and eligible for a booster but not yet boosted are the green line at the top and the boosted are that orange line on the bottom. And uh, I think what you can see here is that the case rate among the eligible but not yet boosted um, is almost twice that among the boosted. So this is, uh, of course, reflects what we know that protection from the initial series does wane over time and you need a booster to uh, increase your level of protection 
uh, back to uh, where, where it was to better protect against infection. Uh, so the next slide, um, now we'll turn and look at hospitalizations. Um, so these are the, both the uh, hospitalization rate over time, which is the blue line, uh, and with it, you can see the case rate over time, which is the orange line. And I, I think I mentioned at our last meeting when Omicron was just beginning um, to emerge, was that a chief concern was that even if Omicron in general caused a, a milder illness as compared to previous variants, just a small proportion of, uh, in, if just a small proportion of, of, of cases land in the hospital, it could translate to still a very large number and enough to overwhelm, overwhelm hospitals. And, and that still is a very significant um, concern. So this shows the relationship between cases and hospitalizations over time. And you can see as we uh, as we all have all experienced how the blue line lags the orange line. So hospitalizations lag cases. And I think the question is, what will be the relationship now between hospitalizations and cases? Um, we hope that those lines will diverge a lot, um, but it's a little bit early to, to make a call. I also just wanna make a couple comments about the world word mild and Omicron is just like a cold. Um, so I have also used this word to describe a typical illness from Omicron, but there's a couple of important points I wanna make. First of all, you know, when a doctor says mild, they might be thinking, well, you're not in the hospital and you're not on oxygen, so it's mild. Um, and that's a little different than a lay person who might think mild means I get to, you know, watch a movie in bed and, and drink my favorite hot beverage. Um, so, but the truth is that people with Omicron can feel quite miserable uh, for several days. Second is that these mild, quote, mild illnesses are taking many out of the workplace and really creating staffing crises and, and havoc across many sectors, um, which impacts everyone. And finally, and this is uh, perhaps of most concern, is that a certain proportion of those with COVID infection will go on to develop long COVID, and that is a very big deal. So hospitalization and death are not the only outcomes that should be of concern for us which is why uh, we really continue to emphasize why, why implementing um, and focusing on multiple layers of prevention however we can uh, in order to prevent infection in the first place. Um, that's, that's still quite important. The next slide um, uh, shows hospitalization rate by vaccination status. Um, among adults, uh, people greater than 18 in our county. So in addition to um, reducing the, uh, the risk of infection, you can see here that vaccination and boosting dramatically, dramatically reduce the risk of being hospitalized. So the, the most recent rates that you can see there on the far right um, show almost a 20 fold difference uh, between the rate of hospitalization among those who uh, aren't vaccinated versus who are vaccinated. So vaccines and boosters um, are very protective uh, against hospitalization. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn the presentation over to Dr. Kamal, um, who's gonna share with you updates on testing, vaccination, um, hospitalizations, uh, hospital status, and therapeutics. Thank you, Dr. Cody, and thank you, Supervisor. So our, this graph shows our testing in the county. Our average testing count has exceeded 25,000 tests per day for the first time in this pandemic and is continuing to increase. This is almost 10 times the state guideline and equates to more than 1% of the entire county population being tested each and every day. Furthermore, this is an underestimate of the actual number of tests being done because it doesn't count for the increasing number of at-home antigen tests that are being done throughout the county. And as many of you know, starting this weekend, those tests will be covered by insurance with no copay for a minimum of eight tests per month. Next slide. 
once again, the county health system continues to lead in the number of tests being done, but it's great to see that the lines for both Kaiser and Stanford shown in yellow and orange do show an upswing um, in the most recent period. Next slide. Um, as I mentioned, at-home antigen tests are increasingly being used in the community. So both our testing and just as importantly, our total case counts are underestimated. So as a reminder, if someone has COVID symptoms and a positive antigen test at home, they do not need to get the confirmatory PCR test. They should just follow the isolation guidelines and only need to see a healthcare provider if they have symptoms that require it, not just because of their positive test. Next slide. So the county is currently distributing antigen tests to several settings um, to aid in testing and to help return essential workers to their jobs if they have no symptoms. Uh, this slide lists some of the distribution that has been done and is continuing to be done through the county. In addition to this, the state of California is distributing tests directly to schools. Next slide. In terms of vaccination, uh, we have seen a bit of a drop off in demand, but are still delivering a large number of boosters shown in purple, which is even more important than ever. And as Dr. Cody said, given the Omicron variant, it's very important to get this out in the community. Next slide. The county health system continues to give the lion's share of vaccinations in our county, along with retail pharmacies. Next slide. Um, However, we are happy that we have seen an increase in testing by our healthcare partners, including Stanford, Kaiser, and Palo Alto Medical Foundation, showing um, an increase, um, and that will hopefully continue as we go forward. Next slide. And as a reminder, all persons above the age of 12 are eligible for a booster five months after completion of their initial series or two months after receiving the J&J vaccine. And we are encouraging everybody who's eligible to get a booster. Next slide. In terms of hospitalizations, we have seen an increase with 403 adult COVID hospitalizations as of yesterday. Uh, this increase has not been as great as the increase in number of cases, which could indicate decreased vir virulence. But as Dr. Cody said, we do know that hospitalizations lag behind cases and neither the case count or the hospitalizations have reached a peak yet, so we are not out of the woods yet. Furthermore, given how easily Omicron is spread, there is a risk to the health systems because even if a smaller percent of people get hospitalized, a very a, a small percent of a very large number is a large number. But even a greater system risk to the healthcare system is staffing, as Dr. Cody mentioned, with mild illnesses occurring among hospital workers. So we are keeping a close eye on that. The next slide compares the different surges. So how is the surge different? Well, this slide shows how we are in a different place than we were back in the spring of 2020. Back then, we had a highly virulent strain of the virus with no vaccine. Our PPE supply was tenuous, and there weren't any effective treatments. Now we have a fast spreading variant, but also we are much better equipped, most importantly because of uh, one of the highest vaccination rates in the country, but also better PPE availability and multiple effective treatments available for both early and late disease. Next slide. Because of those facts, our ICU bed count is staying stable. Uh, compared to last winter when we saw a sustained decline, as you can see here on the left, when we had a downward trend, we are now seeing certainly more fluctuation, but not a sustained decrease. However, we are watching this very closely because of the high number of cases and the risk of staffing shortages and the fact that our cases have yet to peak. Uh, next slide. Also very important to note is that our emergency room volume is higher than it has ever been both for COVID and non-COVID illnesses. And this once again is also impacted by uh, staffing shortages across a continuum of healthcare. And so clearly presents a strain on the healthcare system. Next slide. And finally, I wanna give a brief update on therapeutics. As I mentioned, we are now fortunate to have multiple therapies available 
for pre-exposure, post-exposure, mild to moderate disease, and for severe disease. Out of all of these, by far the most important is vaccines, which can prevent you from getting sick in the first place. But for those people who do get sick, we do have treatment for both early and late disease and are allocating it to healthcare providers across the county. And finally, I just wanted to, next slide. I just wanted to mention uh, one of the most exciting developments, which is that we now have oral medication that can be taken by people with mild COVID symptoms and prevent them from progressing to more severe disease. Our county has developed a website which any provider can access and view real-time availability of these medications for their patients and get them a supply. And once again, um, these are great developments, but the dirty the vaccines are of foremost importance to prevent you from needing any of this. And with that, I will turn it over back to Dr. Cody and take questions. We're happy to take your questions. Unmuted again. There we go. Thank you very much, Dr. Cody and Dr. Kamal. Um, I appreciate that. I appreciate the graphics, the colorful page numbers. It was very easy to discern the report. I picked out a number of different slides, but I want to talk, turn to supervisors first for any questions they may have of you before I make a couple of comments. I don't see any hands raised. Oh, there's a hand raised, Vice President Ellenberg. Yeah, it couldn't get, couldn't get there fast enough. Um, I did want to ask a couple of questions um, about so, some things that are going on in the in the community. Thank you very much, Dr. Cody, and all of the partners uh, for the report. Um, given the impact of this current wave on the operations of, of schools and congregate settings, I'd like to ask that future reports include information on outbreaks, uh, response support, and guidance from our county public health team uh, to these other other settings. Uh, and in particular today, I want to ask about cases amongst uh, staff and people in custody uh, at our jails in light of both the vaccination order for congregate settings and lower vaccination rates among people um, in custody as compared with the general population. So my first question uh, is for Dr. Cody regarding the health order issued, which mandates vaccination for employees within high risk settings. I'm, I'm aware, as I know you are, of the current staffing shortages in custody due to a number of deputies uh, being out with COVID. Uh, given that situation, is there any consideration around enforcement of the vaccine requirement, um, at least until an adequate number of staff have been cleared to return to duty? Thank you for the question, Supervisor Ellenberg. Um, you know, I I share your concern uh, about the the outbreaks in the jails and in other congregate settings, and it and in all of these settings, of course, is extraordinarily difficult um, with staff illnesses. Um, and so, the question of how do we best thread the needle to be most protective um, is is very challenging. Um, and you know, sometimes we need to try a, a number of different things. And I just want to assure you. Um, that we're working very, very closely um, with Custody Health to try to understand how to best protect um, the health uh, of the inmates. Um, with regards to the order, this is um, complex because, as you may know, um, custody is both under the county's vaccination mandate order as well as falls under the health officer order as a congregate setting. Um, so a bit more complex uh, than other congregate settings that fall under the health officer order because they're two different ones. So custody falls under both. And so what are we thinking? I, I, I hear you that we're working closely with them. So does is one of the options a delay in enforcement? Is that something that's on the table or are, we, or are you irreversibly committed to the current dates? Um, uh I think maybe I can get into this. Um, right now, we're trying to focus on releasing as many uh, inmates as possible. Uh, mm -hmm. The sheriff has uh, four different options to release re relatively immediately. Right. Um, so far, the sheriff's office has been reluctant to move ahead with some of those. We're trying to 
worked with them. We're also approaching the DA and the courts to release as many as we possibly can. Um, there are, as you know, a fair number of individuals in the jail who are low level offenders, um, who we think could be safely monitored on the outside with electric monitoring and significant probation follow-up. Um, and we're doing that because from a county perspective, um, you know, our first priority is to keep people safe. And right now we're having numbers in the jail that are not consistent with uh, safe isolation and um, having unvaccinated um, workers in the jail not only puts them at risk, but also puts the inmates at risk. So at this point, we're not thinking about changing that approach. Thanks, I, I, I appreciate hearing that response and just wanna follow up a little bit, Dr. Smith, um, along the, the same line. So on December 2nd, the board received a joint memorandum from the custody and behavioral health departments, which in response to an outbreak then, recommended that the inmate population be reduced to 2,000 ongoing. Um, at the time that that recommendation was made, the COVID case counts had peaked at 180 cases. Um, we've, sur we've surpassed that number of positive cases. And today, our inmate census is back up. It's at 2,425. Uh, two codes have been identified by the Office of the Public Defender as potential tools uh, to reduce inmate population. Uh, the first is, is Penal Code uh, 4012, which allows judges to order people um, to alternate facilities. Uh, and Government Code 8658, which authorizes the sheriff to release inmates during an emergency. Uh, it's my understanding that the Public Defender's Office has convened justice partners to work together uh, to bring down the, the custody census. And I, I think we have somebody, maybe Damon from the, a member of the public defender's office uh, to share what progress has been made to that effect. Maybe before he goes in, I could sure. comment. Yeah, please. Uh, the, um, you're right, there's those two ordinances and or statutes, I should say. And there are other, uh, two other options. One is, as I mentioned, electronic monitoring. Right. The sheriffs can do from sheriff's uh, perspective and also uh, the courts can do. And we're trying to work with all the partners to move ahead on both of those. As you mentioned, the public uh, defenders involved in the issue also. Um, we still, depending on how you, uh, perceive the population, I'll only speak, speak for myself. I think we could probably get down to 2000 if we were vigorous, but it will require all of the justice partners to be um, committed to doing that. And at this point, um, we still have some work to do in that respect. So I'll turn it over to the public defender for more input. Great, thank you. All these do we have Charlie Grigson or Damon? I think Molly is away, but. Oh, Damon? Yep. Do we have da Damon or Charlie Hammond? Damon, if you're there, and unmute. They might not be panelists. Um, but I see, why don't we go? I, I, I see that Supervisor Chavez also has, has comments. I'll just make a general plea for all of our justice partners. Dr. Smith, I really appreciate your role here, but the sheriff, the district attorney, the courts and the public defenders, we really need all of you working together to identify solutions to release individuals safely into the community. And I'll pause here and if we find Charlie okay. Hendrickson or, or Damon Silver, uh, right. perhaps we can bring them in. We should also mention uh, our census now today of infected individuals is 250. 250, wow. So that reflects the, the reality that at this point, with that many um, infected and the total census of about 2,400, um, we physically don't have the space to isolate everyone. 
testing or to monitor people who are not symptomatic so that the only people who are getting tested at this point are symptomatic individuals. So we really think that we have a safety issue that requires all the justice partners to work as vigorously as possible to release as many low level offenders as possible. And how, how much authority do we have, um, Dr. Smith, beyond pleading and, and encouraging? I realize that we, we don't direct the sheriff, we don't direct the district attorney, we don't direct the judges. How impactful and how influential can, can the county be in, in resolving this? Well, you and I really have the power of influence and that's about it. We don't have the ability to dictate anything or force anything. The sheriff does have the power to release individuals um, when, on her own authority. Uh, the courts have their power, which requires a longer process because it means that the public defender and the uh, district attorney both have to be present at mm -hmm. um, the process, which is done in bulk. So um, the best that we can do as a county is try to provide incentive to move ahead fast. Mm -hmm. and, and perhaps alternative locations if, if judges or if the court is willing to release people to some other setting as opposed to directly back in the community. Maybe that's a place where we can make sure that alternatives are available so that the court and the district attorney have have settings that they can point to and say, yes, that's all right. Yeah, we've made it clear to the courts and the, and the uh, sheriff that uh, if people need some kind of monitoring, we can certainly provide a place if they need physical monitoring like a deputy or probation officer, uh, we're happy to pay for that, but uh, um, we'll see how much receptivity we get. Is the sheriff available? Is someone from the sheriff's office on the at the meeting? Anybody from the sheriff's office? Well, we're waiting for someone from the sheriff's office to get on. Dr. Smith, when you said infected, are you talking about the Omicron variant? Yes, that's basically all we have at this point. Okay, that was my county or Omicron. Thank you. Anybody from the sheriff's office? If not, we'll move on to Supervisor Chavez. No, Supervisor Ellenberg, okay with you if we move on? Thank you very much. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Um, and I, I'm hopeful that our staff can get some of the impacted departments uh, as we go through these questions because. Um, I, I do want to follow up on a on a couple of um, articles that I've seen, um, both from San Francisco and from Los Angeles, about shortages of staffing. And so, what I wanted to ask um, Dr. Cody, if you could walk through the exemption uh, policy that that was sent to, I, I got a copy of it yesterday. I'm not sure if my colleagues have all seen this but I'm very interested in understanding how we're balancing the public health risks relative to COVID to other issues. And to use the correctional officers as an example, given the number of people who are in custody today and the possible loss of more available correctional officers, specifically given that they're under a, a, um, a mandate of forced overtime right now, how the assessment works from the public health department's perspective on the balance of um, staffing needs relative to other public safety issues. Sure, uh, I can start um, and then I may ask uh, County Council James Williams to also um, provide any uh, clarification. So I'll just start with, a, as, as you know, the uh, booster mandate is to ensure both 
safety of, of uh, vulnerable people in hospitals or congregate settings, as well as to ensure that the staff caring for them um, are less likely to get ill because they're vaccinated and boosted. So that was the, the, the purpose. During um, the Omicron surge, of course, um, we've seen a number of, um, uh, a, a lot of issues with staffing, um, with so many staff ill. And so the purpose of the waiver, it's a limited waiver process. And the purpose is if the, um, the person in charge, so in a hospital that would be the CEO, um, in other congregate settings, that would be another individual, but the person in charge can say, we have such a significant staffing crisis that um, I'm going to apply for a waiver. And the waiver is just to waive one part of the health order. And that's the part that says, the staff who have, uh, who are not vaccinated and not boosted because of a medical or religious exemption, the order requires those staff to not work in high risk settings, but they can, the CEO uh, or equivalent can apply for a waiver to say, our staffing issue is so critical that I do need those people to work. Um, and then that waiver can be approved and those people can work. So just to take a hospital example, um, hospitals are having a lot of um, challenges with staffing, um, just as all sectors are with a number of staff out being ill. Um, and, and so in order to continue their operations, uh, they may need to apply for this limited waiver. And so that's why uh, we made it available. So um, one, so just to ask this kind of broad question, and I'm thinking about um, correctional officers. Um, we heard from firefighters today, medical personnel. I, there are a couple of other areas that, that I have concerns that as we are managing COVID, that by having people, and I think we heard one caller today who um, is now on unpaid uh, leave, and how people will be um, able to be recalled if depending on the length of time that the person's been out. So Dr. Cody, and, and um, I'm asking you this since, since you're the, the author of the health order and, um, and I think it would be great if council can weigh in as well. But what I'm concerned about is how our processes are structured in a way that are in fact responsive to all public safety needs. So as an example, um, you know, Dr. Smith and I met with, and our colleagues, I'll just share this with you with our community clinics last night. And I think on average, they shared with us that they had approximately 25% of their staff out. Um, to, I think that was, I don't know, Dr. Smith, if that was yesterday or if it was in the past week, um, but it was, it was significant, right? And, um, and so what I'm wanting to better understand is how we can make the process responsive and, and, and quick so that we're able to respond to emergencies. So both the emergencies of having people out, but also recognizing that while we're focusing on the COVID-19 emergency, we're also, I know all of us are aware that we also have to be mindful of earthquakes and large car accidents and significant police actions. Like all of those are, are, are um, weight, weighted in my mind on top of what we're dealing relative to COVID-19. So my question is um, how, and was the process designed with in particular our, um, our safety network uh, partners uh, at the table. So this is a tool that they think will be effective and useful to them. So I just want to clarify a couple of things that I, that I hope will be helpful. Um, one is none of the deadlines um, in the booster order have, have arrived yet. So the order simply says by January 24th, your staff have to be um, boosted if they're already vaccinated or have started their vaccination series if they hadn't started getting vaccinated. 
Um, and then, and then it allows for uh, staff to have a medical or religious exemption. So this order covers many different entities, some of which had already been under uh, a vaccine mandate, such as healthcare, because that was a state order, and some entities that had previously not been under any vaccine mandate, and that includes medical first responders. Um, and so depending on kind of which sector you are, um, you're at a little bit of a different place in the process. Um, but as to the ability for uh, uh, a sector or the leader of a particular facility and a sector to be able to weigh these trade-offs, um, they can because there's this limited waiver process where the leader of, of the, the entity can, can recognize that if they have an acute staffing shortage that's going to adversely impact operations, they can make that trade-off and bring back staff who um, have an exemption and are not unvaccinated to work. I, I hope that I hope that makes sense. You know what, Dr. Cody? One of my concerns, um, I'll I, I've raised this for months now, is having different orders that um, from the state and from our neighbors. To me, it just adds more stress and confusion. And so I do appreciate you you. Um, reiterating what what's unique here and what is statewide and what's local but I, I do want to just take that a moment to just raise that but just to go back Dr. Cody to the point that you raised about um, the staff waivers who I appreciate the point you're raising that a chief of police or a fire department had um, can bring a, a request but ultimately who makes the decision about the uh, waiver. The waivers, um, it's designed to be a fairly simple process. Um, and it, the links to all the materials are on the website under the health order. So anyone um, who wishes may, may look. Um, the waivers are submitted uh, to me um, and reviewed um, by me or, or my designee. Um, and it, that's, it, it's quite simple. So they, they simply so need it's to not really up to them. It's up to you. And I'm not saying that I'm more being just to be clear if anybody's listening that it's it's not like a chief can say here's what here's what I think the risks and rewards are and here's how I can proceed. It, there's still a process to go through as it relates to not just filling out the paperwork, but getting permission from from you or or somebody on your staff to allow for that for them to make a decision about their staffing. That's right, but the, the um, they they need to initiate the process. So they so yeah, and so one other I, I, there's another group I want to I want to take kind of a different um, different just so I understand this just a different take on the issues relative to, to folks in custody and this relates to our correctional officers. So Dr. Cody, our correctional officers because they are county employees had already been passed the booster mandate or where are they in process perhaps I don't just to, from a where they are in terms of what what's necessary for them to perform their duties they they've already um, been functioning under the booster mandate and I say vaccine mandate um, but we still have some reticent groups uh, which are not cooperating so we're um, working on the reasonable accommodation process for them. But remember the, the uh, vaccine mandate uh, in the county uh, allowed for exemptions if you could be reasonably accommodated in a different activity or different work location. Um, this really just says that we can't accommodate people in the congregate setting. Um, so, that's a slightly different process, but we do have pretty good compliance, uh, although we're trying to get better compliance with the correctional deputies. So on that front, um, Dr. Smith, given the number of people that we have in custody, given the process that's ongoing, are who, who would this be the sheriff that, that um, requested the waiver if she needed it for her officers? Or would this be you? It would be me. 
And that's and why would that be you versus versus Sheriff Smith? Because they're county employees. So Sheriff Smith or the district attorney, no, no, everybody who, even if they're under an elect, another elected official, they would still have to, it would still be up to you to determine whether or not there was a, a risk of some sort to public safety to determine whether or not you would apply for a waiver to Dr. Cody. Right. And are you considering that now with our correctional staff? Right now, I think, <laughs> whoops. Bad. <laughs> was buddy acting bad i'm sorry right now i think the risk of having unvaccinated individuals in the jail setting is far in excess of the risk of staffing issues particularly since we are pushing to release as many inmates as possible but you know nothing's off the table everything can change at a moment's notice well, and I'm asking in part because of the just the discussions we had relative to mandatory overtime that exists at the rate that it does now. And, you know, my concern about it, you know, other other issues, both as it relates to um, stress and other issues that impact the jail. Um, yeah. So, the always, last, pardon me, Jeff. It's always a matter of weighing, you know, immediate risk versus long term risks. Um, you know, it's true that um, mandatory overtime is never desirable, but if we get a lot of people who are sick, particularly inmates, that puts us all at risk for a, in the future for a long time. So um, we're trying to make sure that we have a balanced approach. Yes, and I, I think you and I had an opportunity to hear just the kinds of intense stress levels that are going on throughout our organization. So I'm also mindful of that. And I know, Dr. Cody, that you've been very mindful of mental health for, for the entire community, and that's in part why I'm raising it. Um, colleagues, I, I'm just going to ask, make this last request. I, I have um, some other questions that I want to ask relative to um, uh, relative to the, the testing and to um, Supervisor Simidian's uh, referral, but I'll ask staff to come back to me. But Dr. Cody um, and Dr. Smith, one request I would like to make of both of you is that um, the county has um, two groups of folks that meet regularly, and that's the for the uh, the chiefs of police and the chiefs of fire. And I think it would be very valuable to have at least a Zoom conference with them. Um, and the, the representative unions, just to better understand what the staffing levels are today. What, um, and, and I think also to have a discussion, of, a very important discussion about how we're weighing and measuring uh, public safety, um, you know, public safety and, and the, the risks and trade-offs, Dr. Smith, that you just talked about. And both of those entities meet uh, regularly, they meet via Zoom. Um, and I'd like those those conferences to happen before we um, get another report on, uh, you know, another COVID report. I think this is, to me, this is one of the highest priority issues that needs to be addressed um, as we're having these discussions now. And I hope that that is a priority for both of you as well. Will do. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Smitty. Uh, thank you. I have a... <clears throat> A somewhat scattered series of questions or comments before I uh, try and drill down a little bit on the issue that I raised in my referral, Mr. Chair and colleagues, uh, which is this issue of at home testing availability. Let me just start with um, <clears throat> an observation, which is you know, we're almost two years in now, and I think it's you know, we have so much information now from so many sources that in some respects that that bounty of information presents a couple of challenges. One is it um, it can sometimes be hard to find what you're looking for uh, because you can't see uh, you can't find what you're looking for uh, given the sheer volume of information you have to wade through to get it. Um, and the other thing is that, not surprisingly, perhaps, 
I think, it, you know, it's perfectly human and natural understanding that, <laughs> excuse me, folks are going to be drawn to the data that supports their point of view. And um, I, I have to say, uh, amongst all of the data points that we have access to, I've, I've come at this from a, uh, a simple, uh, and I hope not overly simplistic way, which is, yes, we can look at case counts. Yes, we can look at positivity rates. Yes, we can look at hospitalizations. These are all obviously important metrics. I don't want to suggest otherwise. But for me, I, I keep looking at the number of lives lost uh, at the national level, at the state level, and then at our county level. And on a sort of a pro rata per capita basis, however you want to describe it. And I, I chatted very briefly with Dr. Smith about this. So let me pull both Dr. Smith and Dr. Cody in if they can be pulled in for just a minute. I. I, you know, I, I do the simple calculation on the back of the envelope and conclude that uh, the, the loss of life, the death rate in our county on a per capita basis is probably half of what it is in the state of California and 40% of what it is on a national level. Do those numbers sound right to you? Um, they they are they're definitely in the in the right direction and in fact i hope that by the next time we present to you um i will be able to show where our county is relative to other counties and other states because it's clear that our high vaccination rates um, are preventing deaths um, the bay area in general um, looks very very good as compared to other regions yeah i think uh, dr cody will have detailed information, but from my calculations, um, the county approach has saved about 2,000 lives in the geographic county so far. Well, if I could, through the chair, and, and unless Dr. Cody or Dr. Uh, Smith have uh, reason to think it would be uh, burdensome, I, I would just ask that either by our next report back to this board at a board meeting, or in an off agenda memo, whichever is earliest, uh, earlier, um, that we get uh, among whatever other information you choose to share, that the very simple comparisons, I, I understand people are gonna wanna look at the 50 plus counties and other states, but I, I'm just sort of saying, all right, compared or contrasted with the state of California, which we are a part, what does our, um, loss of life look like compared to the rest of the state. And while, you know, percentages and uh, rates per 100,000 are useful, I, I would just sort of, I would ask that we get a very clear statement if our loss of life rate were the same as the state of California for Santa Clara County, it would be this. And instead it's that, and the same on the national level. And that's not all the information we'll ever need. I understand that, but I do think it's a simple and compelling way to ask ourselves how we are doing uh, almost two years in uh, at the big picture level. I understand that for individuals who have hardships in their workplace or for folks who have either unique medical conditions or strongly held beliefs uh, or who have obtained um, or who have uh, uh, gotten the virus, I, I, everybody's going to have their own unique story, which is um, absolutely important to them. And, and, you know, we have to be mindful of those individual cases, but I'm, I'm trying to take stock in a way that is very direct and I hope easy to communicate, uh, which is where do we stand almost two years in with respect to loss of life compared to the experience in the rest of the United States and in the rest of California? Dr. Smith, Dr. Cody, does it sound like we could get something that is just that straightforward? Absolutely. Okay, I, because I, um, I think it'll be helpful. Thank you. Then the next uh, thing I wanted to do was 
uh, circle back a little bit to uh, some of the questions that Supervisor Chavez was asking, uh, many of which I had, and, and I found your answers very helpful. I, I was uh, left still a little unclear, and it may just be I need to tease these issues out a bit more. So, you know, in the fire department, for example, Dr. Smith, um, it, you know, I'm sure my office is not the only one that's heard from folks saying I'm concerned that I'm going to lose my job. And I, I also understand there have been some recent changes or amendments, and, and I'm trying to get a handle on whether uh, losing status in a department is a permanent thing or a temporary thing. Can you help clarify that set of circumstances for us, me, just a little bit more, please? I can, uh, I can, I can give a couple comments, and then uh, I think that um, County Council James Williams may have a few as well. So, for those entities um, that are under the booster mandate that have not been under any previous mandate, they have to sort of start from the beginning, which means um, uh, look across the staff, ensure that they have a process for um, religious or medical exemptions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's step one. So this order applies to medical first responders, which includes fire. It doesn't include law enforcement, so it doesn't include police. It just it includes fire because they serve as medical first responders. So they're going to have to start um, at the beginning because it's really the first time that they've been under a vaccination mandate. So that looks a little different than the other entities um, that fall under the order. I think I'll stop there and uh, invite James to offer any additional clarification. James. Sure, to, to just clarify, you know, it's up to the employer how to go through the reasonable accommodation process. The, there's an exclusion for higher risk settings, but there may be other assignments that don't involve higher risk settings where an employer can accommodate somebody. So I can think of, for example, you know, in a fire department, for instance, to the extent that the fire department has staff who are working in uh, training roles, in administrative roles, um, those would not be roles where they're serving as medical first responders. Uh, and so people with approved exemptions could be accommodated in those settings. Um, and, you know, it's, I think, a question then what the numbers look like after an agency has actually gone through the entire exemption process and then where and how they can accommodate individuals. So, um, you know, it's, it's really something that the employer has to walk through and the employer has to satisfy their obligations under the applicable federal and state laws for the reasonable accommodation process. Mr. Williams or any other member of the team, when, if and when that process <coughs> takes place, if the employer says, you know, I'm sorry, but you have to go, does that mean you're fired or does that mean you have to go until and unless circumstances change and we can talk then about whether and under what circumstances you can come back? That's up to the employer. So, you know, this comes up quite often, not necessarily in terms of large numbers, but with quite a bit of frequency um, with all sorts of other reasonable accommodation concerns, right? Individuals may um, say they have a religious um, reason why they can't wear um, uh, a gas mask, for example, and that might be required for certain industrial settings or certain kinds of respirators for certain industrial settings. And the employer may be able to accommodate them in a different role or the employer may say, we're actually unable to accommodate you and either put the person on leave or in certain circumstances terminate the employment. But that's, those are decisions for the employer to make. Uh, in other cases, individuals have, you know, work-related or non-work-related for that matter, uh, medical situation that occurs. And that happens, you know, with, when the county's workforce, you know, again, with some frequency, not necessarily in large volume, but with regular frequency, uh, and the individual may not be able to return to work and may not, after review, be able to be accommodated in any setting. So it depends on the specific circumstances of both the uh, employee and the employer. 
And I guess the follow up question uh, is yes, and or yes, but, uh, you know, the one thing we know about COVID at this point is that we don't know what it'll look like a year from now. And I guess my question is if a year from now, it, it, people who were not able to stay in our employ are, quote, gone for good, or whether if vaccination is no longer deemed essential, they're allowed to return to the organization. Dr. Smith? So, Mr. Williams. Yeah, so for the county, you know, I can speak to the county as an employer. You know, we're a large employer, obviously. And so, you know, there are potentially a significant number of roles that an individual may otherwise qualify for and opportunities to be uh, to shift into those roles. And then we're putting folks who can't or until they can uh, on leave status rather than separating them in the hopes that. Uh, they will either be able to be accommodated into a different role in the broader county organization or uh, that the situation on the ground may change um, in over some period of time such that the risk in those particular settings might change. Uh, uh, you know, that looks different for an organization of over 20,000 employees like the county than it might for certain other entities. And so those are really employer decisions based on what that particular uh, you know entity looks like you know for the county again we're a large organization so there's potentially some you know good possibilities for people to shift into different roles yeah part of our reasonable accommodation process for the county involves the possibility of transferring individuals to different jobs or different assignments um, depending on their capability and minimum qualifications. So there's almost always a place in the county for everybody. That doesn't mean they get to do exactly what they want to do, but it does mean there's almost always a place. And the decision is made based on what's best for the health of our clients, customers, and employees. Got it. Um, let me ask if we could go back on a different piece of this topic. If we could go back to the slides, to the slide that showed the testing being done at um, uh, the various healthcare uh, organizations around the uh, around the county. I think uh, this may have been in Dr. Kamal's presentation, if I remember correctly. I know it's been a little while. All right, they're bringing that up. Is there any other question? That, uh, yeah, on, well, give me, on, give me on a that minute, because it's going to take me a while to pull it back up. All right, well, then let me um, let me also raise the question. Uh, I don't know if Dr. Kamala is still with us. I think one of the final slides was antiviral uh, treatments that were available and in some cases indicated for folks who had already contracted the virus. And I I inferred from the comments that uh, Dr. Pamal wanted to, you know, sort of understate that a little bit, soft sell it. I, I don't know what the right medical term is, but sort of remind everybody that um, mm -hmm. we should uh, continue to focus on vaccination rather than after the fact uh, responses. But I do think as we have positivity rates uh, that uh, we saw and the number of cases going up that we saw, people are gonna say, all right, now what do I do? And so I'm curious to hear a little bit more about that option uh, in a minute. Shall we talk first about vaccinations by providers now that we've got that screen up? What, what's yep. your pleasure? Um, either one supervisor, I think I can address that second question and you are absolutely correct that these treatments are an important component of our of our sort of armor against COVID and uh, you know they are available to people whether or not they're vaccinated. So I would say that yes get vaccinated and yes if you have COVID with mild symptoms and are at high risk for progressing to severe disease talk to your healthcare provider about getting these medications. 
Um, they're very effective. They do require a prescription though, because of uh, several drug drug interactions. So I, I think the best advice would be that if you get mild symptoms of COVID, whether or not you're vaccinated, talk to your healthcare provider about whether this is right for you. And Dr. Kamal, when you say whether this is right, what's the proper term of art so that anybody who's listening or that we're communicating to, we can say, is it antiviral? That was the phrase that I heard you use earlier. Right, it's a, it's a COVID antiviral. And right now there's two oral medications and one intravenous medications. And the name of the oral medications are Paxlovid and Molnupiravir and the intravenous medication is Sotrivimab. Uh, but I would say an antiviral medication, whether it be oral or intravenous, um, would be something to talk to a provider about. Okay, then on this issue, thank you for that. And on this issue of vaccinations by provider, um, you know, nice to see that in some cases, uh, there's a little bit of a blip up, and in some cases, a significant blip up uh, in terms of the uh, vaccinations being provided by local uh, health care uh, providers and or pharmacies. In some cases, the uh, number actually appears to go down. Um, and, it, you know, we still see some outliers out there. Uh, in terms of uh, folks who are at the low end, and I'm looking at uh, PAMP and Stutter, which I've asked about previously. And I I'm just, I'm gonna sort of uh, preview my, my upcoming conversation with staff about at-home tests uh, through the chair. It, it seems increasingly clear we gotta do three things. We gotta ramp up our own efforts to provide PCR tests as a county. We have to look to other providers to put uh, both PCR and antigen tests out in the community. And then we have to, in my view, and I think staff's on the same page, ramp up at-home testing or do-it-yourself testing uh, as the third leg of that stool. And by definition, anytime we don't have um, as robust a response from one area as we would like to see, that puts a burden on the rest of the system. So I'm sitting here looking over at the right-hand side of the screen for um, uh, PAMP and uh, Sutter, PAMP Sutter. And you know, at one point we were told that PAMP Sutter was responsible for 16 and a half percent of the patients in the county, but delivering just two and a half percent of the uh, boosters, for example, in the county. Okay, uh, what about on testing? You know, here we are again looking, uh, excuse me, here uh, here we are again, you know, looking at both a testing challenge and a vaccination challenge, but staying on the vaccination challenge for a minute, forgive me for bouncing back and forth, I know that's confusing, but I'm, I'm still looking at a pretty low number compared or contrasted with what's happening with other providers here in our county. Um, anything we can do to push those numbers up, because if we don't push those numbers up, somebody else is gonna have to pick up the slack or somebody's gonna go without, and neither of those are good outcomes. Yes, Supervisor, thank you for that comment. I mean, this has been an ongoing struggle since the start of the pandemic, both with testing and both with and vaccination, as you are very well aware. Um, we've engaged in several conversations with uh, these systems. Um, as early as this morning, I was speaking with uh, Kaiser San Jose regarding how we are getting so many tests done using self-collection. Um, also spoke with Good Samaritan Hospital over the weekend uh, regarding their interest in using a private company to augment their testing capacity. So, you know, I think the conversations are happening. Obviously, they should have happened two years ago, and we, we should see more and more, more and more results. But from my point of view, I'm using all the uh, you know, influence I can, and I help, quite frankly, because I think that we have had um, quite a bit of experience in doing this and really sharing our experience and, 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 and encouraging health systems to um, utilize that experience to build their own capacities and serve their patients. Well, I, 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 you know, if we're in the midst of a, a crisis right here, right now, uh, around the transmissibility of Omicron, I, my question, as it was at the last meeting when we talked about this, or perhaps it was at a health and hospital committee meeting, is 
you know, is there some means by which um, outliers can actually be compelled to deliver either uh, boosters, if that's the case, or tests, if that's the case, or both? And I, um, because, it, you know, we're, we're going to, you know, as your comment suggests, uh, Dr. Kamal, we were talking about this, you know, a year and a half, two years ago. And here we are still looking at numbers like this, where we've got folks who are almost flatlined down at the bottom. And, and I, again, I want to be very clear. I know there are a lot of people out there who are really giving it their all. I, I think this is a decision made at the leadership level of some of these organizations that um, is not doing either the public the patients or the the uh, staff a, a service, frankly. So, Dr. Kamal, I, I still remember uh, when you told us, you know, uh, people could build it, buy it, or pool their testing. And, um, you know, it became my mantra for a while. And, you know, here we are again. Thoughts, uh, Dr. Smith, Dr. Cody, Dr. Kamal, somebody? What well, do we do? I think... When you talk about trying to force um, other health systems to do more testing and more vaccines, we've been trying to think about ways we could do that. Um, the challenge always is that um, their excuse is they don't have staff to do it. Um, and, you know, we can't, from our perspective, force staff to do their staff to do anything so i think um the best we can do is uh, just like with the sheriff you know it's political leverage uh personal personal communication uh with their leadership um it's not any longer a paucity of test kits or the inability to find vaccine it's really um, a staff and logistics issue. Well, there um, maybe uh, Mr. Williams or Dr. Uh, Cody can refresh my memory, but I, I seem to recall that there is a, a standing order still in place that if anyone, uh, and thank you for the head nod, Supervisor Chavez, because you, you know, it's if anyone says to their healthcare provider, look, I've been exposed. Uh, or I've got symptoms, they are entitled to a test. Am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, that's that's correct. Well, then I think anything we can do to remind people that they have a lawful right to a test under those circumstances is is good. I you know I um, uh, I've been telling folks that I've been talking to lately. If we don't ask, we don't get. And I think people have just sort of thrown up their hands in frustration and have stopped asking. But I think people have to continue to ask and they, they need to ask Dr. Smith and uh, public health uh, partners. Uh, they need to ask uh, empowered by the knowledge that they, they have a right to these tests under these circumstances. Uh, I'm not talking about surveillance tests as a matter of convenience. I'm talking about what I would characterize as diagnostics that are um, uh, provided for under the standing order for which I would say thank you again and whatever we need to do Dr. Smith to publicize that uh, I think is important. All right, Dr. Uh, Mr. Wasserman, I'm going to pivot now to uh, my referral, which was actually to say, what can we and should we be and what what are we already doing Please. to ramp up the um, number of at home tests because while they have limitations and we've discussed those and they've been in the press. Uh, at this point, since the federal government says they want to try and distribute 500 million of them, it's pretty clear they're going to be an integral part of, of the effort. Dr. Smith or Dr. Cody, what can you tell us <coughs> both about how we, um, how we are doing and what we need to do to step it up uh, yet again? Well, let me, let me try. Um, right now, there are uh, resources that is home testing resources going to the school districts actually distributed from the state to the school districts and also some going from the state to the public health department. The numbers are relatively small. We've uh, 
as a separate county county business entity approached the supplier to provide us with additional test kits. Um, however, that supplier is also the supplier that the federal government is looking at for the 500 million half a billion tests. So we're not sure how much we're gonna be able to get, but we're gonna try to maximize our um, purchase as much as we can. The, um, you know, us also with that process, we're going to develop a uh, prioritization process so that we can assure that the tests are actually going to be done uh, on the right people. And we don't wanna obviously create a black market situation where we don't have any control over the tests that we purchase and give out. But uh, we're moving ahead on it as we speak. Well, Dr. Smith, uh, thank you uh, to you and the staff for efforts to date. Um, it, you know, again, if we just do some pro rata back of the envelope uh, division, um, given the size of our county, uh, I would think that we were and quote unquote entitled just on a population basis to something like 3 million of those 500 million tests. And that's before I factor in the fact that we're um, uh, operating our county health system as an FQHC, a federally qualified health center, which would give us additional ability, I should think, under uh, the rubric of going to HRSA and saying, hey, we're an FQHC. So uh, are we literally talking about millions of tests? And if so, do we have any idea when they're going to be available? And are we already thinking about how we would move that volume of at-home tests out into a county this size, which is geographically large, large population, 15 different cities and towns, unincorporated area. So I, I take your point that it's it's quite the Herculean task from a logistics standpoint. Right, well, the first two questions you had, uh, we don't really have an answer to yet. If you look at the 500 million and if it is distributed pro rata based on population, uh, we would theoretically get about Three million. We don't know how that would be distributed, or what the implications would be. Um, and then also with regard to HRSA, we know that HRSA is going to provide some amount of testing material, but we're not sure. How, we haven't gotten confirmation from them exactly how much, when, where, and obviously it also affects our community partners. We are trying to set up a logistics approach. However, um, you know, it will be monumental if we get millions of test kits because right off the bat, um, we don't have enough warehousing for all of that. But we're working on it right now and we're gonna be ready to accept as much as we can get both through HRSA and from the federal government and from the state and also uh, purchase as much as we can get. Well, I, uh, I, I would just ask our uh, government affairs team uh, at the county to be in touch, uh, and I'm sure all of our board members can and will as well, uh, with our federal delegation, members of Congress and um, the, the House and Senate members both, uh, to, to be mindful of the allocation formula because we don't want to suddenly discover that somebody was not mindful of how the world really works here on the ground in Santa Clara County, which, you know, given all the challenges at the national level, uh, I think we've seen it happen before, and I think it's all too easy to let it happen. Um, I've had occasion to, uh, to just mention the issue to uh, Congressman Jimmy Panetta, with whom I was speaking about other issues, uh, but we have, you know, three or four other members of the delegation who we ought to be in touch with. Um, I know that I believe it was 50 plus members of the House and Senate sent a letter to the president on this topic of moving out these tests. So, Dr. Smith, and uh, if we could ask that um, a coordinated effort be uh, undertaken just to make sure we have all the 
allies and backup we can possibly get at the federal level. I think I think that's going to be helpful and important. I will just say, as one member of the board, I I am less worried about test kits quote falling into the wrong hands or creating a black market than I am about uh, trying to be so precise and and perhaps over calibrate. Uh, what goes where that we end up getting in our own way and don't move product as quickly as we possibly can. I, I would like to see those tests out in the community as fast as we can. I think um, we we know we've got folks for whom access is difficult. Uh, uh, I was just at the Day Worker Center um, yesterday morning uh, to talk about health insurance and our PCAP program, and uh, I was delighted to see that they had access to at-home test there, uh, but um, it, it, you know, for some people it'll be a cost issue, for a lot of you it's just gonna be how on earth do I get a hold of them given the shortages that we're seeing. And you know, we've got people who we're asking to you know, comport themselves in a responsible way, they wanna test, they wanna make sure that they're not um, uh, conveying the virus to others and I, I think as I say all the time, if we want people to do something, we got to make it easy for them to do it. And the way to do that is to move more of these tests out. And I think we have to look at some non-traditional distributors. So, uh, you know, we 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 think of our community health clinics because they are our indispensable allies and partners. But, you know, uh, I don't know if it's service clubs or leagues of women voters or uh, you know, PTAs above and beyond the school kids uh, that we're trying to make sure get the help they need or the testing that they need. But I, I do think we got to look at using other tools. And, and again, I'll say it, if there are some, you know, abuses along the way, we may just have to accept that as the cost of moving a lot of tests out into a large place very quickly, rather than say we have an absolutely perfect system, but it's only performing a 10% of the need. So I'll uh, let it go there. And in a minute, Mr. Chair, I'll ask for a motion to approve the referral, which in fact calls for immediate action and a report back on an expanded program by our next board meeting. Thank you. That's, so you don't wanna make that motion now? I'll make the motion now just to get it in the record and then you don't have to come back to me again. I've spoken my piece, thank you. But we'll, we'll still make sure and get it into the record. Thank you. Right. I'll be happy to second that motion. Thank you. Okay. So we've got a motion, we have a second. We can have discussion on this. Supervisor Lee, you've been at the end of this train and haven't, haven't commented yet. I'll comment after you. Would you like to say anything more at this time or we take a vote on item 13 at this time and then we finish up our discussion with the doctors on item 11? Yeah, we could talk about the uh, the items on 11 a little bit later. Uh, on on okay. this item itself, I just want to say uh, thanks, uh, uh, Supervisor Smidian for bringing up the importance of the uh, the test, uh, and I certainly am I'm very grateful uh, in many ways. One is the fact that I uh, uh, have myself experiences at home tests, uh, used it, uh, and uh, find it to be extremely useful. With something 15 minutes, I can get the test result. Uh, and and as we have seen, <clears throat> I myself was actually at the one of our county uh, testing site yesterday. Uh, the line was actually very long, but I was amazed how fast they were actually moving. And I want to personally thank our uh, doctors uh, for, for uh, shifting the resources so quickly between vaccinations and the testing. I know testing was very low for a while. And of course, now it's going way up due to the Omicron surge. Uh, and thanking them for able to make those logistical changes to accommodate so many more people that are needing the tests right now. And, and that certainly has been uh, uh, a Herculean task I see our county has been doing. And, uh, uh, but I do want to say thank you, Supervisor uh, uh, Smidian, for bringing this really important issue up to uh, uh, speed up the process of getting our test kit to our residents. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez, did you have a comment before we take this vote? Yeah, it's actually on this particular item. Go right ahead. Thank you. Um, so I also um, want to say to Supervisor Smidian, thank you. I, I think. I know our staff's been thinking about this, but I, I know um, your leadership in pushing this has been instrumental in, in how they're thinking about it. 
Um, just four things that I want to make sure that are included as the staff considers the referral and the process for coming back um, and making sure these products get out to the community. Um, one is, I am concerned that we have reduced the number of people that we have doing the door-to-door -door work. I actually think this would have been right up this door-to-door -door work alley. And so one request I would make to staff is um, if we can, in the, in the very near future, get an off-agenda report about the number of people that we still have out in the community, either in the promotora function or in the door-to-door -door, uh, organizer function. I think that would be really helpful. Um, second, I want to encourage the staff to use the, um, the community clinics as we have them uh, across the county, but also our partners who have assisted us in um, getting out the period products because that was a, a lot of work that was done to get deep into the community and I think could be another uh, tool for you. And then, um, and then lastly, I, I do think that the, um, the point that Supervisor Simidian raised about perhaps some, um, some partners who have very large uh, bases. And I think that Joe's right that, you know, we're going to make some mistakes out there, but I think that the more deliberate we can be in quantifying the location of where those um, test kits go, the better. And so, again, I, I, I do think we have some partners out there who are prepared to, to support that work. Um, the other thing I, I would really like us to take a look at is perhaps um, aligning this request with the communications plan. I think um, Supervisor Simidian raised some really good points about the, the number of tests, the types of tests, when do you take this test, when do you take that test. Uh, I think that we're going to have to do a brand new um, pause on the communication we're doing and really focus on um, the importance of testing and the, the why of it as well. I think that's, it's like I said, I think it's gotten kind of fuzzy. I know that insurance companies are now going to be held responsible for paying for these tests. And I also recognize, Dr. Smith, that um, we have been promised through FEMA that the county would be repaid for its expenditures. And my understanding is that we've received um, less than an eighth of our expenditures to date. And um, I, what that makes me really curious about is how this new responsibility of the insurance companies might be brought in to help fund the, um, the acquisition of the tests and even to give them out since it appears that we have closer relationships with the clients of many of our healthcare partners than they do with their own, uh, with their own members um, as uh, during this time period. So um, I'm very interested in understanding that uh, the role that insurance can play, the communication plan, getting people back on doors to get these distributed looking at our uh, period product partners and our health, community health care clinics in particular uh, to get these out. And I know the schools have been just incredible partners under the leadership of Dr. Juwan. So making sure that we continue to partner with the schools. I'm very excited about supporting um, this referral and those uh, issues that I just raised are, are really just, I think, part of the next phase of what we need to be doing relative to where we are in the battle against COVID and in the attempt to keep our communities very, very healthy. So with that, I'll be voting yes and just ask that the maker of the motion, if he's comfortable, include those, those continued lines of inquiry. I think he's about to respond. And I, uh, the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, I think those are all well-made and important points. Happy to incorporate them in the motion uh, with the seconder's consent. And uh, just Mr. Chairman, uh, to, to amplify some of the points that Supervisor Chavez made, I guess the other very explicit ask that I will make for our next meeting as part of the motion, if you're agreeable, is that staff explicitly come back with um, consideration of and, and options for uh, what I'll call direct distribution, whether that is by phone or by uh, uh, online registration or uh, distribution centers scattered around the, the, the county. I'm not saying unlimited, but 
you know, we've seen in other jurisdictions, as the referral mentions, places uh, as diverse as uh, Washington, D.C. and Colorado uh, and around the globe, that uh, that's the way uh, various jurisdictions have pushed product out. So I, I would ask that that be, um, uh, I would ask that that be part of the report back along with, just to be clear, the uh, issues uh, that Supervisor Chavez raised. Thank you. And I believe I can call for a vote on 13 now. At least I'm going to try. Colin? All right, Supervisor Lee. Lee, aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Smidian? Aye, and thank you, colleagues. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. And President Wasserman? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And I will say that uh, whatever number of tests will be woefully short of what's needed. People come down with symptoms. They go and they get a test. They don't go back out in public until they take another test confirming they're negative instead of positive. I went through that when I had COVID back last year. I took three tests myself at that time, confirming I had it, then I thought I was over it, I wasn't. Then I took a test and I was over it. So it's not just a one per person kind of thing, which the three million number plays out too. But uh, we'll take as many million as we can get. Supervisor Lee, you were next up in comments regarding a doctor, uh, number 11 with Drs. Cody and Kamal. Yes, thank you, um, uh, President Wasserman, on this issue. Uh, there's certainly a lot of uh, moving parts. Uh, I was just going to say Happy New Year to everybody until we saw the numbers. And the New Year is certainly not happy, given how the numbers has gone so dramatically, uh, asymptotically uh, high. And now that we are like five thousand, like four or 5,000 a day for our uh, county uh, in terms of these numbers. Um, with this fast spread of the Omicron variant uh, and the need of this additional um, testing for, for our employees, I would like to ask Dr. Smith, if it's possible, to look into the comments raised earlier by many of employees to see if there's any way we could give them additional basic time to get tested, uh, especially those who are uh, symptomatic. Uh, so is this something that you could look into and give us back uh, maybe on a future um, off the agenda report, I so appreciate it. Sure, we can look into it. Okay. Um, we talked about, well, first of all, the, the data is uh, very powerful, uh, despite some of the comments we've heard, which certainly is not according to uh, science of what we've heard, uh, are very, uh, very strong views on these issues. The vaccine certainly has proven to be uh, amazing and effective, uh, not so necessarily on the issue of prevention, but the preventing people from getting into hospital or dying. Uh, one chart that we saw today shows that the unvaccinated hospitalization rate was 37.9 of 100,000 people versus vaccinated dose uh, is 1.7. And that's like 22 more times likely to get hospitalized when you are um, not being vaccinated. Uh, based on these uh, preliminary data that we've seen. So clearly the need of vaccination is still very great. Uh, and on the same, by the same token, the need for boosters is also uh, extremely important because of the waning situation. Um, on the another chart that shows that, uh, I guess 59.6 of about close to 60% of our residents uh, who are eligible to get a boosters uh, have so far only gotten a booster. Um, has there been anything that we have been doing to uh, remind folks who are so-called having their two shots or they're called so-called fully vaccinated but not receiving booster? Have we been able to reach out to them um, to give them reminders to get that boosters? Yes, thank you for your question, Supervisor Lee. We certainly have um, tried to address this in a few different ways. One of them, of course, by mass communication and just communicating in general the importance of boosters. Um, I believe, and I don't have details, but I think that there is also um, a, a reminder system uh, for those who have been vaccinated at county sites. 
Dr. Kamal, can you confirm that I'm correct? Yes, that's correct, Dr. Cody. We actually have an electronic system that looks at booster eligibility and sends out electronic messages, uh, automated phone calls to everybody who's eligible. And this is anybody who's been uh, vac vaccinated at one of our sites uh, since they system. And that has been somewhat successful in getting people back. And I would also just say with regards to boosters, while we of course would like to see 100% of people el eligible for a booster to get a booster, um, our booster rates are about twice that of the state. So to Supervisor Simidian's point early on, when we compare how we're doing um, to other areas, we're actually doing quite well. It's uh, not, not enough, but it's um, better than most. Right. Thank you. Now, um, the other issue, of course, is the the availability of getting these booster shots. Uh, what I've learned uh, early in the week was that some of our sites that we've been using to provide vaccinations, and unfortunately, has been uh, no longer available. For example, like the Emmanuel Baptist Church uh, and some other spaces where it's getting smaller due to various needs of the original owner of the site. Um, do you think we need to actually contact some of these uh, locations to get a larger facility in order to give more, um, give, give out more vaccinations? Thank you, uh, Supervisor. So uh, our strategy is that whenever we lose or contract a site, we actually move the staff on the site to one of our other sites. So right. we're able to maintain our total overall capacity. And even though there were, there was a period around the holidays when the vaccine slots were tight. At this point, we have unused slots, so we are able to give um, as many vaccines as there is demand for, including boosters. Um, as far as uh, the fewer number of sites, we there is a, a, a VTA program to help people get transportation to a site if it's too far away from them. But so far, we've been doing okay with the number of sites and the number of boosters. But we'll keep an eye on that, obviously. And if we do need to expand, we'll look into that. Right. Yeah, I was uh, helping my daughter, who uh, recently got uh, eligible when they allowed the 12 and above to get vaccinated. And the earliest uh, vaccination time frame she was able to get online was about two weeks. So I'm hoping that we will be able to get that a little bit sooner for folks uh, who want to get vaccination. So I just want to get the word out that there's more slots opening up. Maybe we could uh, get the word out for those who schedule over later. They can uh, schedule earlier and whatnot. I think that would be great. Um, we talked about the staffing shortages. Um, given the number of high cases, it's not surprising that we have a lot of high number of sick outs. Uh, so the question is, what can we do? I know that the CDC has come out and got 10 to 5 days quarantine, right, reduction to help help on that issue, but of course also cause more questions than, than answers. Um, for example, whether we need to get people the testing uh, before they come back to work after the 5 days quarantine. So my question is, are, are we providing that, quarant that testing or are we requiring that testing before uh, the employees do come back after testing positive? Thank you, Supervisor. Uh, the state of California, the California Department of Public Health, mm -hmm. um, we are aligning with their guidance, uh, which is a bit more conservative than the CDC's because it does add a testing feature. So if you have uh, COVID and you're isolating, uh, the recommendation is that you take a test at day five, and if it's negative, then you can come out of isolation and continue to wear your mask. If it's positive, then you continue to isolate for the whole 10 days. So we are um, aligned uh, with the California Department of Public Health. Okay, great. Thank you. So we are requiring that testing because of that with the California. Rule. Yes. So that, I think that, that's great. Thank you for, for that clarification because it will certainly cause a lot of confusion from the public point of view as well. Um, and then my, la my last question is regarding the good news on the uh, antivirals, uh, oral antivirals that's now being approved. Uh, how's our inventory on those uh, oral antivirals? And I, I saw that you said uh, different uh, uh, doctors could contact this uh, website to, to obtain them. Um, do we have a pretty good uh, inventory on that or do we need more from the federal government? 
Yeah, thank you, Supervisor. So uh, we do have available inventory from our last shipment of 200 courses, and we are going to be receiving another 300 courses of Paxlovid this week. So our inventory so far is good. In fact, we're trying to do more proactive outreach, particularly to doctors who serve the vulnerable communities, mm -hmm. to get the word out that these agents are out there. Um, and we do expect the inventory to increase as the weeks go on and more of these are manufactured. Um, also, a supervisor, I did just check the county website and we have uh, vaccination slots available this afternoon. Oh, really? In Mount View, yes. So if you would like to go online, that would be <laughs> good, good to know. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, that's wonderful to know that we have uh, uh, appointments earlier. So really appreciate getting the word out there to, to everybody. Thank you. Yeah, this, this is also uh, Expo. I have up on the list, so you can see there's appointments today and tomorrow. Awesome. So, so there's appointments available. Perfect. Thank you very much for uh, the quick check-in and uh, getting the word out there. Thank you so much for the great work again. Again, appreciate it. That's all I have today. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Your hand is up. Thank you. Um, just on the antiviral, um, just to start there. Uh, Dr. Kamal, just so I understand this, the antiviral medication is really being recommended for people who are at they're, maybe they're um, in a in a home or they're they're older and more frail or they have um, underlying conditions. Is that accurate? That is correct, Supervisor. So it's for people with mild symptoms who are at risk for progression, and that includes people above the age of 60, as well as people with certain underlying medical conditions. Um, the website we have regarding these medications, which is scvmc.org slash COA, lists all the um, conditions which would uh, qualify uh, somebody for those medications. But once again, they do need a prescription for these medications, the best thing to do is to speak with their providers. Thank you, and I, I, I'm asking because we've been encouraging folks if they are testing positive, not necessarily to reach out to their physician, but to isolate. Um, and so I'm just wondering how we communicate with the public about who, who could get a prescription for the, for the antiviral medication. Exactly right. And we will be putting out more messaging around that, but it is people who are at high risk for progressing um, with those with those conditions. And it is on our website, but we'll work on making it more prominent and communicating that better. Thank you. We, we have had a, at least um, two constituents who I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not sure if they didn't fit into that category. So that would be helpful. And we'll make sure we communicate that. And, and I would just request that um, as you all are giving us, you know, doing little write-ups, I know we're all on your uh, list that we get the the updates, but one on this would be very helpful for us to push out all of us to our newsletters. I think between the board, our newsletters are pretty robust and they're, and they're countywide. So I'd love to educate people about that. Thank you. Um, the other thing I, I wanted to uh, just circle back on was the, um, as I was, requesting um, meetings with fire and police. Um, I all are, uh, yeah, because I, I, I do think we need to keep them in the loop. I know there are a lot of the public safety departments are nervous that, um, that the mandates that are coming down for fire and ambulance are gonna go over to them and it's just causing a lot of distress. So I, again, would just recommend that those meetings happen as quickly as possible. But I also wanted to ask our staff uh, Dr. Smith and Dr. Cody, if you could include include AMR and other ambulance respondents. And one of the reasons for that is that um, last week I was notified that we were really short of um, ambulances and it was slowing down response times pretty dramatically. And there were a couple of reasons for that. Some of it was illness from the ambulance driver. Some of it was um, impaction from the emergency rooms and it appears that some of it um, may be related to different departments having different levels of staffing so i would just want to make sure we include amr in those discussions thank you sure we'll we'll do that also um to attempt to allay people's fears i want to point out that um as we get closer to the deadline um our past experience with the vaccine mandate locally was that 
more people get vaccinated. And of course, that's the best solution to the staffing issue is to not have people that are unvaccinated. So we will definitely get them involved and make sure we communicate as well as we can. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good enough. Um, we've been at this extremely important matter for exactly two hours. Um, I have five or six comments and questions to make, which I'll do very quickly for Dr. Cody and Dr. Kamal. And um, I assume both doctors are there online right now. I can't see their names on my screen. Yeah, they're here. Oh, they're under, okay, Dr. Smith, thank you. First of all, We've got more than 80% of all Santa Clara County residents vaccinated. We have more than 90% of everybody from teenagers on up. And I recently said, I don't know if it's true or not, but I said it, so I kind of made it true that Santa Clara County has the highest vaccination rate of any large county in the United States. And so doctors, I wanna say kudos to you, but kudos to all the thousands of people working under you and part of this Herculean effort for having accomplished what you did. And as you've heard each supervisor say, and Dr. Smith just say, it's vaccines, vaccination rates that are saving lives. And this is our, I think, fourth variant of COVID. This one, doctors, I, I believe you'll agree, is the most contagious, but thank God, the less least dangerous out of all the four variants, especially if a person is properly vaccinated and boosted. So I wanna say yay to the vaccination rate countywide. I wanna say yay to the fact that the variant we're dealing with now, which you said represents, I don't know, 90, 95% of the cases that we're testing positive is the least deadly. From my perspective, if you're vaccinated and you're boosted and you get Omicron, odds are you're gonna be laying, laying low out of work for a week, and then you're coming back. My first question, Dr. Cody, has any county resident gotten Omicron more than once to your knowledge? Um, it's a little early to, uh, to know because our Omicron infections uh, just really got going um, starting uh, less than a month ago. So I think that's that's not known whether there's reinfection with, with Omicron. Certainly with other variants, there has been reinfection. Okay, but as of right now, we don't have any confirmed case because it's relatively new. Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, secondly, would you agree with the statement that individuals, in order to help our medical system, should only seek medical assistance if the symptoms require it? Yes, I think that's a very, very important point, um, given okay. the data that Dr. Kamal shared with the impact on emergency departments. Um, we ask that individuals only go to the emergency department when they need emergency care and not for other reasons. Thank you for confirming that. And I think that also ties in the supervised submittee's referral, because if you think you have Omicron, test yourself. And if the symptoms are problematic in any way, go seek medical assistance. Next, Dr. Cody, I just wanted to confirm with you, and I believe I'm spot on, but I just want to confirm it publicly. You are still in favor of our schools remaining open. I know it's not our decision, but you you as the PHO. I, I am, and, and that's because two years into the pandemic, uh, balance is is everything yep. and we know that kids having been out of school for as long as they have 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 suffered and there's been real harm and so i think the trade-offs are are absolutely in favor of keeping schools uh, open for in-person learning thank you very much for that um one thing i noticed last year one thing i'm noticing again this year is about eight to nine days after thanksgiving and christmas or any other religious holiday that caused families to gather indoor during the wet, during the winter cold period resulted in spikes, surges. And I see now when I compare back to a year ago, you know, we have, I don't know, three, four times the amount of cases 
But again, those cases are far less dangerous. My bottom line message from me and my question of you just for confirmation is we have a more contagious virus that is far less dangerous. Get vaccinated. Odds are your symptoms will be very minor. If your symptoms are minor, do not go to the hospital. My biggest concern right now, Dr. Cody, obviously besides people dying, but that number is, is so much smaller now, and I'm so thankful, is that we not overwhelm our healthcare system. That we not, I've already got people telling me about you know, going to emergency rooms and there's other people there with the sniffles and the sore throat that shouldn't be there. So I'm getting the message out and Supervisor Chavez mentioned our, our newsletters are very powerful and between all of us, I'm sure reach a huge number of people is that the biggest concern I have right now is overwhelming our healthcare system. So if they're not capable of timely treating people who truly need emergency care. And I'm gonna leave it with that. Members, we do not need a vote um, unless you wanna say where you asked for off agenda items as giving direction. James, do we need a vote for that? There were, no, no, there were several, let's just have a vote on all the asks that we made of staff um, for report backs or yeah, to be included the in the next report. Yes, James? It's really up to the board. Okay, well, I'll make the decision. I'll make a motion of in approval of all of those things requested of staff and direction given and look for a second. Second. Thank you. Supervisor second. Supervisor submitting a second. Any comments? None. Colin, a vote, please. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And doctors Cody and Kamal, thanks again on behalf of the board for all you've done for two years straight without a break and uh, handling this so well. Um, the county is doing its job and I can't be more proud of all the people doing it in all their respective roles. Thank you. We're now going to move on to receiving a report from county executive and then county council. And I'm going to give a heads up to all department heads as we go forward. Um, brief reports would be appreciated and more in-depth reports, if necessary, are, are certainly warranted as is further discussion. I'm not saying to shortchange anything, I'm just saying to save where we can. With that, I'm gonna turn to our County Executive, Dr. Smith. Yeah, I'll, I'll be very short to answer your question. We are the most vaccinated large county in the nation out of 3000 counties any county that's greater than uh, one and a half million, we're number one. Thank you. And our football team is in the playoffs. Thank you for that confirmation. All right, <laughs> Doc, Dr. Smith, anything else? No, I think we've said enough. Thank you. Mr. James Williams, County Council report. There were no reportable actions to report from the January 10th, 2022 closed session meeting, but I will turn it over to you, President Wasserman, for the rest of the report. Thank you, County Council. I wish to announce that at the December 13th, 2021 closed session, by unanimous vote with all members present, the board approved the appointment of Tiffany Lanier as clerk of the board. Congratulations and thank you to Tiffany and uh, all the applicants, thank you very, very much. I saw that, that's right. Good clapping, Supervisor Lee. All right. With that, that was items 15 and 16. 17 was put on, then taken off consent. I believe, I don't recall if it was Vice President Ellenberg that took off 17. Yes, please, we'll let you open up with your speaking points. Thank you so much. Um, just very briefly, I, I absolutely agree that it's critical that we act with urgency to construct this facility, and I hope that, that contributions from an independent auditor and, ex, and a successful RFP for a new firm will get us back on track uh, for construction of this facility. The ledge file noted an estimated cost of $250 an hour for a contractor 
in addition to the use of about 100 hours of Harvey Rose hours. I'm curious to know if there's a ballpark estimate of how much time we should expect the independent contractor uh, to need to devote uh, to this scope of work. So we have Cheryl, are you coming on? Yes, I'm here. I haven't hey, Cheryl. My yeah. video because I'm on. If you um, can answer that question. Good afternoon. Well, um, yes, well, we're happy to take this on. Um, I, I am hoping that um, from the meeting today that we can get additional direction from the board as to what sorts of deliverables would be um, most helpful. And from there, um, I was envisioning sending back a, an off agenda memo to just um, sort of um, put some framework around the, this project and mm -hmm. with an estimate of hours and cost, you know, so that it's right. clear. But I, at the moment, I, I don't know exactly how many deliverables and what those deliverables would really look like. So I'm um, interested in input along those lines to help me develop a, a more robust plan. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, I'll add uh, for myself a piece that I'm particularly uh, looking for as, as was referenced in item 12 today. Uh, it's clear that we have major issues in facility capacity for mental health treatment at all levels of care, including inpatient, IMD, step-down residential, and supportive housing. And I'd like to see partnership uh, from uh, VMC and um, behavioral health and FAF and any other relevant departments to accelerate progress in these areas. Thank you. Cheryl, are you still there? Your picture? Yes. I'm having a little trouble keeping my visual on, but I'm here. Okay, were you able to pick up everything Vice President Ellenberg said? Yes, thank you. Your your point is well taken, Cheryl, about the um, about the need for a framework, and I'm, I'm glad to see that that a, the majority of my colleagues have their hands raised. I assume to add pieces, but it it might be helpful for you to hear all of us today, and then send us a proposal with what you think um, captures everything, and then we have an opportunity to to go back and forth. But thank thank you for pushing us to be a little bit more specific. I appreciate it. Thank you. In order of appearance, will be Supervisor Lee, then Smitty, and then Chavez. Supervisor Lee. I, I think uh, Supervisor Allenberg basically covered what I was going to ask is uh, just okay. uh, making sure that Cheryl needs to, uh, you know, whatever you need us to, to be more specific, you know, is it about identification of bottlenecks, you know, what causes delay, uh, how to fix this for the future so that we can actually get this built ASAP. Uh, so uh, anything that you need, please let us know, and uh, we will we'll get that uh, uh, clarification for you as you, as you need. Um, and, and that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Smitty. Uh, I am happy to offer a motion, and let me try and put a little uh, meat on the bones, for lack of a better uh, uh, way to put it. Um, motion is to receive the report and, consistent with the report, to direct uh, the Rose organization to enter into a contract with their identified subcontractor on our behalf. And motion includes direction to administration and Harvey Rose to enter into an agreement for an additional 100 hours of contract time consistent with the provisions of our existing Harvey Rose contract. And uh, since Ms. Solov is asking for some additional direction, I would say uh, monthly oral reports from Harvey Rose uh, and or their subcontractor as they deem necessary and appropriate uh, to our health and hospital committee and quarterly written reports uh, indicating uh, what the timeline uh, is um, in somewhat uh, greater depth, I think. I would add to that the direction that Supervisor Lee referenced, which is um, I do think we're going to want those reports to identify uh, potential bottlenecks, uh, make su suggestions, recommendations. But a starting point is just to uh, be absolutely clear about what we think the reasonable timeline is, understanding that there are some things that are beyond our control. 
Um, and Supervisor Allenberg, the only reason I don't want to do an RFP is because I share your sense of urgency, and I don't want to delay this by, or uh, you know, another three months while we go off and put together a proposal. Uh, I, I have confidence that the administration and the Rose organization can put this together. But the reason we're here, colleagues, very simply, is uh, because we um, were given repeated assurances about a timeline, and those repeated assurances proved not to be consistent with the facts on the ground. And so I'm looking for another source of information to supplement the sources we already have. That is my long-winded motion, and I'm looking Thank for a you. short second, Mr. Chair. I have Thank a second you. from Supervisor Allenberg. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Um, just a couple of observations I would like to make. Uh, one is that I'm very interested in understanding whether or not it makes sense for us to look for a consulting partner through the Rose organization that has um, extensive experience with Oshpod. Who's coming on? Cheryl? Uh, we, we could uh, seek that out. Uh, I don't know uh, exactly. We could seek that out. I think that would be an imperative. And I also think that um, having a, par a partnership with agencies that have um, have done, you know, I mean, I, I think if it's possible, somebody in the half a billion dollar range, given the size of and complexity of this project would make a lot of sense to me too. And then the last thing I would recommend is that there is a, um, a gentleman who's working at VTA who helped us button up the VTA, uh, the the um, light, I'm sorry, the BART extension to Berryessa. And there's a, a group of um, consultants that are kind of at his level that do exactly what you're talking about. And I think there would be benefit to reaching out to VTA to look at the pool of um, consultants that they looked at to to be able to get the BART project back on course. And the reason I'm making the recommendation around Oshpod is that it did appear to me to be critical that the persons and the agencies that we brought on to support us with BART had a specific expertise, obviously, in transportation. Otherwise, I think they would have, I don't know that it, it, it may not be open even now. So those would be my recommendations to staff. Motion maker, your, what say you? Well, I think what I'd like to do is just ask uh, Ms. Soloff and administration to keep those comments in mind, but not provide them as a formal direction. And I think Supervisor Chavez's points are very well taken, but there's a distinction here that I should have made and I didn't, and I apologize. We're not looking for this subcontractor to, quote, do the work. We're looking no, for even the... oversight. No, I understand. I yeah. Oh, okay. Then, then I take back my... <laughs> lack of clarity. Um, I, I, we are just looking for, uh, quote, oversight and essentially to sort of um, proofread and comment on the homework uh, from time to time. I, I certainly do take the point that Supervisor Chavez makes that Oshpot experience would be um, helpful in, in, uh, in this instance. But I think what I would say is I, I'll pass the, I'll ask that we pass the comments along. Uh, but have a date certain by which all this gets done. What I don't want to do is spend six months, Supervisor Chavez, while we're out looking for somebody who meets the right qualifications. I, um, I have spent three years getting information that has been not accurate, not accurate about the completion date. And I understand that we have had some contractor issues. That's not the issue here. Um, so what we need is someone, and this is the reason I went with the contract with the Harvey Rose organization, because they um, report directly to our board rather than to or through the administration. Uh, what we need is somebody to say, yep, that looks realistic or nope, don't think so, uh, to help make sure that the information we're getting is um, grounded in the reality. So I, I'd like to see if I can split the difference with you on this one and say, would ask the Rose organization to be mindful of the issues you raised, uh, but uh, whatever they do to have this wrapped up by 
you know, no later than the end of February. And uh, if they can do all those things by the end of February, great. But if not, we, we need to have somebody providing that oversight uh, sooner rather than later. I could, um, I, I, I appreciate the, the, um, the, the urgency and the, you know, the, the, I, there are a number of projects I have the same um, reaction to, and frankly, this is one of them as well. This is so critical to so much of what we talk about and we've been talking about for years. I, the only thing I would just say, um, Supervisor Samidian, is that one one um, area that I I would be particularly interested in, um, just as another member of the board, is when um, we receive a timeline to better understand whether the veracity of that timeline. And I don't know how much of the issues related to the the center are, are really linked to um, other partner organizations like Oshpot. I'm actually making a a leap there a bit, um, just based on previous painful experience, um, you know, with with the hospital. Um, the other thing I'll say is that I do think that the complexities of these particular kinds of projects would lead me to want somebody who's had enough experience to be as accurate, I think, to the point you're raising with the board as possible, and uh, really being able to set expectations both for the board and the public. So. Uh, I understand the the sense of urgency, and what I would just say, Cheryl, um, to you is that I think um, you know one recommendation I would make is is in fact to to speak to um, to VTA to help with just to narrow that search down a little bit. And they they're probably not the only institution that it's worth talking to, but they're certainly one that I know is just really recently grappled with this challenge and taken the um, taken the approach that Supervisor Smitty is recommending. And by the way, Supervisor Smitty, you may recall, I, I just can't remember if, if you were on the board at this particular time, but that was a that was a sole source contract because we were looking for somebody with such very specific skill sets and expertise. So I appreciate the point you're raising that there's a way to get there and we should do it quickly. Thank you. So I've got a nod from Supervisor Simidian to what Supervisor Chavez said. Does the seconder, Vice President Ellenberg, agree? She does as well. Any further comments? Just, just to be clear, yeah. that's a that's a goal, not a requirement that would preclude us from moving forward. Supervisor Chavez? Yeah, I mean, I, you're the, I, I mean, I don't agree, but I, that's, but I hear what you're saying and I'm not disagreeing with, I'm, I'm going to support this just with the caveat Thanks. that I, I want it no, to. No, I, I, and I don't, uh, and, and just for Ms. Soloff and for the administration, uh, this is not me nodding and smiling and going along with Supervisor Chavez. This is me saying she's right but let's not let that get in the way of a timely deliverable. So, um, I, I, excuse me, let me restate that. I, I agree with her opinions. I think she's right. She doesn't need me to tell her she's right. My apologies for that. Um, I, I agree with what she uh, is suggesting and I think she's absolutely on point. I, I just don't wanna make it an absolute necessary precondition because I'm worried it would stymie our, our moving forward and I appreciate Supervisor Chavez's understanding of my concern about timeline as well. So that's an exhortation, and a, uh, but with an end of February, absolutely positively have it done date. Mr. Chairman, thank you for that clarification. Appreciate it, Supervisor. Thank you, Colin. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Samidian. Yes. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Stick around here. Item 18, receive a report related to the County of Santa Clara Safe Program Audit. Yes, so um, I'll try to keep this brief. Uh, I am joined by um, the project manager and other staff, uh, Lyndon Berry and, um, and Emily Fergins, who worked on this project. Um, we had uh, five findings and 12 recommendations. The administration has agreed with all of the recommendations. Um, and I can either provide you with a summary uh, of the report or answer questions, whatever is your pleasure. In my 11 years, that has never happened. So I'm gonna take that and, and run. 
We don't need a vote on this matter. Is there any uh, questions that need to be asked? That's that's amazing. Yes, Supervisor Chavez and Supervisor Smidian. So I, uh, first of all, I just wanted to, um, I wanted to just acknowledge and thank the staff for pushing on this and to Supervisor Simidian, um, uh, you know, for playing a leadership role also in this area. I just wanted to let my colleagues know that the um, SART process map and time study, I'm hoping we're going to see in the February, March timeframe. And second, that a deeper analysis of the survivor survey by the, the SART um, committee, and we expect this report in February or March as well. Um, and third, removing barriers to accessing safes at the joint, um, I'm sorry, at the November 5th meeting we had with the city of San Jose, we asked that the SART committee analyze the problem and report back with recommendations, which we anticipate will be coming to us in February at our Children's Family Seniors Committee. Um, I, given the amount of additional work requested of the SART committee, I wanted to make a request um, that at, that we look at adding uh, extra help positions to assist that committee, and that the re re that I would also like to request a report as part of the mid-year budget adjustment um, that we look at an analysis relative to the classification of said position because I think all of this work is not just critical but um, time, also very time sensitive given that there are so many victims, frankly, that we have to be thinking about. Thank you. Well, well put. Supervisor Simidian. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Chair. Uh, if uh, Supervisor Chavez would like to make that as a motion, I would be happy to second it. Thank you. And yes. thank you. Then I will second uh, Supervisor Chavez's motion. I will say um, thank you to the Rose Organization for tackling a challenging subject in a very uh, timely way issue a set of issues came to us last June and in response <clears throat> uh, our health and hospital committee asked that the management audit team weigh in that our women's commission uh, take a look at this set of issues uh, and that we uh, deal with it on a monthly basis through the end of this last calendar year which we did uh, I have to say I thought a lot of people did a lot of good work relatively quickly uh, I um, appreciate the a fact that uh, VMC staff uh, who were engaged in this effort were uh, absolutely on it. Uh, and I, um, uh, I also want to say uh, thank you to the survivors and the advocates who raised these issues at the outset of this uh, round of conversations because that is what prompted us to take uh, the closer look and get it uh, ever better, which is uh, our goal and our uh, obligation. So uh, thank you all around, and I'm happy to second it. And I agree with Supervisor Chavez uh, that there are these other issues uh, to be addressed. Wonderful. Thank you. Colin. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Aye. Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Sminian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. With that, we move on to item number 19, which I think is key. Yes, it is. Yes, thank you, uh, Supervisor Wasserman. Um, Oops, if I can interrupt you one minute. Oh. I've got two supervisors with their hands raised. I may have cut them off. Supervisors Chavez and Sumidian? I was just going to speak to this item. This was a referral I brought forward. Oh, certainly. Why don't you go ahead and then Key will come back to you. Um, I, Supervisor Wasserman, I'm, I'm happy to wait for Key's comments, public comment, and then back to me for action. Okay, Key, we're going to go back to you now. Sure, um, thank you. Um, the item today is to establish a Community Development Corporation grant program uh, and appropriating $750,000 in one-time funds uh, for that grant program. The administration uh, intends to return to the board uh, on April 19th. Uh, for uh, with uh, a grant agreements for the board's consideration. The purpose of this grant program is to increase the capability of community-based organizations to undertake development activities uh, that address the affordable housing needs of the communities uh, they serve. Um, during the community input sessions, uh, the need for flexibility was a common theme. 
Um, and attached, you have the uh, draft guidelines. We believe they are responsive to uh, that feedback in several ways. Specific examples include, um, first, uh, the housing activities that we would want them to undertake are pr pretty broadly defined, ranging from new construction of rental um, multifamily to the acquisition of single family homes for shared equity housing. Um, the second is uh, we've provided some opportunity for flexibility in grant um, the grant term, um, and, and that is something that uh, we'll consider. Uh, and then finally, the last example is um, we have uh, some flexibility in how the organizations would define communities. Thank you. Thank you, Key. Supervisor Chavez. Oh, you wanted to do, um, we have two public, public speakers. Colin? Sure. Next speaker is Jeremy Baruse. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have uh, one minute to speak and the timer will start when you begin speaking. Good afternoon, President Wasserman and members of the Board of Supervisors. My name is Jeremy Barus, and I am the Senior Policy and Organizing Manager with Amigos de Guadalupe Center for Justice and Empowerment, and also part of the CISE Puede Collective, who is working to address the lack of affordable housing and the displacement of our families from Santa Clara County. We have been organizing to address the housing crisis with programs like Casitas de Esperanza, Tiny Home Village, rental assistance, anti-displacement housing policies, and alternative housing models that support community-led affordable housing. We want to make sure that the county CDC grant program is flexible enough to try a number of community, community housing models, including possibly developing a community development corporation, community land trust, and creating cooperative housing or other housing models. Thank you for your creativity in using all the tools necessary to support these efforts. And we hope this grant program will help us continue to address gentrification, displacement, and the effects of the pandemic. Next speaker is Emily Ann Ramos. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Wonderful. Hi, my name is Emily Ann Ramos. I am with Silicon Valley at Home. Um, we are in support of uh, allocating this uh, money for the one-time grant. Cities and communities are looking into alternative options to develop and preserve affordable housing. And we're looking at community-focused approaches and steps like these help create infrastructure of these alternative options. So we also support steps like partnering, partnering with the Silicon Valley Council of Nonprofits to provide workshops because technical capacity building is going to be absolutely essential for this. So we also support broadening the criteria to be responsive to the community discussion which have talked about defining community through more than geographical terms. Uh, we are also uh, hopeful that different models of sustained affordability, including community land trust and community cooperatives, will have the opportunities to qualify for support. Overall, we're in support of ensuring that CDCs uh, make it through. So thank you. Next speaker is Chelsea. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, my name is Chelsea Pruitt, and I've grown up, gone to school, and now organize in San Jose as a member of Vecinos Activos, Somos Mayfair, and the Si Se Puede Collective. Over the last few years, we've been successfully organizing around strategies that can prevent displacement and imagining how we can build rooted, thriving communities in Santa Clara County. My neighbors and I have all been affected by the housing crisis. It's what prompted us to study different models like community land trusts, co-op housing, and the one I'm really excited about, community development corporations, which can have generational impact on a really large scale. Um, we appreciate the county's work in developing this grant um, and are hoping that it will be flexible enough to include some of these models um, and will center the voices of those most affected and on the margins. So I'd like to echo the other voices, asking for your support in passing item 19 for the CDC grant program. Thank you. Next speaker is Gabriel. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Can you hear me okay? Yes, go ahead. Great. Um, thank you all very much, um, especially administration. Um, when these were proposed back in August, um, I called them trains because of how slow I thought they would move, and this thing is <laughs> moving pretty quickly. So I'm, I'm very appreciative and, and impressed. Um, 
also um, in the listening sessions and, and the responsiveness of administration to, you know, Keeley uh, um, in, in, you know, addressing some of those things, we do want to make sure that it, it isn't just place-based, but uh, we also want to make sure that there's special caveats for, uh, for example, the African-American community and other communities that might need, you know, special circumstances because of the, you know, being spread out all over the county versus, you know, in, in certain neighborhoods and stuff. And so um, we appreciate you all for the the, um, the movement on this. And, um, you know, we look forward to uh, working with you to continue to address uh, housing and uh, displacement. Next speaker is Matt Gustafson. I am muting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Matt Gustafson. I am a community organizer with Vecinos Activos at Somos Mayfair. Um, I'm also, uh, I was born and raised in Santa Clara County, so I've lived here my whole life. Um, over the last several years, our community in East San Jose has been successfully organizing around strategies that can prevent the displacement of our people. Um, and also been imagining how we can develop community wealth and stable, dignified housing for all of our neighbors. As many of you know, East San Jose has historically been a place of marginalization, but also has a powerful legacy of community resiliency and self-determination. And so in recent years, we've done a lot of community education about community development, housing stability, and how the community can really have a voice in providing their families with affordable uh, long-term affordable housing. And so we've investigated a lot of community-based housing models. Well, what we've come to realize is that there just isn't really a strong history of support system here in our community for neighborhood scale, community development like rehab projects and preservation projects and so um, we just ask that you please support our efforts to create community wealth and stable housing in next speaker is jackie rivera i'm unmuting you please accept the unmute you'll have one minute to speak the timer will start when you begin speaking hi my name is jackie rivera i'm a founding member and currently a contract worker with the south bay community land trust the first community land trust here in the south bay that was formed back in 2019 to combat displacement and create collective, collectively owned permanent affordable housing. We are so excited um, to continue to be a part of these discussions and especially for this item in particular for the opportunity um, of capacity building and technical assistance funds that are very much needed for emerging, emerging um, development corporations and community um, based organizations like ours uh, to continue this work. Um, we are at least for the CLT, currently trying to staff up. And so we are very excited to be able to apply to such funds um, and continue to work alongside organizations that are, you know, centering not only community, but community ownership, democratic governance, and centering of low income and racial equity um, lens to all of this. So thank you again. The next speaker is Loretto. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. And Loretto, are you there? Hello, uh, good afternoon to all. Thank you very much for this CDC grant proposal for more affordable housing, especially for very low income, uh, low income and middle income people, especially those that will benefit people of color communities who has been marginalized and hadn't had the opportunities given to others. So I strongly um, encourage the Board of Supervisors to approve this measure or proposal. Thank you so much. And that concludes the public comment. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez and then Supervisor Lee. Thank you. Um, I would like to move approval of the staff's recommendation, but with um, a couple of uh, requests. And one is that um, the that we continue to keep our eye focused on um, organizational strategies, or I'm sorry, investment strategies can address that can address displacement. And that we do have a balance between that. My original request was that this be more place-based, but that we are mindful of both being place-based and balancing high need communities, which I think the staff um, is already interested in doing. And that we have a discussion during mid-year and the June budget timeframe so that we're able to set aside resources for the eventual development of at least three, whether they're CDCs or land trusts that um, we wanna be able to invest in. And I recognize that for staff that will have a range and you know some of that will depend on the model, but I wanna make sure we're at least putting that resource aside. And that would be my motion. Thank you. Supervisor Lee. 
I'll second it. Thank you. And Sir, I actually have a, a, a short comment, if I may. Yep. Yeah, I, I certainly uh, am very strong supporter of this type of a program uh, for doing community economic development. Uh, these grants uh, today will assist nonprofit organizations to form CDCs to build more affordable housing. Uh, and this is actually a fairly small allocation and they're a good start. Uh, my uh, couple of questions I have is with uh, uh, administration is, will the uh, county executive office or OSH be responsible for monitoring the contract? And, uh, and when will the application start? And when may we be expecting these grants to be awarded? Mr. Lee. Um, Thank you for the question, Supervisor Lee. We plan to issue the request for grant applications on the 18th. Mm -hmm. uh, we anticipate coming back to the Board of Supervisors on April 19th um, and uh, with the grant uh, agreement. Uh, initially, the County Exec's Office will get the grant program running, but eventually the Office of Supportive Housing will oversee uh, the contracts. Okay, very good. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. So we have a motion and a second. No other discussion. We heard from the public. Colin, oh, I'm sorry, Supervisor Chavez, your hand is up. Sorry about that. Thank you. No worries. Colin, a vote, please. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Sumidian. Yes. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Keith, thank you for staying on as we move on to item number 20. Thank Go you, ahead. President uh, Wasserman. Uh, this is a brief report on the activities um, or, or the efforts that we made to assist the School of Arts and Culture in, uh, as a member of the CISA Poeta Collective uh, in sort of uh, advancing its sort of development goals, uh, the primary of which is the Community Development Corporation of which the board just approved. Uh, with that, I'll, I'm here to answer any questions. Thank you. Let's go to our uh, speakers first, Colin. Sure. Next speaker is Sparky Harlan. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, Sparky Harlan, CEO of Bill Wilson Center. And I keep jumping on this item again because I happen to here when this first came out last summer and I spoke in favor of it because of Bill Wilson Center's experience of being sort of taken advantage, I feel, in a nice way, but with affordable housing developers, which I really didn't know that much about. And I really feel like this is an urgent issue and I would stress that you fund this entity now and not wait for the elongated CWG process and putting it out to bid because a lot of things change when issues like this go out to bid. And I think it's very clear that this entity is ready to move now on this. So I would urge you to go ahead with this uh, request and not wait for this uh, development of the CDCs for um, bidding later on. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Jeremy Bruce. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good afternoon, Jeremy. members of the Board of Supervisors. This is Jeremy Barus once again from Amigos de Guadalupe Center for Justice and Empowerment, and also part of the CICE Puede Collective. I am speaking in support of the county allocating $250,000 so that the School of Arts and Culture can continue its efforts to acquire property along the Alum Rock Avenue and King Road corridors for community economic and housing development and program expansion. By taking action with this allocation, the county is taking yet another major step in empowering the residents and businesses of East San Jose, especially during this pandemic. It is another creative tool in addressing displacement in our housing crisis and will help families access basic needs to continue to thrive in our county. It will impact our community for years to come. So in closing, I ask that the board take another big step in standing up for families in our county by approving the allocation today. Thank you. Thank Next you. speaker is Alex Shore. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good afternoon, County Board of Soups. This is Alex Shore here on behalf of Catalyze SV today. It is always great when elected officials and government staff can allow 
community members and community groups and communities themselves to lift themselves up and to have a greater say in how they provide input. That's a, a key ethos of ours here at Catalyze SV, where we talk about equitable community engagement and inclusive places for everyone. And so we think this is a really good idea. We've offered our help to SOAC as part of this process. They have way more expertise than we do in a lot of areas. We have a little bit of expertise when it comes to facilitating constructive and collaborative conversations about development. So if we can help the county and SOAC have these conversations with the community about how they develop, we would love to be a part of it. And Maybe that strengthens your understanding of how I could help. Thank you, Alex. The next speaker is Gabriel. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hey, thank you, uh, Gabriel, uh, director of the CISA Poetic Collective. And just uh, to note, there was uh, four or five other public speakers on the last item that didn't get picked up to speak. So I don't know what happened on your end. Um, on this one, again, asking for the uh, support of the original uh, proposal to provide uh, the $250,000 to the School of Arts. They've been in the process of, of acquiring across the street. Um, a lot of it, again, has to do with program uh, 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 expansion and then also, you know, a series of steps that they're uh, working to, again, begin to uh, become more active in developing not only our cultural district there, but again, um, developing community assets uh, for the community, uh, small businesses and in different sp um, spaces like that. And so hoping that um, we can get those votes to be able to support this with, with the actual money on hand. Thank you. The next speaker is Jessica. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good afternoon, County Board of Supervisors. My name is Jessica Pasadillos. I am the Executive Director with the School of Arts and Culture. Um, we are asking for support, and for us, this is urgent. We are not looking to become a CDC. We are asking for an investment because we serve a community that has been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. And we have an opportunity right now in front of us to purchase a property, not only to expand our services, but to bring mental health services to this community and to also build housing. Um, you know, and we're really, really close. We have an equity partner that is coming in at 36%. We have support from foundations. We are looking to the city and we are looking to the county. And the property that we have identified um, is across the street from La Plaza and is not city owned. And this would go a long way to address the disparities that our community has been faced with. Thank you. The next speaker is Elma Arredondo. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hello, my name is Elma Arredondo and I'm a resident volunteer with all the Morocco Urban Village Advocates and with Vecinos Activos from Somos Mayfair. All the Morocco Urban Village Advocates advocate for development in the All Rock Village between King and Jackson. I also live at Las Mariposas on Olam Rock, which is an affordable housing development built in East San Jose for low and moderate income first time homeowners. The complex was built in 2005 by the city of San Jose and Moxa CDC. Opportunities such as these are no longer available with the loss of the redevelopment agency and the loss of the CDC. Please support this allocation for the School of Arts and Culture. It is imperative that we build on our Alam Rock order with the community in mind. Thank you. And that concludes public comment. Thank you. Oh, your microphone is off. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it was. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. And thank you, colleagues. I'll tell you the reason that I um, waited to have this item come back and I had delayed it was that the staff um, believed that they had addressed the concerns uh, or the item that I had brought forward with the CDC um, uh, uh, recommendation. I'm asking my colleagues for support for um, SOAC to be able to 
have the resources it needs, both from a consulting perspective, and I thought, Sparky, your points were right on, um, and um, an opportunity perspective to be able to acquire property that is uh, contiguous to the property they own that has the opportunity to build housing and more importantly to build housing that won't cause displacement and to be able to activate an area of our community that is desperately in need of services including mental health services as they are open and willing to do so with that the motion i'd like to make is to um, on item 20 uh, is to uh, fund the 250,000 as originally requested many many months ago that is my motion. Thank you. I'm looking for a second. Listening for a second. I'll second it. Second by Vice President Ellenberg. And your hand is raised. Comments? It, it is. I, I know that and appreciate that staff is uh, working with the leadership of, of SOAC on these issues. Uh, I also wanted to um, point out to um, my colleagues and administration, although likely everyone knows, that the final rule from the Treasury uh, for ARPA was released last week, and those funds are meant to address the adverse impacts of COVID in disproportionately impacted communities. The new guidance addresses the many comments and questions about vacant and abandoned property, and the Treasury specifically approves and encourages the use of ARPA funds for the purchase and improvement of vacant and abandoned properties to reduce their negative impact on neighborhoods with the purpose of greening or and revitalizing impacted communities. They also talk about the inclusion of administrative costs, which I think is really important here. So I'd like to suggest to administration that ongoing conversations about funding for this area should, um, should include the potential use of ARPA funds. Motion maker. You're, mute. You're muted. Finally, somebody else. <laughs> I think those are good points. I'll incorporate them in the motion. Thank you, Supervisor Allenberg. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Smith, you wanted to respond? No, I just want some clarity. Um, my understanding is that the direction would be for a staff to sit down with Cisipuere and enter into a contract where they uh, were dispersed 250000 for land purchases. Is that correct? Yes, for the develop for a specific development that's across the street from them that's in the original memo yeah. that the board that you all have. Okay. Thank so you. we'll have to come back with the approval of the contract, but we understand what we're supposed to do if this passes. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Thank you, um, uh, President Wasserman. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I think this is a uh, uh, very good use of the, the funds, and I think the timeliness of this is important. Uh, I just want to make sure we're clear what the county uh, will be doing is whether we're going to be helped with the negotiation as a county, or does the county going to acquire the property that the a collective uh, through this uh, funding? Uh, because we heard that the speakers over at the schools of arts and culture is looking to expand programming. Uh, to include these additional services like mental health services, which would be great, but just wanted to make sure we understand the role, what we're doing. This would, in this instance, this would be to convey resources to them that will assist them in facilitating the purchase and acquisition of property across the street that would be used for housing and other services, including mental health services. It would be to convey that resource to them for their utilization to acquire that property. So do you think there will be a housing part on this that's actually might be able to provide actual housing at the end of the yes. day? Yes. Okay. Yes. That's their that's in their plan now. Okay, good. Thank you for clarifying. Clarifying. You bet. Thank you. That concludes public comment. I have two supervisors' hands are raised, but I'm gonna ignore them and ask Colin for the vote. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concluded item number 20. We move on to item 21, which if I had to take a bet is also Mr. Lee. It is Deputy County Executive Key Lee. Thank you, uh, President Wasserman. This is a brief re uh, interim report um, outlining uh, the administration's plans and next steps. 
related to identifying uh, county-owned sites in Supervisorial District 3, uh, the cities of San Jose, Campbell, and or Santa Clara uh, for temporary shelter, transitional housing, or safe parking. Uh, we plan to do some community engagement before bringing um, recommendations back to the board. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to move approval of the, of the staff recommendation and, and particularly appreciate, uh, Key, the focus on community outreach prior to uh, making any identifications of specific properties. Thank you. Thank you. Approval and appreciation. Second. And second by Supervisor Lee. No members of the public. Supervisor Chavez, you have a comment? Yeah, just very briefly, I'm very, um, very excited about the the staff response. And the only thing that I, I just want to point out to my colleagues is that um, I am very interested in um, not just the, the, the public, the county properties, but we really do need to figure out a way to engage all the other um, municipalities in making properties available. And, um, and the other thing I would say is that as... Um, as we were, well, anyway, that, that's it. I, I, I just wanted to keep saying, I keep putting that on the record I because eventually we're gonna run out. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you very much. And with that, Colin, I'll ask for a vote. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Item 22 will be our finance agency director, Margaret. Nice to see you, Margaret, Olaya. And um, why don't you open it up, Margaret, and then we'll turn to speakers if we have any, and then to the board. Uh, good afternoon, open. board. It is Margaret, sorry, I saw Gina there for a minute. Go ahead, Margaret. Uh, I have with me Gina uh, Commanders, uh, the clerk recorder, and um, we are here to uh, just share a little bit about the uh, restrictive uh, covenant program that the county will be initiating, um, or rather we've actually started where we have been doing a lot of information gathering, preparing a system, preparing the employees to be ready to go full uh, implementation by July 1. Um, we do need resources to get us started, um, which is why you see the information before you. The intent is that uh, we will be going back to prior documents, so we will be proactive in the direction that we're going to be following an approach in making sure that we cover all those various documents that the county clerk has in her system that needs to go through review. There's a formal review process that will go through with the assistance of county council to make those determinations before we move forward with um, the uh, required reductions or changes to those documents as required. Uh, but that's my introduction. Uh, Gina, could you please uh, provide a little bit more in terms of the state requirements as well? Thank you, Margaret. Uh, good afternoon to the honorable members of the board, Dr. Smith. I'm Gina Alcomendez, the county clerk recorder. This uh, particular initiative would allow the clerk recorder to collect additional $2 for documents that are recorded uh, to fund the restrictive covenant modification program. The program provides for identification of documents that actually contains certain language that proved discriminatory. So we are going to proactively locate those documents. And uh, at, at this point, we have an approximate 24 million documents that we have to go through that will go all the way to 1848. Wow. So that we could look at all those documents. And admittedly, this, doc this process is going to be very labor intensive and time consuming. But with technology and the manual process, we're asking the board to approve our, our fee to fund two additional positions so that we could work on this. But we have been proactive even before the passing of this mandate that we were trying to locate and, and uh, assess the, the scope 
that's why we were able to give you the 24 million documents we're going to go through. Thank you very much. And before I turn to Supervisor Simidian, Margaret, I think you need to get acting off of your uh, description on your Zoom window there. For sure. All right, Supervisor Simidian. Thank you. Um, I want to uh, move the staff recommendation, uh, but then have a little conversation uh, about um, about the item. Uh, if we can get a second to begin, let's second. start there. Thank, Thank you for that. Um, supervisors, um, I I wanted, uh, if you will bear with me yet again, to share a personal uh, observation about this effort. Um, I uh, I think uh, we've got three of the five members now who are uh, law school grads uh, and uh, uh, two who didn't uh, suffer through that exercise. But um, I, I became aware of racially restrictive covenants, not when I took a first year property class as a law school student, but as a kid, when uh, my family bought property in Santa Clara County, the first home that my uh, family owned here in California. And my father explained to me that um, that wasn't allowed everywhere in California because there were racially restrictive covenants. And he specifically called out Fresno where there was then uh, a large uh, population of Armenian Americans. And there were in fact, racially restrictive covenants uh, back in the fifties uh, and before, uh, which is why I'm glad to hear staff talk about just how far back they're gonna go. But there were in fact, racially restrictive covenants uh, that were wide ranging uh, in their efforts at exclusion. And so, Somewhat um, uncharacteristically, I asked my office as we prepared for this item to uh, take a look at some covenants that uh, were recorded in Fresno County rather than our own. And I wanted to share them with you for a reason that will become apparent in just a moment. I'm looking at one deed restriction recorded on a home built in the 1950s in Reedley, uh, an incorporated community in uh, Fresno County. And it specifically provides, and I'm quoting, so please forgive me any uh, language that is insensitive or worse. Quote, this property is sold on condition it is not resold to or occupied by the following races, Armenian, Mexican, Japanese, Korean, Syrian, Negroes, Filipinos, or Chinese, end quote. In the unincorporated area of Fig Garden Estates, also in the 1950s, there was language uh, recorded as a lawful racially restrictive covenant at the time that neither said premises, and again, I'm quoting, quote, neither said premises nor any part thereof shall be used in any manner whatsoever or occupied by any Negro, Chinese, Japanese, Hindu, Malayan, or descendants of the above named persons. Provided, however, that such a person may be employed by a resident upon such property as a servant for such resident. And I just thought it was worth taking a moment or two today to acknowledge the fact that three quarters of a century later and longer, uh, these uh, covenants still run with the land. Uh, we are fortunate that the courts have uh, weighed in pretty uniformly to say that they are not enforceable but they represent a continuing and insidious uh, form of uh, discrimination uh, that has been perpetuated, however uh, quietly or unobtrusively uh, it may appear to some. So I am pleased that the state legislature took this action. I'm pleased that we're uh, gonna take this challenge on uh, proactively, as the staff has said. I. I'd be curious if folks have a, a point of view about whether or not it should be funded by the fee. I don't have a strongly held view on that subject, frankly. It's, quote, just $2, and it's just $2 for folks who are uh, dealing with any um, real estate transaction, whether it involves a covenant or not. Uh, and it's probably relatively modest in that context, but it just struck me that there is some irony in the fact that an individual who is, um, given the diversity of our county, that an individual who is one of the groups discriminated against may end up paying a fee to have racially restrictive covenants removed 
from other documents, even though there are no such documents in connection with their own transaction. Having said all that, as uh, the staff is uh, frequently inclined to remind us, you got to find a way to pay for it. So I suppose uh, if the fee is authorized, um, that's one way as opposed to tapping the general fund and losing those resources. My only question for County Council and for Dr. Smith is, uh, can we please be assured that the uh, $2 will in fact um, be exclusively used for these purposes in as much as we do not yet know how much it will cost. If anything, I think it may end up costing more if staff pursues the vigorous effort that they've described. Mr. Williams, Dr. Smith, if I may, through the chair. Yeah, I can confirm that the funding is restricted funding, meaning that it can only be used for the purposes of that program and indeed is appropriated as such. All right, thank you. Well, my and motion- I, 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 I'm sorry. Dr. Smith? You wanted me to commit it only can be used for that purpose, but you're right. The actual uh, process will cost more than 400,000 a year because uh, we're gonna be very proactive about it. So the fee will not cover everything, but it will cover some substantial part of the work. I think it's $800,000 on an annual basis. If I read it uh, correctly, I see staff nodding. The only other thing I would say before I let colleagues I get a word in here uh, through the chair is uh, it did not go unnoticed, at least by me, that if these covenants were in fact not only in place but enforced, a majority of our board of supervisors would be precluded from owning property consistent with this language. And I'll let it go at that. Thank you. Yep, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you, and um, Supervisor Simidian, thank you very much. I'm 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 pleased that you um, took this off consent. I think it's really worth um, reflecting on. Um, one question that I had for um, Gina is, um, and I just appreciate your enthusiasm that you're already diving in to address this. I wonder, had we thought about doing um, some outreach to the universities in the area to both get some student support and help, um, especially those that are getting, you know, whether it's law degrees or degrees in any number of areas um, that might be of assistance here. And then second, if you have already reached out to um, History San Jose or any of our other partners that may be interested in um, reviewing documents or doing some body of work around that, you may, may recall, Gina, that some years ago we did, we put some money aside for um, history projects actually for the community. And this is a very important one, I think, that that will help us understand the roots of our community and, and help us think a little bit about how we move forward. Gina. Great question, Supervisor uh, Chavez. Um, we have considered all avenues. Uh, we obviously recognize that the help of interns from the universities uh, and also reaching out to our partners. Uh, we, we do have the county archives and we do have partnerships through them. And, and because this is a, a big, the magnitude of the, the volume of work we're going to do is huge. We need um, the help of others and volunteers along with the two positions that we're asking. So yes, we are considering all those aspects as well. Thank you, Supervisor. Oh, that's exciting. That's going to be a great experience for some from some students. And um, if there's any assistance needed with the universities, please let me know. Um, I'm sure myself or any of my colleagues would be happy to support our, your efforts in that area. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Smitty, your hand is still raised. No further comments, Mr. Chair. I apologize. I'll lower my hand. Thank you. Supervisor Lee. Yes, first of all, I just want to say thank you uh, for staff for this uh, report. I'm really glad to see that the plans to implement the restrictive covenant program are well underway and that we thought to eliminate these harmful redlining practices uh, that have long segregated communities. Um, my office actually received an inquiry uh, from some constituents last year who wished to strike the language from the CCNRs that was in clear violation of the California Fair Employment and Housing Act, and then that one, and I summarize, basically, in so many words that black people cannot live in houses unless they are servants. 
which is very similar to what uh, Supervisor Sumidian has just mentioned. Um, the clerk's recorder's office was fantastic in providing the responsible process ahead of implementing AB 1466 and this restrictive permanent program. I just want to thank you to our clerk recorder, Gina Alcomendres, for her assistance on this matter. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we have a decision to make. Do we have a motion? Supervisor Lee, your hand is raised. I have offered a motion, Supervisor Wasserman, through the and chair. Supervisor for the is second. Yes, thank you very much, Supervisor Smithian. So we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Colin. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Supervisor Travis, I'm sorry, I didn't get that. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. All right, 23 was handled, was put on consent and stayed there. 24, I'm gonna turn to Supervisor Simidian, then the same with 25. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, colleagues. Um, I am uh, prepared to um, on item 24, receive the report. And I think that's all I need to do here. So why don't we ask that uh, uh, we get a second on that, and then I'll make my comments in connection with item 25. But I'm prepared to move approval of item 24. Thank you. And we don't That's even good. need a motion on that one, so we can consider 24 received. And um, then on item 25, Mr. Chair, which is, um, well, before we go on to item 24, let me ask that we make that a formal motion with referral of four technologies to the Public Safety and Justice Committee. And my reason for that is colleagues, if you look at page two of nine, uh, it indicates that- um, Excuse me, Supervisor Simonian, did you go back to 24 just now? I, I did, since we took no formal action on it, Mr. Chairman, and I would like us to take formal action because in addition to receiving the report, okay. I wanna direct, um, the staff to uh, have the four items, uh, the four technologies that are called out in footnote one on yep. page two of nine, packet page 230. I think that gives the clerk everything that they need to, uh, to identify these. The, the report did a nice, very nice job, by the way. So thank you uh, to uh, Mr. Marquez and uh, folks uh, working with him on this effort. It called out the fact that we had 96 of these annual uh, surveillance reports indicating what the impact uh, had or hadn't been of using these technologies. This is exactly what the process is designed to do. And interestingly, as the report calls out, it says uh, four ASRs, annual surveillance reports, disclose that four technologies are outdated or antiquated, and therefore it may be that their scope of use does not justify the associated costs. I don't have an opinion about that, but I appreciate the fact that it was an issue identified by the review. So what I'd like to do is uh, receive all other reports and refer, uh, refer those four to uh, Public Safety and Justice if the chair of the committee is amenable uh, for uh, some discussion there. And the other thing I should also just do is, is reference that um, you know, the Los Altos Hills uh, license, automated license plate readers, um, uh, as I recall, were, uh, were specifically not um, uh, under their policy going to be sharing information beyond, uh, beyond the town of Los Altos Hills. Our own license plate readers, as I understand it, uh, do share the information with regional law enforcement. And of course, we then lose the ability to control what happens with that information, even if it is about law abiding individuals and their movements. So I'd like to sort of refer that to public safety and justice as well for some just conversation and understanding, mostly just as a sunshine matter. So that's my formal motion now that I've 
drag you back, you. Mr. Chair. Sorry. Item 24. So I need a second to that motion. Second, Chavez. Have a second. Thank you. No public speakers. Colin, roll, Super uh, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Smidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. I would say yes to as well, since it's coming back to public safety and justice. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And then consistent with that, um, I would uh, move approval of the recommended actions in item 25, which you will note are A uh, and a very long B and then C, with the exception of the four technologies identified uh, in the previous referral. All right, Supervisor Chavez, you're on for a second. Again, no public speakers, seeing no additional comments. Call and roll call vote, please, for 25. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Samidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you. All right, Colin, 26 and 27 were held. 28, I think. No items were removed. No items were removed. No, I was just stunned reading my, you're right, no items removed. That brings us to, to 29, which is adjournment, my friends. If there's no other comments, we are going to adjourn this meeting at 4.43. Seeing no objections. The meeting is adjourned. Have a good evening, everybody. Stay well. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Bye-bye. Recording stopped. <laughs>